I'm trying to get my um, view correct again. Alex. Yep. Uh, so is it the upper right corner? You should see either gallery view or speaker view. Okay, gallery view. There it is. Yep. Click that. Okay. And then Great. you should be good. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Mayor, are you ready to get started? Uh, yeah, one second. Okay. All right. You ready? We are. Okay. It is 6.31 p.m. I'd like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of June 8th, 2020. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Council members and city staff are participating from remote locations and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. You will only be able to speak during the meeting if you follow the instructions at malibucity.org slash virtual meeting. Once the item is called, no further speaker signups will be allowed. So please make sure you visit malibucity.org slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak. And when the item is called, you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Council members, if you have comments to make during this meeting, please raise your hand and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and for the public. Now, may I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Mullen? Here. Councilmember Peek? Here. Councilmember Wagner? I think you're muted, Jefferson. You hold down the space bar. You should be able to speak while you're holding it down. There you go. Councilmember Wagner. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson. Here. Mayor Fair. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. May I have an approval of the agenda, please? Move to approve the agenda. I'll second. Roll call vote, please. Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Peek? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Mayor Fair? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. 
May I please have a report on the posting of the agenda? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on May 28, 2020. Thank you. Okay, we will move on to item 2A, communications from the public concerning matters which are not on the agenda, but for which the city council has subject matter jurisdiction. Okay, uh, do we have any public speakers? We have 13. I'll call them in order and then we'll go back to the top and call the first one. First, we'll have Joe Drummond and Colin Drummond, then Len Norton, Keon Schulman, Hashi Clark, Craig Hill, Andy Lyon, Norman Haney, Mary Lou Hamill, Rosie Strickland, Hamish Patterson, and Georgia Goldfarb. Thank you. First, we'll have Joe Drummond. Hi there. We can hear you. Okay. Honorable council members and Mayor Fair, I'm here to support my fellow neighbors who will be asking you to agendize an item for the next council meeting regarding a grant for a Big Rock generator project to ensure water to our hydrants in Big Rock during a fire. Today I speak on an item I spoke on exactly one year ago today, and there has still been no resolution. On behalf of 84 residents who signed the petition submitted to you on Friday, we ask to add an agenda item to the next available city council meeting for a moratorium on development in the Big Rock Mesa Assessment District based on the need to rehabilitate the BRM dewatering system and the current instability of the Big Rock Mesas. During the 80s, DA Evans and the 90s, Bing Yen monitored and gave an opinion on the stability of the Big Rock Assessment District. Now in 2020, we have a geological report that has cautioned against the instability of Big Rock and no executive entity, city representative or geological engineering company will render an opinion on the state of the stability of the hill almost two decades later or respond to his report scientifically. I sent you all an email on the current worries and issues with the dewatering system and the desolation of the swales that are supposed to run water off the headscarf where the Big Rock landslide first began, which for some reason, unknown reason, City Council removed from the assessment district years ago. Every food grow report creep movement from the limited amount of slope impoundments on the hill, and the neighbors see more movement in their homes and roads every year that can't be ignored. Since the last upgrade to the system 25 years ago, over 30 on site wastewater treatment systems have been upgraded or added to the BRM assessment district, and over 100,000 square footage of additions of builds and 85 homes with over 18 spas and pools added. Any movement on the hill indicates a factor of safety close to 1.0 and not the 1.5 that is standard minimum for a build in Malibu. We cannot have one more ounce of water added to the hill due to these factors. 84 residents asked city council to put this on the agenda for the next available meeting as soon as possible for a moratorium on any development that adds water into the hillside until we can get a clean bill of health assessment from the new monitoring company on the existing dewatering equipment with a timeline on repair and maintenance, or even perhaps a new assessment district to make necessary additions and repairs and also a proper analysis on the stability of the hill using the latest technology available. We would have our expert Evie Michael attend the city council meeting virtually to present to defend his findings to the council on the instability of the hill should continuous development occur, et cetera, which he still hasn't been consulted on by the city. According to his report, First, the dewatering system has been allowed to deteriorate and its rehabilitation ignored. Second, the scope of the authorized maintenance is too limited to allow studies that would indicate how recharge to the debris mass could be reduced. Adding more development and more water to our hill will lead to a new assessment district necessary or worse. He also states water usage has gone up 170% since after the landslide was ameliorated back in 84. Yet our dewatering system is producing 50% of what it did 10 years ago. Go. No. Your time is up. Okay, thanks. Next, we'll hear from Colin Drummond. Uh, thank you and uh, good evening, council members. As, as chair of Big Rock's Firewise Community and Fire Safe Council, I'd like to make an argument for a more resilient Malibu. When we started this generator project over a year and a half ago, it was always our intent to limit the spread of structure fires. Structures are the true fuel for residential destruction. 
In our consultations with LA Water District 29, it was our intent to maximize both the water pressure and flow to the hot fire hydrants. The LA Water emergency generators referenced in Karen's response to our, our emails would be significantly less effective than our proposed system. Our configuration uses both pumps in each station. Firefighters, firefighters who are risking their lives deserve a dependable backup. We're not proposing an added layer of protection for Big Rock, but a template the city can use to challenge all communities within Malibu to step up and get fire safe. We could call it the Malibu Neighborhood Resiliency Fund. You could determine what funding would be appropriate to be made available to protect those communities from structure fires spread. In effect, you would have a plan to help communities help themselves. You could require any number of fire safe initiatives like brush clearance and ember proof fence, and then provide access to vendors who could facilitate the execution. The city has the funds to keep our AAA S&P rating budget report states uh, and designated reserves must total 65% of the operating budget. I understand we're currently at 76%. The difference of 11% would mean $3.3 million. A $75,000 ask represents a mere 2.2% of that 3.3 million. By the way, the city could also fund worthy projects like solar panels uh, at City Hall. With this approach, the public would see the city as proactive as opposed to reactive in creating an initiative, a challenge to communities like ours to step up and get resilient. The Big Rock generators would be a test case. We in Big Rock are moving forward. We've raised $130,000 now and are in a major pledge drive, which conservatively has raised another 20,000 bucks this week, all to meet our $300,000 goal. But $300,000 is a hell of a lot of money. We're not looking for a handout, we're looking for a hand up, an investment in a fire safe future for Malibu. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Lynn Norton. Hear me? Yes? Oh, okay. Um, I just wanted to bring up the topic of short-term rentals again. And um, I know that many of you uh, feel that this is a very important issue and you've already voted on it. And um, I know there are challenges to getting it on the calendar, but that's what I'm hoping that we can do sooner rather than later. Um, my concern is that, you know, wanting to get this done or at least get it through the city while you are all on the city council because we don't know what will happen when a new city council is elected and, and, if, the, and if it will have the momentum that it has now. And so um, I know there's challenges because of the COVID, but if some of you feel like it needs to be an in-person meeting and not a Zoom meeting, then it could be, you know, maybe an outdoor meeting and just for that one agenda item, if you think it'll attract a lot of people and we can all be distant from each other. but. But my point is that just even having a mediocre meeting is better than having no meeting because the, you know, doing nothing is really going to favor it never happening. So um, I'm just hoping that you all can, you know, do something to get it moving forward and really get it on the Planning Commission agenda. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Keon Shulman. Yes, hello. I would like to make my comments for the city budget for the city budget and I will speak later. Thank you. Okay, next we'll hear from Hashi Clark. Good evening, council members. Um, you've heard from Craig Hill and Jeff Greer, and now you've just heard from Colin Drummond. We've heard from others in Big Rock about the absurdity of having a PSPS shut off our water pumps in the middle of a Santa Ana fire. And you're well aware that we have come up with a plan to save our homes and our lives in that event. 
I just want to remind you that the city's express number one budget priority is public safety. This small investment that we're asking for, a small investment of $75,000 would not only help immensely with public safety, it would save the city a lot of money. We are not talking about a charity handout here. We're talking about you doing the math to see how much money you would save by paying this $75,000 and saving homes in Big Rock. We know that Big Rock is Malibu's eastern front in a fight against an overdue fire coming from Topanga. If that fire continued through Big Rock and went further into town, the savings to the city would be immense. The, sorry, the costs to the city would be immense. So just look at this. You have the money, as Colin pointed out. You have more in your budget savings, your undesignated reserves, than you need to keep your AAA S&P rating. We're asking for a very small amount of that, $75,000. It's a drop in the ocean of your total budget. I know you might have some concerns about how the funds would be paid to us, but there are creative ways to look at it. Perhaps the city would temporarily own a quarter share in the equipment until Big Rock can formalize a 501c3 to which the city's interest could be transferred. Or you could pay it directly to Waterworks temporarily or permanently as they might accept an ownership stake in what they've already agreed to maintain. Or perhaps a local nonprofit like Creative Visions could act as an umbrella organization to channel the funds. The thing is, there's ways to do it, and there's still time to formalize this over the next few council meetings if necessary and get the gear installed in time for Santa Ana season. Your budget reserve is there for contingencies, and this is the moment. We all know the fire's coming. Don't delay on helping us prepare, please. Next, we'll hear from Craig Hill. Hi there. Um, as long as districting is going on the ballot and we're asking voters how our government should be structured, we should be also be asking them the companion question in the state code, whether to separately elect a mayor. As my letter explains, the code specifies what to print in the ballot, so there's virtually no staff time involved, no extra ballot costs. There's no downside to this, and it's really simple. A citywide mayor would be essential if we switch to districting, which could happen by voter choice, court decision, or settlement. Separate districts would produce balkanization with each councillor competing against the other's interests. Or worse, we'd see swapping of political favors, which does not produce smart policy. Districting by itself is a recipe for dissension and corruption in the community. In contrast, a mayor would give voice to common citywide interests, helping to turn conflict into consensus, achieving unity, and as the city looks to the wider world, we should have a single person as our face. When there's a disaster, you want the mayor there at the EOC and in front of the cameras. And similarly, when the city deals with MRCA or Caltrans, you want a leader at the table. Bureaucrats won't respect as much a mere district councilor. That's basic psychology. So an elected mayor provides some insurance against threats of fragmentation coming from both inside and outside the city. And beyond that, it would give those who've been termed out the opportunity to serve again. We've got some talented people who know the ropes and hold some institutional memory, but who've been consigned to the sidelines. And when you yourself are termed out, you might feel like you're just hitting your stride. So putting the choice on the ballot at least leaves that door unlocked. Meanwhile, there was some suggestion that the boundaries of four districts would split more naturally than five, which might be true, but that wouldn't need to be determined unless the question won on the ballot. From that point, the state code addresses the rest of the logistics, which are pretty simple. And there is time. Just vote now to agendize discussion for your next meeting on the 22nd, and then finalize it at your meeting on July 13th. In the end, this is a choice the voters should be making not the council if you were to choose not to move it ahead. Whether or not we have districting, an elected mayor is a move towards both greater unity and institutional continuity. And by the way, item 2A is not on the HTML agenda, so technically that's uh, defective noticing. And I know some people were confused about 
whether they, whether and where they would get to talk on the agenda. So maybe that's why you heard a little bit about the dewatering district already. All right, thank you. Next, we'll hear from Andy Lyon. You were great. I felt sort of so formal. You sounded very chipper and friendly today. I'm sure. I don't know. I, I, I don't yeah, know. you got yeah. There I am. All, All right. right. Here, what Andy said. All right. Good evening, everybody. It's good to be here in the Zoom meeting. Um, actually, I was going to say that uh, it'd be nice after everything goes back to normal that you continue to allow citizens to call in with their comments so that we don't run into the uh, stall out tactics that has been employed before with putting items on late into the evening and then having votes without anybody around. Uh, I'd like to see you know, some discussion about that when we go back to normal. Anyways, survived the uh, weekend again, barely. It was a crazy weekend. I'd like to see that, uh, you know, the city council gets in touch with the county and starts working with getting Santa Monica to open up their beach parking. Um, we are getting inundated here. Uh, not even Topanga parking lot is open. So we're getting slammed with people coming up to Malibu and it just, you know, you can't even go on the beach at Surfrider without being, you know, elbow to elbow. Um, so I, I'd like to see that, you know, the council uses some of that influence with the county that they say they have. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention was it was, I saw, I saw that uh, the mayor and Mayor Portem were out uh, demonstrating peacefully. And I think that's fantastic. I think you guys also, missed a huge opportunity in that our city with uh, the Whole Foods in the park, having the owner of that park is a police commissioner, uh, having a, a discussion with Sobroff and bringing Malibu into the fold and all the people that support that discussion, uh, we're uniquely in a position to do that. Uh, I think even the mayor, Karen Fair, you, you were in support of putting the uh, Malibu Visitor Center in that center. I'd like to see that maybe uh, you try and pull some kind of a, a conversation together. That would be pretty good, you know. Um, I want to uh, also um, echo what Craig just said about a real mayor. I think that's super important. And then people on the council really care about Malibu. They will have a real mayor and they will vote to do it. Any one of you guys that's on the council that thinks that it's better to have a, a city manager instead of a city mayor, a real mayor, I don't think you're really looking out for everybody, especially if we go into this district voting and it becomes just, you know, hi, yeah, hi, say hi to everybody. Hi, buddy. Yeah. Anyways, um, I would love to see that get some traction. Um, you know, put, put it out there. I think the people of Malibu really want a strong mayor full time, not just during the week. This weekend stuff where I don't know who's in charge on the weekend. I know that, you know, we if you want to get the info of what's happening, it's really on Facebook and Friends of Malibu or Malibu Locals or Andy. Yeah. Your time's up. All right, thank you. Next we'll hear from Norm Haney. You're unmuted, Norm. All right. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Good. Thank you. Um, honorable uh, Chair Fair and City Council members, um, there are some projects that are much more complicated than others. And those projects, uh, in my opinion, anyway, need to have some type of a face-to-face conversation with respect to the applicants as well as the other interested parties. Uh, recently, I sent out a about a page and a paragraph of how that could occur and still be safe. The response that I got from the city was, number one, uh, it might be 
inconsistent with the Brown Act. I don't see how that could be because everybody would sign up just like they're signing up now. It's just that the hearing would be in the uh, city council chambers and people would, there would be monitors set up in the parking lot where everybody could attend. And then when your particular project came up, then you would go in the city council uh, chambers, wear a face mask, be six feet apart and wait till your time to get it, come up and speak. And complicated projects, uh, such as ones that involve uh, geology, uh, and other, other issues, it's better to have a face-to-face -face conversation so there can be questions asked and questions answered right there on the spot. When the project is over, when the hearing is over for that particular project, those people would leave and the next project would be called. The other issue besides the Brown Act that was raised, and again, I, I really don't understand that, was the cost. Well, if a person wants his project heard and it's gonna cost more money to have the project heard, and I'm not sure why it would cost more money, but if it does, then of course you have the right to ask that person to pay the additional cost. That's not unusual. Um, with regard to my particular project, um, I am in the process, hopefully, of negotiating benefits, and that's going to be a give and take situation when my project comes up, and I hope it comes up soon. One of the benefits uh, is my ability to provide the $75,000 that's needed for the generators. Um, and quite frankly, I'd be happy to do that. Um, and, and, you know, basically benefit the city of Malibu, the Big Rock area. But if you benefit anyone in the city of Malibu, you're benefiting everyone in the city of Malibu. Because when a fire comes through, it hurts everyone. So that wasn't the point of this, uh, my comments tonight, but I couldn't help but, um, but hearing it. And I am in the process of negotiating benefits. Norm, uh, your time. time's up? Yeah. By the way, I agree with Lynn Norton. Thank you. Yep. Next, we'll hear from Mary Lou Hamill. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Okay. I actually didn't know we wouldn't be seen. I took a shower and did my hair. I guess that was a waste of time, right? <laughs> okay, um, I sent you all an email last night, but I wanted to um, just say a few things directly to you. Um, you've seen and heard all the facts about Big Rock and the generators, and you know all about that. So I'm gonna appeal to you more on a personal level. I myself have a generator and a pool and a hose and a Honda motor. So I feel okay about some of this, but my neighbors don't. Some of them don't have water. They won't have water if there is no um, electricity. And so we need the generators to ensure that Big Rock can defend itself during the next fire that will inevitably come through here. Um, I really care about the community. I want to stay in Big Rock. I love being a Malibu citizen. And I just feel like if you can see any way in your budget to find this the room to add um, and have our back and help us with the generators, it would mean a lot to the whole community. We want to be a, an example. We put a lot of time and effort into figuring out how this could all work. So now's the time. It's really essential that we get this in place before the fire season. The winds last night brought that all those feelings up again about, you know, the Santa Ana's coming through, losing electricity, having, um, you know, you feel like you're a sitting duck. So I'm just appealing to you to please at least consider this in your budget for the upcoming year. And um, hopefully it can move farther and we can uh, have more discussions on this. Thank you very much. Next, we'll 
Next, we'll hear from Rosie Strickland. Hi, um, I wanted to speak tonight to add my voice to my neighbors who have asked that you put the neighborhood fire um, resiliency grant program on the agenda for your June 22nd meeting, and then hopefully finalize and vote to uh, implement as part of the budget on your uh, July 13th meeting. The devastation of the Woolsey fire has made things even clearer to Malibu residents that wildfires are the persistent threat to Malibu lives and homes. In Big Rock, we have um, cut back brush and we have um, street teams trying to make our neighborhood safe, but without water to fight fires, we're basically helpless to protect ourselves. In 93, when the old Topanga fire ripped through Malibu, firefighters literally stood watching my home burn to the ground because they had no water. It's 27 years later and we're still as vulnerable as we were then. But now we have a plan, the plan to purchase the backup generators that will enable the pumps to continue to function when our power is turned off. You've heard the financial projections of loss of revenue to the city if homes are lost due to the um, waiving of permit rebuilding fees um, and the reduced tax revenue due to drop in assessment uh, of property value. But the main reason is because um, your support to residents, the, the main reason to support the generators is because your support to residents who are striving and working really hard to keep Malibu safe is the right thing to do. We've raised $130,000 and I'm a retired preschool teacher and I just joined, you know, contributed with my other neighbors to try to raise this funds. And what we're asking you for is for the you to approve the $75,000 grant request, put that in your budget. We lost our home once and really, I really could not bear to have to go through that again. So uh, thank you so much. I, we, we hope we'll get your support. Next we'll hear from Hamish Patterson. Hello, hello. We can hear you. Okay. Well, I warned y'all. I've been uh for the last six weeks, I've been telling y'all that the uh our city was being held hostage by an unelected health official who has no is not a doctor. You've all sat by and did not uphold your oath of office to defend and protect the constitution. And I like the fact that that you went out and you actually asserted your constitutional rights in spite of that health order. Well, we can't go to AA meetings for over 10 people. You guys just get to go do as I say, not, not as I do, right? So uh, you guys are all like unconstitutional hypocrites. And the fact of the matter is the situation in Los Angeles County has been, been the same for uh, decades. And you guys haven't used your... Uh, your pulpit up there to do anything to relieve the pressure on these communities in the city. In fact, you've sat back over the course of this COVID thing for at least the last six weeks and let everybody be held hostage by Barbara Ferrer. I told you that what would happen next two weeks ago lay on your heads. And each and every one of you sitting on that city council is responsible for the destruction on the city of Los Angeles, the city of Santa Monica, and the community as a whole and the psyche. You have abdicated your authority because you did not uphold your oath to defend the Constitution. Shame on you. And the fact that you got to go down there and grandstand, do you not realize that the five of you are exactly the same politicians those people are protesting against? You're not leaders of the community. You're rubber stamps for the county of Los Angeles. You're not city leaders. You just roll over to Barbara Ferrer and shame on you. Shame on you for allowing Barbara Ferrer to hold a, a county of 10 million people hostage. So we're going to find out here in about a week. You either sat by complicitly and allowed us to be held hostage, and there is no coup, 
or you participated in the greatest health crisis ever. So either way, you have done a terrible job in leading and all of you should step down. In fact, the only one I actually kind of like is Jefferson at this point because he has actually stood up on his principles. But the rest of you, shame on you for not defending our constitutional rights and our constitutional freedoms. And then you wonder why a city explodes. You wonder why a country explodes. We've all been held captive by unelected health officials for months, months. People have been denied the ability to go to work, send their children to school, take care of themselves, seek medical help for themselves. And you sat by complicitly and allowed that to occur. Shame on you, Karen, Mikey, Skyler, Rick, Jefferson. You're supposed to uphold the Constitution to defend the people of this country and your community. And you have abdicated your authority to Barbara Ferrer. And then you go out there and march. Shame on you. Next, we'll hear from Georgia Goldfarb. Hi. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, my uh, comment is about the grant for Big Rock uh, for the generators. Um, with the threat of wildfire being so pervasive, our ability to withstand it is dependent upon several factors. The two most critical ones are house hardening, as described in From the House Outward by Rick Halsey, and water. These criteria are scientifically supported. You can see the Halsey document. Big Rock has a limited water supply under the best of circumstances, but without the pumps, we have nothing. PSPS exacerbates this problem by assuring that we will not have water under the current setup. Pumps require electricity to work. Hence, no electricity, no water. A PSPS will leave us truly at the mercy of wildfire. And each burning house will generate another eight hours or so of embers to perpetuate the fire. How will it end? In addition, if there's no water, will firefighters even come to a neighborhood? The lack of water significantly increases the risk to people who are unable to evacuate or who choose to stay and fight the fire. Further, even if there were no PSPS, since the wires have not been undergrounded, we could easily lose electricity and water if the fire wires burnt. Backup generate generators would ameliorate this scenario as well. Therefore, if Big Rock is to have access to water, we require backup generators for the pumps. A detailed plan, as you've heard, has been presented by a group of very committed homeowners in Big Rock. Appropriate backup generators have been selected and relationships with the appropriate utilities have been established. Part of the funding has been secured, but it is too heavy a lift for the homeowners to pay all of the costs of installing the generators. Therefore, we are requesting 75,000 in grant funding for backup generators. In addition, protecting Big Rock from wildfire also protects both nearby Topa Malibu and Topanga. And this program can serve as a model for other areas in the Santa Monica Mountains. The costs of wildfire are severe. We must take every responsible measure we can. Thank you for your consideration in this very, <clears throat> pardon me, very critical matter. And finally, we'll hear from Robert Wolf. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can. Hi. Good evening. Thanks for your time, everybody. Um, I'm also a Big Rock resident. I appreciate uh, the position that you're in. And that uh, I think we all feel that the number one reason that we're here is because we're interested in the safety of the people of our community. And the number one threat that we all face is fire. We know it and we've seen the history. So I'm not going to try to rehash what's been said before, but rather just to appeal to you to say that we in Big Rock are surrounded by a lot of unburned fuel. 
and uh, even the request that we had for a safe burn was denied, um, which would uh, ameliorate the situation greatly. Uh, but in any case, uh, the good news is, is that the people in our area have seen that there's a need to do something and have got together to do it. Uh, I've read some things that said that if we're a private organization that the city can't help us. And yet at the same time, uh, I don't know what the city expects us to do if we have a problem, uh, if we don't come together and to try to solve the problem together. So that if we're penalized for developing some type of organization so that we can solve the problem that we have, then we would ask you, please don't penalize us for trying to solve a problem that we need your assistance with. And uh, I think Big Rock has done an admirable job of pulling itself together and doing everything that we know how to do. And uh, we're simply saying, whatever it is that we need to do to get this thing together, we're doing our best. And we're hoping that the city would recognize that and say, wow, they, they've done their part. Let's do, uh, let's do something to help them. And we would hope that other communities in the city would be doing the same thing and that, uh, that you would have a way to in incentivize the other areas of town to say, if you'll do this, this, and this, then we'll give you the funds uh, and reward you for the efforts that you're making because we all need to stop fire. And uh, I thank you for the time that you've given me and appreciate the work that you all do. And I hope that uh, you'll cooperate with us. Thanks so much. That concludes public comment, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, we will move on to item 2B. And um, we will have a city manager update. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everybody. I hope everyone is doing well. I know it's been a tough couple of weeks uh, since our uh, last meeting. And so we'll have a few updates for everybody. Um, I wanted to um, just take a moment to reflect on the past week uh, where um, the city of Malibu was under uh, the state and county's state of emergency due to the civil unrest um, that was going on in other parts of the state, our county and the United States. Um, and as you all know, we saw a, a lot of violence and protests and looting um, that came about um, as a result of police brutality. And um, under that time, um, there was a curfew that was issued by the County of Los Angeles and the city did fall under those curfew hours. So I thank um, all of our residents for um, abiding by um, those curfews. And for those of you who did uh, peacefully protest, thank you for doing that. And thank you for helping keep our community safe. Um, I personally am looking forward to being able to continue some of those really important discussions with organizations like the California Contracts Asso Cities Association, which is the city's advocacy group for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, um, and hopefully making some positive uh, strides that way. Um, we are still um, in, in a pandemic. Uh, COVID-19 is still uh, with us, um, and we still are falling under the county's orders. Uh, we they issued a updated order on May 29th, an updated stay at home order, which put us into phase two of the reopening plan. Um, so things are slowly opening up. Um, this today, the County of Los Angeles reported 823 new cases, bringing the total over 64,000 cases in the County of Los Angeles. And here in Malibu, uh, we had 39 reported cases. Um, our emergency operations center is still functioning remotely and the majority of staff continue to work remotely with some tasks being done at City Hall. And I'll talk a little later in my report about our plans for reopening City Hall. Um, we have transitioned out of our daily messaging protocol and um, are now just messaging on an as needed basis as new information becomes available. Um, and if a, a civil unrest and a pandemic weren't enough for all of us uh, today, we saw uh, a red flag warning with some very dry, hot temperatures and high winds. Um, those uh, high temperatures and the critical fire uh, weather will continue with us uh, through Thursday. So I just uh, Good reminder for all of us to make sure that we have our brush clearance done. The fire department starts their brush clearance uh, um, 
review on June 1st. So they are in the process of getting through those many parcels that they have to look at. Um, so if you haven't done your brush clearance, please, please uh, make sure you do that. And just like we say every year, um, we need to make sure that we're ready um, in case there is a fire. Um, that uh, transitions well into me being able to speak to some of the comments that were made by our residents from Big Rock. Um, I am really so proud of how everybody has come together on this issue, and I know it's a very important one. Uh, we did add some information into item 4F, which is the city's budget item that will be heard later this evening. And um, I have asked Mark Pastrella, who is a director at the Los Angeles County Public Works Department um, and also oversees uh, Los Angeles County Water District 29 uh, to speak during the budget hearing so that he can address the concerns and um, requests that have come up uh, from uh, the Big Rock neighborhood. Um, I thought that was the best uh, way to handle that since it is a county, they are county facilities, the, the generators, the, the pump stations are county facilities, not city facilities. Um, so um, if all of you can hang in there uh, through a kind of full agenda tonight um, under item 4F, he will be able to speak directly and answer a lot of those questions. Um, I did also want to uh, make sure that I know there was a comment made by one of the speakers about the agenda not being properly posted. And I just want to clarify that this um, agenda for this meeting was properly posted on May 28th. There were a couple supplemental items that were released subsequent uh, to that May 28th uh, posting, um, but all of the agenda items were um, posted as necessary. Um, I also wanted to give an update on the pending LCPA before the California Coastal Commission on the ban on rodenticides. Um, I included information on this in uh, my uh, weekly or regular update that we post on the city's website every week. Um, we did um, submit the application to the Coastal Commission in December, and after that we have uh, Just you have an audio problem. Uh, Reva was talking. I, I apologize for that. I'm having some internet problems here at home. I think the winds have gotten the best of my neighborhood, so I apologize for that. Um, so uh, as I was saying, um, the city staff did submit the LCPA to the California Coastal Commission in December. Um, it was a complete application. The Coastal Commission did ask for some clarifying information, which is very standard as part of their research that they do when we submit something to them. Um, and unfortunately, with some staff turnover, we did neglect to submit that um, in a way that in a timely manner that I would have been more comfortable with. Um, I know how important this is to our community, and I really am very sorry that we uh, weren't able to. Broke up again. We have another audio issue. Mayor, I'm going to ask if we could just put a pause in my report and I'm going to get a better internet connection going. Um, so if you guys want to go ahead, I'll, I'll come back to that. Okay. Thank you, Reva. Uh, I understand we have a uh, commission report. Scott Dietrich, would you like to give that report? Thank you, Mayor. Um, it's sort of a non-commission report because uh, as uh, Public Safety and Public Works Commissions, we have not been meeting. Um, I did ask Reva about this at the Business Roundtable, and uh, I think that the council needs to prioritize these commission reports, especially Public Works and Public Safety. Um, for example, there was a change from Fugro to some new uh, dewatering um, company for Big Rock, but we never heard anything about that, and uh, we're unable to provide the advice that the council um, requests and appoints us for. So uh, I think a, a, a simple Zoom meeting is appropriate. Um, we usually don't have more than three or four public visitors, and it can be properly noticed uh, if we have to do Zoom, though, of course, the... WHO today that uh, 
those who don't show symptoms probably can't pass the virus, so everything we've been told is wrong. Additionally, I'd like to go back to the Big Rock issue. I do not live in Big Rock. I live up Rambla Pacifico. But public safety is the main number one function of any city government. And for too long, we just kicked the can down the road. I would have thought we'd learn by Woolsey, but we did not. This idea of having pumps, and they've already paid for most of it, that should be put forward. It should be budgeted by the city. I mean, grade of 29 will pay for it. And I guess we're going to hear from that later, as Reva said, uh, when Mark speaks. But we need to make this a priority that we cannot, we've talked about not having water up the canyons, make it for all canyons. And that way it's not just going to one individual group, which there's been objection of big rock. So make it for all canyons. And if there's a budget issue, say that it's first come first serve, you can only do one a year in any one budget year. We know that big rock's the only one up and ready to go this year. We need to make sure that that happens. And I'll just close with, yes, it's a red flag, as Reva said, and I spent 90 minutes on arson watch and might leave this meeting early uh, so I can go up at dusk again, because uh, there have been threats to burn communities such as Malibu by people unhappy with the system. And, you know, we just, we cannot afford another fire. So we need to do everything we can. And that starts, I think, with pumps for Big Rock. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Reva, are you back on the line? Yeah. Yes. Would you like to move on to city council reports and then we can swing back around to her when she's available? Okay, sure. Okay, so moving to 2C, uh, we will have council reports. Um, Skylar, would you like to go first? Sure. I just got to pull something up for hold on one second. Okay. Unmute. You guys can hear me now. Hopefully, good. We can. Um, so I had a uh, we had a, a cons uh, clean power alliance meeting uh, last week, which went went well. And I just wanted to give a little update on a couple programs, kind of stuff going on during the COVID nineteen stuff to for people um, if they're having trouble with their electric bills uh, and whatnot. So there's a California alternate rate for energy, called, known as the CARE program, which can reduce people's electric bills for eligible customers for about 30%. Customers qualify for CARE based on participation in public assistance programs or based on their household income. And during COVID-19, uh, eligible for this program is more is further expanded. If people want information on that, they can visit sce.com forward slash residential forward slash assistance forward slash care, C-A-R-E dash F-E-R-A. Um, that's also, uh, so the care program and the family electric rate assistance program, both kind of doing similar things um, right now, uh, as well as their medical baseline program um, and whatnot. So if people need, need help with that stuff, uh, they can also see more information um, at cleanpoweralliance.org forward slash COVID-19. Again, that's cleanpoweralliance.org forward slash COVID-19. So I just wanted to give that short brief um, update. I know currently in the city of Malibu, there's actually about 180 customers that, or about 30 customers that use our medical baseline program for their power bills and about 155 that are on the care program within our city. So um, if anybody else is looking for that during this time, uh, it's further expanded and that's in information on that. Um, other than that, I know that this has been kind of a, uh, a dark last little bit of time here for Los Angeles and for the rest of the United States and the world. And I just hope that all of us as leaders uh, continue to stand up and fight for for justice um, and make a hard stand against any police brutality. I think that that's pretty unanimous in our city. Um, and I would recommend that maybe we as a council uh, address this item and send a letter. Um, I think Reva may, was maybe gonna talk about that to the uh, to the county, to the sheriff's department, the board of supervisors, 
uh, just reaffirming um, our city's commitment to, to that and, you know, encouraging them to continue with, you know, improving their training and other things that they do for, for officers that serve in Malibu and all the other areas of Los Angeles. So um, that's what I got. Thank you, Karen. Okay, great. Thank you, Skylar. Uh, Jefferson, would you like to go next? Yes, um, I, can you hear me, Karen? Yes. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to little, do a little bit of 2B and 2C. 2B, I will be attending next week via Zoom, the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission meeting. It starts uh, around 9.30 uh, in Marina Del Rey, but we'll be doing it once again at Zoom. They're trying to move into that as soon as possible for the physical meetings. There are usually about 30 to 40 attendees that are on the board and 20 to 30 speakers. So I'll be attending that uh, next Thursday and I'll have an update at the following council meeting. On 2C, I'd like to respond to a number of emails. I quite often don't take very long and try to uh, minimize my time in front so that we have time to do our decision making as a council. However, I did receive some emails on some topics. When I receive more than five or six emails, I feel that they should be discussed. Um, and it's when I consider it that it's 80% of the people that we're trying to represent as best we can. Uh, some of these responses uh, from me are going to be to those emails. Uh, we had um, the, several emails which Reva did address with the re response to the Coastal Commission on the rodenticides. Uh, I've, you know, I'm sorry that the staff had issues, uh, but I think Reva uh, took the high road to say that it was her fault and her staff had some errors. Thank you for that. Um, I think that's what you do when you're, uh, when you're leading as best you can. We also had some emails uh, on the districting, and I'd like to put this in front of the council for discussion later, if we could possibly get uh, an agendizing of this. Uh, the districting, we never considered the four district map to go to answer uh, the Grimes-Shankman lawsuit against the city. I think that that's something the council should consider and we should agendize it. Uh, Speaker Hill, as long as Speaker Lyon, uh, recently said that, hey, there's California code that supports that. That would be a strong mayor. Not that I'm around for that, I'm termed out. But uh, you could have the strong mayor put on the agenda so that it, we, we could at least discuss it. We had a number of emails and letters about that. I'll look forward to speaking later on when Trevor or Christy gives us the okay to propose that. But constantly we're dealing with the mayor go around. Karen, you're up right now. A couple months, Mikey's up. Uh, then the election five mayors in a row, uh, you know, if we go districting, we're, we really are going to need as a city one speaker. And uh, if you went districting, which has been discussed, you might say, hey, every two years that mayor gets elected or reelected or not reelected. So I think it's a valid point. Uh, one other thing that came up on several emails was for uh, Riva city manager to agendize the performance um, as in policy 36 from one email uh, about uh, her performance. I think that's something we need to agendize or maybe Reva can agendize it. She's been doing it in the past. Uh, and my last comment uh, on my 2C, uh, the Environmental Sustainability Commission the committee. I did have a chance to speak with the city manager about that. Uh, once again, the funding came up uh, as an issue. However, uh, we're able to do these things on Zoom right now. So once again, I look forward to the council who voted 5-0 to support an environmental sustainability commission to see if we can find something in the budget for that because it certainly merits fair warrant in the eyes of five council members who previously scheduled that. It was also one of my campaign promises, which I'd like to keep. So my last comment is uh, on the case that was filed against myself. I'm gonna take my one minute of city time about my own personal problems. And that uh, case was been uh, dismissed or dropped or however the city uh, would look at it. I guess the city attorney would say there was no 
forward uh, progress. And so the DA's office has not elected to do anything. Um, and I do have a great deal of funds that were sent to me by city members in the GoFundMe campaign. I contacted um, Michelle Sanders of Political Reporting Plus, who handled that account, as well as the attorney. And uh, we will be returning those funds the best way we can. It looks like we'll be able to return between 60 and 80% of the funds that were contributed because there was no case moved forward on. Thank you very much, Mayor. Appreciate the time. Thank you, Jefferson. Rick, would you like to go next? Yes, thank you, Mayor Ferrer. I appreciate that. Um, like everyone else, I was uh, dismayed at the tragic events of the last uh, week or so, and uh, it's just too bad. And I, I, uh, I agree with Skyler um, and, and his words. And, and you know, it's just there were tend to forget that there's 17 other people that died in incidents stemming from that initial event. And we shouldn't forget those people. I turned out of things that have told who they were and what happened and very sad, just super sad. And I think everyone read all the stuff from Santa Monica and, you know, the Santa Monica music store and just the, the destruction that went on. Those poor guys have had their businesses, all those businesses closed for, you know, three months for the COVID thing and they just start to open up and then this happens and it's just horrific. And I was proud of the fact that People were able to express themselves here in our wonderful city and peacefully, and uh, there were no problems at all. Not that I expected any to have any. Um, Short-term rentals. I agree with Lynn. That's not something that we should let kind of keep get scooted back. It's a big issue, and I know it's. In, we tend to say, "Oh, it's important." We kind of had the big meeting on that. You know, we already had the big knockdown drag out. So I think that. I would like to see that come back as quickly as possible and get that move moving along and not delayed anymore. I totally agree with her on that. And I appreciate her bringing it up. Uh, Rebus forwarded a nice letter from a resident that sent her uh, heartfelt thanks to Yolanda for helping her through the rebuilding process. And that's a, uh, that happens all the time and I really appreciate all the hard work that Yolanda is doing in there. As far as the commission's meetings, I think it's probably time to consider uh, having some of those meetings start. Right? They don't have to be necessarily on the same level of frequency because of it's a little more cumbersome now, but maybe we could consider doing it on a, I don't know, every other or every third basis or something like that. But there are some people who want to get going on those things, and I think it is important. I'd like the city manager to consider that and the costs, et cetera, and come back with us on some sort of a plan for moving forward on those meetings. The big thing I want to talk about is the Big Rock community, and I'm thoroughly impressed with their uh, cohesion and their level of engagement and what they have done to take the take their future into their own hands. And they've identified, I would say, one of the key variables um, to success in the next brush fire. A small one, a big one, whatever. You know, I had this report that Jerry um, Vandermeulen sent to me, which you can't see here, but it's a big long report and it's, it's in-person after actions of individual homeowners from the 93 fire. In fact, the title of it is called Homeowner, the Forgotten Firefighter. And I wanna read the first line in this thing. It's very big and it's super valuable. And it says, Homeowner, the Forgotten Firefighter. Hydrants, hydrants everywhere and not a drop of water. And that's the lead sentence basically in this giant document is that there just wasn't any water. And some of the speakers brought that up, that was 27 years ago. And we should, we should fix that. And I know we're gonna hear from um, Mark Pastrella who does a superior job as uh, the public works director in one of the biggest counties in the United States of America, and he does a great job. But I've been bugging the city manager all day long about this, and ever since I got uh, all these emails from the Big Rock people, because they're, they're doing leadership by example. They're stepping up, they're grabbing the bull by the horns, they ponied up the cash, they got skin in the game, and they're just asking us for really what, can't, what amounts to a token 
level of commitment. So I'm hoping that what we hear from uh, the public works director for the county is good news and that he we don't hear from him is some sort of a delaying thing. I don't think we're going to get that from him because he's a good guy and he does a lot of very good things. But I just want to say to all those people in Big Rock is I sincerely appreciate and everything that you've done as a community to come together and chart your own destiny. I think that resiliency of our town as we go forward starts with the individual and then their family and then their community. And that's really about as far as you need to go. And if you've got the infrastructure to support you, even if it's just putting out a little spot that otherwise unattended could burn down your home and make the difference. We're not talking about a system that's designed to put out the world's biggest brush fire. All we're talking about is a backup electrical system for the pumps because the water is already coming from that giant 30 inch man that comes from Santa Monica. So I really appreciate what the um, residents of Big Rock have done and we won't drop the ball here and we'll make sure that something happens. Hopefully we'll get some good, good word from Mr. Costello. Um, and that is it. Hamish, I hear you. I think that everything should open up myself and I want to talk to city manager about maybe putting some on the agenda to consider. In fact, I'm looking for a little support from my fellow council members here because I think at this point we've all understand what the risks are. We all know how to social distance. We all know how to do our own personal protective countermeasures and businesses all do that. I'm not sure that we have to follow everything that falls underneath the county, but I think that we need to start being a little more proactive about opening up uh, our town and commerce. The, the, the small businesses have been hurt the hardest during this episode. And I think that the quicker we can get them back on their feet, the better off everybody will be. So I would like maybe get a little consensus for everybody to see if we can address that. I know we're talking about it later with this restaurant thing. That might be an appropriate time to discuss it. But I think we need to, uh, I, I think Hamish is, is, is right in many ways. That we, need, we need to kind of look out for our residents and give them the option to look out for themselves and exercise personal responsibility. You know, we could leave in place the uh, over 60 crowd having their special time at the grocery store because they're the at risk. They're the at risk group. And I think that's a great thing. But a lot of other things, I think we start to start loosening up and letting everybody out of the box. So that, those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. Mikey? Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, speakers. Thank you, email writers and all the letters. Super helpful. I, uh, as always, um, come into these meetings. I have a ton of notes, but I also come to listen, come to learn. And um, I really do appreciate every single speaker. Um, I think Rick did a great job, job talking about Big Rock. In my opinion, it is definitely, it's sort of the one spot where we can make an impact on a fire moving across our city from the east. And, and that is, to me, notable and a big thing. Um, I saw it come into uh, Rambla Vista last fire in uh, 93, and that was devastating, obviously. Um, devastating. So thank you, Big Rock, for speaking up. I will definitely have a lot more to say on that as we move forward. As far as the moratorium, I definitely want to hear from Public Works on that. I, you know, I am on some of those email chains. I hear you all. I hear you loudly. Um, my job is to understand what's going on there. I mean, we can't just shut down development if there's not a reason that scientifically exists. And you may be perfectly right, because then that would be a taking. So we have to be, we have to do our due diligence on that. But thank you for bringing it up. And I hear you loud and clear. Uh, excellent on that. Um, just going down some of the lists here. Um, the calls for a strong mayor. I'll say what I said before. If if the community wants to go that way, so be it. I'm fine on whatever you know the city wants to do on a vote on that. It doesn't. I have no feeling either way. 
for my part, I have talked to other cities in the past on it. I know it's gone okay in some and some reversed. So I know it's not, it's not, it's not a perfect system, but neither is what we have now. I get it. So um, there you go. Um, I see that Reva's back. So maybe when she finishes her remarks, she can address this. I thought, and I did not have a chance to get into this. So um, I thought the performance review was once a year, but you know, maybe after a year and a half here, uh, I don't have all the details on that. So maybe Reva can um, educate on that. Um, I'm not sure to be honest. I think I, I am so tired of Zoom meetings in one way. Yeah, it's great. I'm sitting at home and it's an easy commute to get out, you know, when the meeting's over. But I think tonight's another perfect example. I think I could be wrong. This is the first meeting where every speaker actually got to speak and we didn't lose anyone, but then we lost Reva. So I am, I am exhausted with Zoom meetings. I think they do have a place. Uh, one of the speakers, maybe it was Andy or someone said, you know, keep that going. And we have talked about that. I've heard talk about that. I like that idea. Uh, give people options. Uh, technology is here. Uh, if we had more money, we'd be throwing some of the technology right now. Um, but um, I agree. We really, I, I want us to get back to the place where we are meeting and taking care of all of our business. All this waiting is driving me insane. I, I don't, it's, I, maybe it's just caught up to me. I'm cooped up at home. It's driving me nuts. Um, and to address Hamish once again, you make assumptions pre speaking personally on what I've done and what I haven't done. I have spoken directly to Mayor, Gar uh, Mayor Garcetti. I have spoken directly and fought for our local businesses, um, particularly in terms of restaurants with our public health director. She does work for the Board of Supervisors. So they ultimately make the decision, who ultimately make the decision under the governor yet again, all elected officials. But I hear your frustration. I'm not gonna tell you you're wrong. But to say, I'm sitting around doing nothing, far from the truth. I sit on every one of the elected phone calls that I can. I think I've made them all but one. And I've learned what code you push to try and beat a hundred other cities to have a chance to talk. And I've been doing so. So I hear your frustration, you can be frustrated with me and the rest, but far from sitting around doing nothing, far from it. Um, so thank you speakers, I hope I didn't miss anything there. Um, and I look forward to getting the issue, particularly talking about Big Rock. I think it is a, a very important issue on multiple levels, not just their issue, but citywide as was said, and what we're doing as far as public safety, um, because it's not if, it's when, when there's another fire. And we all know that. So going on to my other comments, um, I would totally agree with the city making a statement on Black Lives Matter right now. I think this is a seminal moment in American history. And I think, uh, I know talking, particularly maybe with a lot of my clients around the country, how many of them who are white are, are sort of facing this in a way they never had. And an incredibly powerful conversation with a client in Florida today where he said, I realize I always thought I was not racist and I now realize that I am. It's just, I did not understand what, what other people in this country are going through. Um, so for myself, I drove to Fairfax to help those retailers clean up. I went to Santa Monica and help those retailers clean up. And here's one of my trophies, a rubber bullet I found on 4th Street that uh, was not shot at the looters, was shot at peaceful protesters. Um, and I met a man who'd been shot twice. I saw those those uh, welts, they were, they were legitimate, they were fearful. Um, and yes, I've attended a couple of protests, one at One Web Way, one at Trankus and PCH both peaceful, both with a lot of support. And um, obviously you know where I stand on this issue. I absolutely support supporting this movement right now. The next thing I wanna talk about that I think is very important is the 0% loan program for Malibu small businesses. 
I have teamed with a group called The Chain Reaction and the Malibu Chamber of Commerce to offer our local businesses, our small businesses, 0% loans. They are easy to qualify for. You don't even have to necessarily have a store. You can be um, self-employed or a service worker. The repayment terms are flexible. Um, they're from five to twenty-five thousand dollars. All the dollars that get paid back eventually go to uh, keep going. They go to support other small businesses. This program's up and running in several other cities. A gentleman, Greg Perlman, who owns a home in Malibu, had a great talk with him. A couple great talks. He let me know he's just at that place in his life where he wants to help make a difference. And he knows Malibu small businesses are suffering. So far, we've had six loan applications come in. So I absolutely encourage small business owners who think they don't qualify or, you know, they just couldn't even consider something like this. Give it a shot. You can get a hold of me directly or there's a direct link on the Malibu Chambers website. And um, it's really a pretty extraordinary program and really designed for small businesses that are either running or trying to open just to help them get over that hump and get going, just to get going again, whether it's to buy some inventory or whatever it is to make that difference. Because I am very worried about us losing our small businesses in Malibu, which are always in danger as far as I'm concerned. It's a very difficult environment. Um, so please spread the word. I have information. I can get it out. Um, the rodenticide ban, I, I want to apologize too. I made an assumption that this was moving forward and I know better. You don't make assumptions. And so I apologize as well that it was stalled and, and I didn't realize it. Yeah, every excuse in the world, there's a lot going on. You might have heard. But still, this is important and we work too hard uh, for this to, you know, just to lose the, any momentum. So it's already the uh, amendments been already put back in and I will keep on it as I know the city will, too. Um, I want to make a, a plug, too, on the census. We are doing terrible as a city at, 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 at doing the census, at filling it out. We're at 35.2%. Ventura is at 69.7% response rate. Historically, Malibu has been over 57%. We, we, this is important. This is how we get counted and we can get grants and, and other special revenues and, and get counted as, and, and it's important. So please, please, please just Google 2020 census. There's a link right there. You don't have to have gotten anything in the mail. It says you need a code. There's a button to push if you didn't get a code. You can do it online. It took me about 10 minutes to do it for my family. It's easy. So, so please, please, please. Um, another thing I just want to mention briefly is I've now had three different people get a hold of me about doing an outdoor movie series for the summer. And I just love the idea. Um, there was a couple groups uh, about a month or two ago that wanted to do it at the Chili Cook-Off site. Um, have to file for a TUP because, which is fair because people live in the area and make sure, you know, it's dialed not to interrupt anyone. I think it could be a great, uh, way for local businesses to provide takeout food, local re restaurants for it. It could be really a lot of fun. I know other cities are doing it. Uh, Brad Bell on the Bell lot. Um, he brought it up to me. He gave me a call the other day. Um, unfortunately has to call the Coastal Commission because of uh, the appeal that is holding up restoring the lot. So I'm not sure. I'll check in with him on if Coastal is going to allow him to go forward with that TUP. Uh, but I love the idea. I just want to bring it up. It'd be a great civic way for us all to get together. I, I'd go in a heartbeat. I think it'd be fantastic. Um, let's see what else. That's pretty much it. I got a bunch of other stuff that will come up during the items. I guess the last thing I want to say before we move on is I lived in Malibu my whole life and to have St. Anna's like this, this time of year, what the heck? That scares me. That really is worrisome. Um, you know, I'm on Arson Watch and my radio, which is sitting over here, it's been my neighborhood. It's been, I mean, we're on alert. 
It's scary. This is scary. Arson Watch is up and activated on June 8th. That's unusual. So here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Scares me, worries me. And uh, with that, um, I'll turn it over to the mayor. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mikey. Um, I just, I want to start out by saying about the recent events, I want to make it perfectly clear that this city and its partner agencies remain committed, 100% committed to our number one priority, and that's public safety. I did get contacted by people concerned that there would be spillover from the vandalism and looting that was going on in some surrounding cities uh, could make its way here. And I want to thank uh, the Lost Hills Sheriff Station for putting on many, many additional deputies at the station and circling throughout Malibu. And that's our number one protection is enforcement. And I also want to thank our community, particularly the young people of this community, many of them uh, high school students or recent Malibu High grads. I saw a lot of people I knew and their parents, some of these kids I've known since they were born. And I just want to applaud them for their commitment to social justice, uh, to solidarity, and for exercising their First Amendment right to peaceful assembly. And we've seen that again and again and again. I don't know if it's going to continue, uh, but if it does, they have every right to do that. No one has a right to loot, to steal, to vandalize, uh, and to destroy. And I'm very thankful between law enforcement and our local community demonstrators here. It hasn't come to that in Malibu. Um, the preparedness that we have seen here has prevented physical injury as well as injury to property. And I'm sure the council is unanimous in appreciating what Lost Hills has done. The values of this community and the country include treating people equitably and with respect. And I think it's worth noting that our city is a member of California Contract Cities, an organization that was founded for cities uh, to deal with their law enforcement issues. And because of our involvement in Contract Cities, we're a member of the Contract Cities Liability Trust Fund. And that Liability Trust Fund costs us a lot of money. It covers officer-involved claims, and it represents 11% of our contract. So it's in our best interest, including our financial interest, to have our contracted law enforcement agency exercise best, best practices, particularly with use of force. So that's something that everybody needs to keep in mind, that we actually save money when things go well. Um, I'd like to um, to comment on what Skylar brought up, and that was to see if there was consensus uh, to send a letter to the Board of Supervisors and to Sheriff Villanueva opposing the use of force and encouraging them to engage citizens as they reform existing policies. Um, and Heather, I don't know if I'm uh, out of order here, if this should come at a later time. Can you advise me on that? No, you can um, ask for consensus now. That's fine. Okay. Would anybody like to comment on that before I go on with the rest of my comments? Yeah, yeah I'll make a comment. <laughs> no, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I apologize. No, no, I just barged ahead. I'm just a general yes on bringing it back and, and discussing it and clearly in support. Um, since it's not on the agenda, we actually can't have discussion on it. We can just ask if there's consensus to bring something back. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm in favor of it, but, you know, for discussion, not because you're um, just saying we oppose the use of force. I think that's a little 
simple. You know, I think it's important to be supportive of the good job that our law enforcement do, but also express our concern that they do things in accordance with the appropriate policies. But just saying we oppose the use of force, I think it will be broad. So to, to bring back an item that would bring some options for what would go in a letter to the sheriff regarding use of force, would that? That's my end. Jefferson had his hand up, Mayor. That's my intent. Thank you, Trevor. Jefferson. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate that. Uh, being a former law enforcement officer in the LASO, um, I have no problem with that discussion coming back. At the same time, I'd like to see if we could get a consensus to uh, add the four districts to our district mapping plan and to at least talk about the consideration of a um, strong mayor. It's a pretty simple thing. It's in the California code. I'd like to get it on the agenda. It's one of those things where we could really do it in five or 10 minutes. Just a quick amount of time. And uh, this is the proper time for us to look forward to agendizing that. Thank you very much, Mayor. Okay, thank you, Jefferson. All right, we have two separate items, Trevor. Yeah, can we take them one at a time? So the first would be, is there consensus um, to bring back an item discussing a letter to the sheriff and options for um, to include in that letter about use of force. So is there consensus to bring that item back on a future agenda? Uh, Skyler has a comment. I just want to be clear that I'm not just talking about the use of force. I'm specifically talking about the use of excessive force. Okay. That be... Understood, but yeah, sure. I mean, yes. Okay, can we can we do roll call just to get consensus? Councilmember Mullen. Yeah. Councilmember Peak. Yes. Councilmember yes. Wagner. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson. Yes. Mayor Fair. Yes. Okay. Uh, we have a second item. Trevor, can you help sum that up? Yeah, so we, we've we've had a few public hearings about the CVRA item and the option to go to four districts with a strong mayor. If we want to bring back um, a separate item to um, discuss giving new direction to our demographer about a four district option with a strong mayor, um, we should agenda that soon because he's been putting together the maps based on the direction we have so far. And we've been looking at bringing an item back in July that would uh, bring back those maps and a proposal to put this on the ballot. So if we want to make a change to that, then I would suggest agendizing an item um, in the very near future to bring an option for a strong mayor, if that's not something we want to consider. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone have any comments on that? Jefferson? It's really very simple, and if we are forced into the lawsuit and the lawsuit prevails over the wisdom of our city leaders, we should have a backup plan, and I feel that that would be adequate at that time. If we prepare now, we will spend less later. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Jefferson. Anybody do you want to roll call for consensus, Mayor? Uh, yeah, after, uh, sorry, Trevor, can you... State it again. Sure. So the uh, the item that I believe that Council Member Wagner is proposing is that we bring back an item for discussion of whether to provide direction to the demographer to bring forth an option for four districts to go on the ballot, which would include then a district wide mayor. Does that reflect what you are looking for? Consensus on Council Member Wagner. Yes, thank you, Trevor, for that more elaborate um, understanding than I have. Uh, thank you very much. You stated it very well. Okay. Okay, thank you, Trevor. Heather? Councilmember Mullen? No. Councilmember Peek? We're just going to be discussing this, correct? Trevor? And I don't discuss yeah. whether it would, it would bring, we would bring it back with some background and and the option what, what would need to happen okay, okay. then i'm okay with that i'm good with that okay. yes council yeah. member 
Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Yes. Mayor Fair? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, sorry, I will finish my uh, my comments. Um, like Mikey, I've been on all of these county briefings and other things and getting updated information. And if anybody wants to know where the numbers are with positive cases and deaths, uh, you can click through it uh, by starting at the city website, malibucity.org slash coronavirus. Um, one thing I did that was interesting this past week was uh, I had a site visit with one of our community members, Meryl May, uh, at the Zuma parking lot and that stretch of the highway along there. Um, and for any of you who know Meryl, you know he's been cycling for decades uh, and he's been an extra set of eyes and ears uh, with regard to road conditions. Uh, and as we all know, the city doesn't operate or maintain Pacific Coast Highway, but it definitely affects us. And while we were out there, we had the fortune of the unexpected fortune of meeting with the acting director, uh, district director for operations for beaches and harbors. So got to um, discuss some of those issues right there in person. And uh, you just never know what happens, what might happen when you show up. Um, I have other uh, things to comment on on agenda items, so I'll probably save those comments for that. Oh, I do want to acknowledge um, all of the Big Rock Mesa uh, homeowners. Uh, thank you for the work you're doing. And uh, I want to start by saying I've had several uh, emails and uh, a phone conversation with uh, Jeff Greer, who, as you up in Big Rock all know, is extremely involved. Um, and I applaud you all for the amount of organizing you've done and for trying to anticipate um, the inevitable. So, yeah, the 93 fire, uh, I had many friends in Big Rock and La Costa who were affected by that. And yeah, the Santa Ana winds right now definitely bring all of that back for all of us, much less the Woolsey fire. Um, so I look forward to hearing what our LA County Director of um, Public Works, Mark Pistrella, has to say on that and um, see if we can move forward. So I think uh, without going over again, things that have already been covered by other council members. Uh, I think that concludes my comments. Mayor, hey, would you like me to finish giving my report since I uh, oh, got interrupted? Okay. Sorry about I, that. So I apologize for that, everybody. I was uh, calling in from home and my internet went out. And so I quickly jumped in the car and I'm now relocated to City Hall where there seems to be a much better internet connection. So so once again, apologize for that. And I think uh, I got cut off um, in the middle of my other apology, which was regarding the timing and response by staff on our LCPA application uh, to the Coastal Commission. So again, we did submit a complete application in December. The Coastal Commission asked us for some some clarifying information. It wasn't that our application wasn't complete. It was some background information that they wanted. Uh, they certainly did not have the time and shared that with us to move forward on it. So in fact, uh, the time that we didn't uh, respond, it probably wouldn't have gone forward anyway. But uh, all of that is in the past. And again, um, I just wanted the com uh, community to know that uh, we did uh, drop the ball a bit. And for that, I'm very sorry. And uh, certainly we'll stay uh, more on top of things uh, as things come up. Um, we have submitted everything now to the commission um, and did ask that they expedite it. So hopefully it will move forward to one of their hearings quickly. Um, moving on to our update on the Woolsey rebuild statistics. Um, to date, we have 240 single family home applications that have been approved through the planning department. 106 have been issued building permits, and we now have four homes that are complete. Um, and I understand I'll get the pleasure of delivering uh, the fourth uh, certificate of occupancy sometime this week. So I'm very uh, happy to be able to report that and uh, very thankful to both the planning staff and our building safety staff 
um, and, and everybody, public works and environmental health as well, who have really just been doing everything they can to keep these things moving. Um, at our last council meeting, we had a uh, member of the public who mentioned that uh, trash and recycling weren't being sorted by our haulers. I want to assure everybody that um, the haulers have told us they have now returned to normal collection of trash and uh, recycling in separate bins, um, but they are going to be stricter um, than they were in the past about non-recyclable items. And so to wanted to remind people, please do not put plastic bags, film, food waste, or styrofoam in recycling carts. Um, we have, as most people know, an election coming up in November and the nomination period for our November 3rd municipal election will open on July 13th and close on August 7th or August 12th if the incumbent does not file. And you can get more information at the city's website, which is malibucity.org slash elections. Um, we also have launched a new public rec records request portal so that uh, it can be easier for people to file public records requests. And you can see the new portal at malibucity.org slash records. Um, earlier this evening, uh, there were a few questions about uh, when would we be having meetings in person. Um, we are working on a plan to get City Hall open by appointment only. Um, so that the building would remain closed. But if you did need to visit or meet with a staff member, you could make an appointment and be escorted in. We are going to be asking that visitors attest that they are not exhibiting any symptoms of COVID-19 and that they haven't um, been around anybody who has. Uh, we obviously want to make sure that we all remain healthy. Um, however, with that being said, I do want everyone to know that all services that the city and city hall provide are being provided now, even if staff is not here physically in the building. So if there's anything you need, please contact city hall. If you can't reach someone, you're more than welcome to contact me directly so I can assist you. Um, the one service we are not providing right now is our passport services. But other than that, everything that you normally did through city hall can be done remotely. Um, so we're hoping to have uh, an appointment system up on our website soon where uh, five people can make appointments. Um, our Charmley Park, the trail improvements are underway. Um, it's going to take uh, some time to get some of that work done, but I did want everyone to know after the council approved the contract uh, for that work, which again is at no cost to the city, they are uh, working on those improvements. And then last but certainly not least is the temporary skate park. Um, I encourage everybody to please go look at the city's website, um, malibucity.org slash skate park, and you can see uh, up-to-date photos of the progress. The equipment is actually there on site. It's real. Um, it's really going to happen. Um, and I think the irony will be that we get it done before the county opens back up skate parks. Um, skate parks are in the phase three opening, reopening plan by the county. We're still in phase two, um, but hopefully the timing will work out and we can get it open and celebrate with our community at the same time that everybody else is back in parks of that kind. Um, so that completes my report for tonight, unless you have any questions. And again, I really apologize for the interruption there, um, technology at its best, but I'm back now. Thank you. Um, Reva, I have a question, and I, I meant to ask this at a previous meeting. Um, for the city recycling operators, um, do we have links on the city website to their um, recycling policies and uh, which items go in which bin and which things are not recyclable? Um, I can certainly look. I'm sorry, I don't know that off the top of my head, Mayor, um, but we definitely have links to their websites, but I will double check. And if we don't have that information up, we'll make sure that it is available for our residents. Okay, great. I think that would be helpful because I know with my bins, um, the uh the description of what goes in what bin was on the bin but after a while they get sun faded and you can't see them anymore and maybe some people don't even know that those things are on the bin sure so, i'll make sure that we have it up if it's not thank you I'd like to make it as easy as possible for people um i have another question um what was brought up about your perfor performance review um is the frequency of your performance review laid out in your contract uh, yes, Mayor, it is. My contract provides for an annual review, and my last uh, evaluation was done by the council in November 2019. Um, but if you'd like to schedule another review, more than happy to, to get that on the calendar. Okay, so 
Okay. Um, that does bring up another question in my mind. Um, if we have city policies that are outdated and don't match current practices, uh, I acknowledge I am on the policies committee along with council member Wagner. Um, so we may need to review those policies. Uh, I know we had two different meetings set up and for various reasons, um, neither ended up happening. Um, but I don't want to have policies that are antiquated or don't uh, match current practices. I'm uh, certainly happy to take direction from the council on how you'd like to proceed with that. Um, the city attorney would like to weigh in on whether a contract um, is over supersedes um, something in the policies that would be up to the city attorney to comment on. Okay, excuse me, Jefferson, I know you had your hand up. Could we just hear Trevor's comment and then um, yours? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Sure, we, we can take a closer look, but the the contract controls, and I think this was looked into before. Um, if there's a conflict with the city policy, we can take a look into it. But um, I, I think it's it's laid out in the contract certain review uh, requirements. Okay, thank you, Jefferson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, I received uh, several emails on the topic. Uh, one email elaborated on uh, uh, policy 36. I did take a look at policy 36. And yes, you and I are the committee to clean these things up. I wish we could get to it. Uh, uh, you know, we are preempted with this with greater needs for our city. But uh, yeah, I think the uh, it was mentioned in policy 36 is once every six months or a year. Um, I would have to, you know, listen to what the city uh, city attorney says um, and and we should clean up some of these policies when we get time Karen I'm ready mayor I had one other comment I realized I didn't touch on I just saw my note about um, in-person city council meetings um, right now uh, we're under the stay-at-home order that was revised by the county on May 29th and in that order it limits gatherings to 10 people or less um, and as a result of that, it would be, um, we wouldn't be able to have an in-person city council meeting um, because of the Brown Act where you have to be able to allow people in. Um, I saw the same correspondence that uh, Norm Haney referenced in his comments, and I certainly appreciate the creativity uh, that went into it. But I think, uh, you know, it's best for us to follow the orders of the county as we have been doing on when it's safe for all of us to meet in person. We will absolutely do that. And um, having just in, experienced severe technological challenges in this meeting, I'll be the first to say that I would be very happy to be back in public with everyone. Thank you. And one last. Yeah, go ahead, Rick. <clears throat> Excuse me, driving. But um, Lynn Norton brought up the short-term rental thing, and I made a comment that I would like to see that come back in a timely fashion, whether it be uh, an or not. And my, my rationale is that we had the big knockdown drag out about that, and we're drafting it, and uh, it shouldn't be that much controversy about what it is from this point, considering we were giving a, a lot of, um, you know, almost finished product in terms of drafting off of the Santa Monica version. So I would like to see that come back as soon as possible. Any consensus on that? I have a question. Are we not waiting for it to get on the Coastal Commission agenda? So, so the short-term rental item needs to go to the Planning Commission. The City Council directed it to go back to the Planning Commission. But I'm going to um, ask the City Attorney to speak about um, what that hearing would be and uh, some challenges it might present for public participation. Sure. This is an item that's at your discretion. So this is a, we've at your, at your direction, we've held off on bringing legislative items forward before the planning commission. This needs to go through um, a, a public hearing at the planning commission level and it'll come back to you guys and then it'll go to the coastal commission. So if we want to do that over zoom, we can do that. A number of the past hearings have involved a large number of people trying to participate. Um, and the thought is that could be difficult with Zoom, and it also could um, have issues where people have trouble 
logging into Zoom and using Zoom for an important legislative item. So if you guys want to move forward, we can absolutely put it on the Planning Commission agenda to do via Zoom, but that's the option right now is whether to do it on Zoom or wait till we can do something in person or in a different fashion. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to hear from the other uh, council members and see what they think. Well, I, I'll just say that's the trade-off. Um, expediency, tra trading off for uh, a po probably reduced public participation. Uh, Jefferson? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good observation. However, if we could move it forward, I agree with Rick on this topic that um, at least we could move it forward with the planning commission and see what type of participation may be uh, uh, available and how it works because in the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission, we always have uh, dozens of speakers and they're ma managing to pull it off. So uh, I would say, I, Rick, thank you for bringing it up and, and sticking with it. I appreciate that. And uh, I would support whatever uh, Rick wants to bring forward. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Jefferson. Uh, Mikey? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm worried about when we people can't get a hold and I've heard from a number of people. Feels like it's getting a little better. I would say if we do it, which I really think we need to move it forward, but you know, there's two sides to everything here. I think um, doing a really good job at publishing a phone number, and any way to make sure people get connected would probably be smart. Maybe it should be a special meeting. I'm making this up. I don't know. Um, um, it's a tricky issue. Um, but yes, I since we really don't know how long it will be till we can open up, I don't know how long we can wait around. And I guess if it feels like it, I don't know. I don't know the, the answer, but I'm antsy to see things move forward in general as well. And this item is... Uh, very important to the community, and I'm reminded on a constant basis that we have, by what we passed, left a lot, you know, number of people in this city hanging out to dry, and on any recourse when they have, you know, issues. And um, so, I'm antsy to see it move forward, and maybe it's worth giving it a try, and hopefully doing a really good job of making it so people can can get on and. And, or encourage emails like tonight with uh, Big Rock did a fantastic job at expressing their opinion here and even more with email. So anyhow, just my thoughts. Okay, thank you, Skyler. Uh, thank you, Karen. Um, I would, I think it's, you know, we can definitely, I think as a council, push it to the planning and see how it goes with the, um, you know, on Zoom, and if we can make an evaluation based on our, you know, the turnout from that and the feedback that we get, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, Trevor. You know, there's another option too. Is I I know Bonnie has a priority to move the ADU legislative item first, which probably would have less participation. You could direct that one to move forward as a test case to see how that works for a legislative item, and then follow with a short-term rental. So um, you could direct it to bring the ADU item forward first make a report to the council and then um, be ready to put the uh, short-term rental on following be an option for you as well the yeah i'm not just that i want to go to short-term rentals i'm with no delaying thing with something else i think we need to get the show on the road and i agree because the adus haven't really had their hearing and i think the intense public participation is probably coming on that one whereas we have had a big medium short-term rentals and, you know, the other thing that just occurred to me is that, look, we don't know what's going to happen with COVID at this point. What if it does come back and then we're delaying more and more? Maybe at some point we just have to see if we can move forward. If it doesn't work, we reevaluate. I, I don't know the answer, but um, maybe I'm starting to get uh, a little antsy myself, um, but I'm not sure. Maybe we should try so if I can just jump in here, um, I think what I would recommend is that we have a special planning commission meeting um, to address the short-term rentals. Um, it will require us to do noticing, so um, uh, we will certainly look at the scheduling of that and with noticing, get that um, on to the planning commission um, on a Zoom meeting as quickly as possible. And uh, just apologize to anybody ahead of time if it's a struggle to get on. So, But we, we hear you loud and clear. Great. Thank you, Reva. Uh, Skylar? Reva, what would the schedule like 
look like that off the top of your head? Is that something that could possibly be heard in the end of July? But obviously, it's based on the planning commissioner's availability and whatnot. Yeah, it would. Um, it would. I'd, I'd hate to give a date or, or some timing, but obviously, we need a 21 day notice. Um, so, assuming we could get a notice out for next week, that would put us sometime in mid July. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else comments about that? Of Jefferson. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, appreciate that position, Rick and Skyler. Uh, a lot of your community members will appreciate that as well, bringing it forward as soon as possible. It is a hotter topic right now, Mikey, as you mentioned, than the ADUs, which we know the Coastal Commission has already given us a blessing on the ADUs. It's just for us to clean up the act. So I appreciate both your efforts. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, it looks like We've concluded item 2C. So let's move on to the consent calendar, please. Mayor, it looks like one item has been pulled from the consent calendar, item 3B4. 3B4, okay. Uh, Mayor, may I make a motion to approve the consent calendar pulling item 3B4? I'll second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Peak? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Mayor Potan Pearson? Yes. Mayor Ferrer? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. So, uh, could we please have a staff report on? Item 3B4. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. I don't have much to add to um, this besides what was in the staff report. The two resolutions before you are a matter of procedure to call the November 3rd general municipal election and to request uh, consolidation with the county but i'm here for any questions and um also trevor okay thank you heather all right so uh did you say we have one public speaker yeah one public speaker is craig hill thank you hi there um i signed up for this because i didn't know if i needed to address the elected mayor option in this item or in the general public comments so i'll just take this moment to thank you for putting it on the agenda keeping an open mind and uh, realizing that this is something for the voters to decide and uh, you know so i'm glad you've moved it ahead and i'll leave it right there thanks i'll make a motion to approve item 3b4 we have a second i will second roll we'll call please Councilmember Peak? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yep. Mayor Potem Pearson? Yes. Mayor Fair? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to item 4A. Okay, we are now at item 4A. It's appeal number 19 007. Um, okay, the applicant and appellant and all of their representatives will have 15 minutes total each for their initial presentation. The typical order of events is first a staff presentation followed by the appellant team. You will have 15 minutes to present and you can save time for rebuttal. And then the same, uh, the applicant team will have 15 minutes to present and can save time for rebuttal. All right, so uh, could we have the staff report please? Yes, good evening, uh, Mayor Fair and uh, members of uh, city council. The item before you is an appeal to uh, 
project that was previously approved by the Planning Commission for a new single family residence and associated development in the La Costa Overlay District. Uh, next slide. Uh, the subject property is located at the end of Paseo Portola Street. Uh, the property is located within a developed residential neighborhood with a row of single family homes between it and Pacific Coast Highway to the south. Uh, due to previous development, the building pad is terraced and relatively flat. However, beyond the building pad, the site is characterized by steep descending slope. Uh, next slide. The subject property was previously developed with a single family residence destroyed in the wildfires of the early 1990s and remnants of the foundation are still present uh, today. The previous residence was constructed in 1962 and uh, consisted, consisted of a two, uh, 2000 square foot uh, two story single family residence with an attached garage. Uh, the proposed residence has been uh, designed to remain predominantly within the previously disturbed building pad. Uh, next slide. The proposed project is for the construction of a new 3,397 square foot two-story residence that includes a two-car garage. Um, associated development consists of the construction of decks, uh, driveway, and a pile supported uh, retaining wall to stabilize the slope and to provide a two to one uh, slope area for the septic systems uh, dripped dispersal field. Uh, the proposed project was included uh, in includes two variances, one for construction of a pile supported retaining wall on slopes steeper than 1.5 to one. And the other is for a uh, 55 linear foot segment of the retaining wall in excess of six feet, uh, but not to exceed a maximum height of nine feet. Uh, next slide. The owner of the two immediately adjacent residents appealed the planning commission decision. Uh, in summary, the appeal basis uh, were due to concerns related to uh, geotechnical liability uh, the requested variances, uh, the proximity of the proposed development to the Western Ravine, uh, compliance with fire uh, department access and uh, septic system, visual impacts of uh, the south facing uh, retaining wall. Uh, next slide. And in addition, the appellant also uh, was concerned about the depth of the uh, pile supporting the retaining wall the after the fact uh, grading, uh, an outdated posting sign, uh, geotechnical concerns and lack of a fair impartial hearing. Uh, next slide. The um, detailed response to is provided uh, to each of the appeal bases in the staff report. In general, the retaining wall is uh, necessary for the protection of the proposed micro dosing drip dispersal field, which is a type of alternative dispersal system designed to minimize uh, treated effluent from entering the soil in areas with sensitive geotechnical conditions, such as the areas underlying prehistoric landslide. Uh, the height of the wall is also predicated on the absorption uh, rate of the soil to safely uh, disperse the effluent. Uh, the larger the drip fuel area, the greater the factor of safety and therefore reducing the size of the drip fill uh, would inversely reduce the factor of safety. Uh, the project was found to comply with all applicable geotechnical requirements uh, and recommendations. Uh, inclusive of the two variances, the project complies with the La Costa Overlay District, uh, the fire department access, environmental health and geology. Uh, the uh, variances, uh, again, uh, are a requirement of um, to stabilize the hillside as well as to provide a safe um, uh, a safe uh, on-site wastewater treatment for the site. Uh, the project also complies uh, with, uh, excuse me, it's um, 
also provides updated plans showing landscaping along the south facing uh, retaining wall to screen the uh, retaining wall from Pacific Coast Highway. And per the Planning Commission, a condition of approval has been added to the resolution that requires the landscaping uh, to remain uh, for the um, screening of that wall as well. Next slide. Here's the slope analysis showing the slope um, area steeper than um, the uh, requirement in the overlay district, which is 1.5 to 1. Uh, and these areas are identified in red on this exhibit. Uh, uh, next slide. Uh, here are just photographs uh, showing the story pool um, from various angles. Uh, it shows the story pools from uh, Paseo Portola, as well as from the side, and uh, a view from Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, next slide. In conclusion, staff recommends that the City Council adopts uh, resolution number 20-23, approving the proposed project as conditioned. Uh, the applicant and the appellant and staff uh, are available for any of your questions. Okay, thank you, Adrian. Okay, uh, next the appellant team may present. Again, you have 15 minutes total. Would you like to save any time for rebuttal? So we're gonna, um, I'm gonna call Alan Block first for the appellant team. And um, if you wanna save any time, Alan, you can let us know. Um, also, if someone else from your team will be speaking after you, please let me know at the end and we'll call them from the participant list. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, can you hear me, Madam Mayor? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alan Block representing the um, appellants, uh, Tracy and Jim Moore. Although my clients filed their appeal on numerous issues, I'm here to speak solely on the variance request for heights of the retaining wall in excess of six feet. The project is gonna be located along the noted visual and scenic corridor. PCH is a designated scenic highway. The wall is gonna be located within 160 feet of Pacific Coast Highway. It will be an eyesore and visually obtrusive to all passersby looking north towards the mountains in this area. It will loom over the homes below it. The applicant is requesting the walls up to nine feet high, which is 50 feet high, or excuse me, 50% higher than what's approved or permitted under the LCP. And for a distance, a linear of, of over 55 or approximately 55 feet in excess of the six foot height limit. The wall uh, was not designed or reviewed by the applicable agencies because it wasn't uh, part of the variance request until the second hearing before the planning commission. When this application was originally submitted, there was no request for a variance for walls in excess of six feet because the applicant never mentioned that walls in excess of six feet would be necessary. The sections 6.5 A and B of the LIP require that walls, or that projects including walls be designed and sited to minimize adverse impact on scenic areas. In this case, this wall has not been. Alternatives have not been studied or reviewed to minimize the visual impacts of the wall. The LIP requires that project alternatives be revised, or be, excuse me, be reviewed and studied. And there is an alternative in this case, and it's referenced in your council agenda report at page nine when it states that two six foot walls with a three foot separation could be permitted. If that were the case, there would be no need for the variance in this case. Although referenced in your council agenda report, the report summarily and conclusionarily dismisses this alternative by merely saying that it would not significantly reduce the view impacts and would cost more money to construct. Actually, the language I think is more similar to would not uh, significantly improve potential view impacts. Well, my question is, how do we know? It's never been studied. The applicant has never produced any rendering, never erected story poles. There hasn't been any review of any alternative will be, that might be feasible in this situation. The Planning Commission staff report 
for the September 19th hearing, which was the second hearing before the Planning Commission. It's dated uh, August 19th. It lists five findings that are necessary to approve a CDP in this uh, scenic and uh, visual area. Those findings, which all have to be made in the positive, uh, provide as follows. One, the project is proposed will have no significant adverse scenic or visual impact due to design or its location. Two, the project is condition will not have significant adverse scenic and visual impacts. Three, the project as proposed or condition is the least environmentally damaging alternative. Four, there are no feasible alternatives. And there's a fifth finding regarding Escher properties that is, that is not relevant in this situation. But with regard to the findings that are required under chapter six of the LIP, this project or this wall has to be the least environmentally damaging alternative and that there can't be any feasible alternatives. I submit that we don't know the Planning Commission staff report or its adopted resolution even references possible alternatives for the height of the wall. Although your staff report references it on, I believe on page nine and summarily dismisses it, your proposed resolution doesn't even uh, reference that there might be an alternative for, for the, the height of the wall. I, I submit that there is an alternative and that this two six foot high retaining We seem to be having an audio issue. Can you stop his time? Yeah, it's stopped. Okay. Uh, Mr. Block, I don't know if you can hear me. We're having an audio issue hearing you right now. If we can, maybe we can uh, bring in the other appellants. Um, James Moore is also part of the appellant team. Okay. Um, so, can you so hear me? Mr. Moore speak and then see if we can get Mr. Block back connected. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes. I'm sorry. Who is this? Who's speaking, please? This is Mr. Moore. I show He's Mr. Moore now. is... He's uh, back. It was Mr. Moore. He's back now, though, I think. Yeah, uh, James Moore. Okay, uh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, yeah, just a few comments till we bring Mr. Block back. Uh, one is that uh, this is still deeply concerning to the neighborhood. On my written comments that I submitted, uh, there's a neighborhood sign-up sheet uh, for people expressing their concerns for this. It's Exhibit 7 to my written uh, document. Um, hopefully you all saw we had renderings done of this wall. We did the best we could because there's so limited data, but hopefully you saw those so you get a sense of how massive this wall uh, really is and why we think it's out of compliance with the Malibu lip. The, uh, uh, as Mr. Block said, there's been, uh, we can't find a rendering. Uh, you can see that in exhibit three that was submitted by the developer, there's no rendering of the wall. Uh, there, it was never story pulled, so there's never a chance for the neighborhood to, to get a, a visual sense of, of this wall. Um, the, uh, there's a couple comments in there that there's trees that would partially mask uh, this development. Uh, the one on, on uh, first of all, we think those are weak arguments, but for, for the, uh, there was one mention of a mature tree. And uh, that's actually not a mature tree. That's a, uh, a, a planting of sumac trees up and down our property line. And if you look at exhibits four and five, you'll, you'll see that there were no sumac trees there originally. And there's an email there where I'd asked the developer not to plant those or, or to keep those trimmed back because of the fire danger. But one of our family members is willing to testify under oath that they saw, they saw workmen uh, measuring and planting sumac trees up, up our property line. So we think that's a, a weak argument to suggest that that would help mask the wall. In fact, we're not even sure the wall would even be masked by that. We think it's in front of that. Um, we're also concerned about uh, why the western part of the retaining wall was eliminated. We were always told that that was necessary for the stability of, of the uh, 
of the structure and the uh, leach field. And uh, why, how did that somehow get past the fire department to the planning commission? Uh, it obviously it didn't appear to be approved by the fire department. Also, it appears because of the slopes that there, there should be an administra administrative plan review that uh, was not done. One last thing I just want to mention on geology. Hopefully you saw the letter that Craig Hill sent. Um, uh, there's caissons moving on the western part of this into the uh, arroyo that's coming down from the Calle de Barco landslide. Um, the, um, so you've in a sense got two landslides we're, we're dealing with here. Uh, there was a landslide on Hume Road uh, a couple years ago or so that actually collapsed the wall and uh, uh, Mr. Hill uh, talks about that in his letter. Um, microdosing systems that are required for this project are uh, not usually on, on slopes steeper than three to one. Now I know this is supposed to be graded down to two to one, but it's unusual to have it on slopes as steep. And uh, this, the wall is definitely towering over the neighbors below it. Um, those are my comments. Uh, Rody Castro, I think would like to make some comments. And also there's a, a gentleman who would like to speak from the public, Dwayne King, uh, who would, I, as I understand it would not take up our time because we do want to save time for rebuttal. Uh, okay, so now we'll hear from Rody Castro. Thank you. Is, wait, is she is she part of the Appellant team? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me now? We can. Oh, wonderful! Hi, my name is Rody Castro, and I own the house below the project. And uh, I have a couple of comments. First of all, uh, the new home is going to be uh, over 70% bigger than the original home. Uh, the wall that is going to be uh, surrounding that place, uh, it's going to be tremendous. It's going to be just too high and very threatening. Uh, in case it, uh, the caissons collapse, uh, the whole uh, house and the whole wall is going to come into our house and destroy my house below. And hopefully um, nobody's going to be home uh, to be killed. Uh, the builder also uh, tries to, to correct, uh, object to the uh, being uh, correct in doing uh, what he's supposed to do, the two six foot tall uh, uh, walls due to financial burdens. Well, financial burdens on him should not be taken in consideration. <laughs> um, also the situation again with the cases on uh, Hume Road that collapsed and uh, the destruction was ter tremendous all around. Uh, also, there was no notice ever about the poles uh, and uh, which way the story poles and we really weren't, uh, nobody was given adequate uh, notice. I will uh, leave the rest of my time to Mr. Block. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, is Mr. Block going to speak again? Does, does any of the appellant want to say, I mean, again, we can hold on to that time and Mr. Block can speak at rebuttal unless they think he's coming back online. I don't know they're in touch with him. Is Alan back yet? So maybe we should hold the time and let the applicant go? Yeah. Okay, I'll make sure the appellant uh, is okay with that. There's uh, five minutes and 30 seconds remaining for rebuttal. I'll unmute Mr. Moore. Um, I'm sorry, I'm back. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. You want to okay. save? I apologize. <laughs> We've had a tough time figuring out this how this all this Zoom works. I apologize. <laughs> no worries. Did you want to um, save yes, the rest if, of your if time? We get a time? If we get a little time for Mr. Block, we'd appreciate that very much. Absolutely. We'll save that for the rebuttal. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So now we'll move on to the applicant team, Mayor. Yes. Okay, uh, and we'll call Don Schmitz first. 
And again, Don, your team has 15 minutes. And if you want um, someone to speak after you, please just let me know so we can call them from the participant list. That would be fantastic. Uh, audio check. Can you all hear me? We can. In a point of order, uh, before uh, we start the clock and I do my presentation, I also want to let you know that uh, signed up to speak to answer questions should you need it is Jake Holt, the consulting geologist, uh, Jose Fulganiti, who is the architect, and the uh, owner, uh, Richard uh, Perrin, who is uh, also available to answer questions, but I'll be making the presentation. So with that, I want to thank you, council members, uh, and I want to thank your staff uh, uh, for your attention to this matter tonight. If I could see the next slide, please. Got to be quick on the button there. A lot of ground to cover. <laughs> so you can see the foundation from the house that was built in 1962. And you can see that this was a, a traditional house. It sat there for 30 years. It wasn't damaged by a landslide. It was burned up in the old Topanga Canyon fire. Next slide, please. So in 1993, it was uh, destroyed and the proposed single family residence was approved by the Planning Commission in September 3rd, 2019. This is not a fire rebuild exemption council members. This is a new home consistent with the LCP and the La Costa overlay. Next slide, please. Now we made a number of modifications to try and be uh, respectful uh, to the comments of the community and the planning commission. Uh, we were heard back in April, 2019. We went back to the drawing board. We eliminated the basement. We eliminated any portion of uh, the lateral projection went out more than 40 feet. We incorporated modifications to the landscaping plan. Next slide. So this was the house on the left was what was in front of the planning commission on April 1st, 2019. The house on the right of your screen is what was actually approved by the planning commission in September. You can see the reductions in the bulk in the size of the home adjacent to Mr. Moore, the appellant. Next slide, please. We eliminated the basement as previously discussed. Next slide. And the massing of the structure as it pertains, especially to that crucial area next to Mr. Moore, the appellant's house, uh, was dramatically modified. You can see that yellow line, that's the 40 foot horizontal projection, which is an important component of the La Costa overlay on how you measure heights and how far you're supposed to come out from the street and following the slope. Next slide, please. You can see that this resulted in a uh, pretty dramatic change in the bulk and the massing of the project, both as, as it is seen from Pacific Coast Highway, but also uh, to be respectful of our neighbor to the east. Next slide. So we also incorporated modifications to the landscaping plan at the urging of the planning commission. We incorporated landscaping to shield and soften the uh, required retaining wall, which we need for our wastewater system. Next slide. So we will be incorporating these honeysuckle vines or trellises to completely cover the wall. The wall, by the way, I'll embellish upon, is mostly six feet on the southeast corner. It goes up to nine feet. Next slide. So it was approved by the Planning Commission. I'm very pleased to see uh, Chair Steve Uring's signature on that. It was a three-to-one vote uh, with uh, Maza Jennings and Uring voting in favor of the project. Next slide. So the appeal items are roughly addressed in the staff report and, and, and grouped together as TDSF and consistency with the neighboring properties, fire department access, and the two variances for construction on slopes steeper than one and a half to one and the retaining wall height. Next slide. So the appellants assert that although we're consistent with the TDSF, we're not consistent with the neighborhood character. Next slide. Now, this really is a bit of a stunner for us as the applicants because the appellant's house is some 30% larger than that which we are proposing. We're 2,963 square feet with a 434 square foot garage. His home is at 4,496 square foot with a 480 square foot garage. Next slide. And you can see that the houses on the street go up in elevation. Some of them are very tall, which is why we have different development standards for the La Costa overlay, taking into account the historical pattern of development. But clearly the home that is proposed and was approved by the Planning Commission is not inconsistent with the community character. Next slide. 
The next, one of the other uh, bit of a head scratchers for us is that uh, the appellants are indicating that we haven't uh, uh, substantiated that we have to comply with the fire department requirements for the five foot walk around. The staff report addresses this, says the fire department required the five foot walk away around the residence and that it extends into the one and a half to one slopes. Next slide. This is in fact the approval. Uh, you can see the approval from the fire department on the referral sheet. You can see the stamp. We've highlighted the area around the house. It is true that in 1962, the house that was there before was not subjected to the same fire department access and safety standards that we require right now. But every single house that comes in front of this city has to have this five foot walk around area to uh, promote the uh, and facilitate the fire department access. I'm sure that uh, uh, Chief Mullen, uh, Captain Mullen will be able to address this at greater length if he wishes. Next slide, please. So we do have steeper slopes on the property. Staff already showed you this. Next slide. And we must have this infiltration area of 2,352 square foot. It's not contingent on the size of the house, but it has to go there and it must go on those steeper slopes. Next slide. And the geology of the area really drives home the point on why exactly we have to do this. Next slide. So you can see the house outlined in black and you can see we're really nailing the property to the bedrock through this prehistoric landslide with caissons. You can see the location of the proposed pile supported uh, retaining wall. That sliver of blue is the little bit of sliver fill we have to do to gentle out the grade so that we can create the onsite wastewater treatment system micro dosing field. Next slide. Now, microdosing field is not like your traditional wastewater treatments or dispersal system like a seepage pit or a leach line. They're these very small, shallowly buried uh, microdosing lines, and these put out just little drops of water spread out over a larger area. Next slide. Now, the reason for that is because this means that most of the water will be evapotranspired. That means we will not be introducing water into the prehistoric landslide and creating lubrication, even though the house that was there for 30 years just had a traditional system. The city of Malibu is very, very tough in regards to addressing uh, geologic is issues such as this ancient landslide. Next slide, please. So this is the retaining wall that we must have so that it's not overly steep for our micro dosing area. You can see that the retaining wall height is six feet in most places. On the southeastern corner, it is nine feet. I have to tell you though, I'm a little bit stymied to explain why the appellants would assert that it would be better for us to have two six foot walls in this corner for a total height of 12 feet as opposed to the one wall at nine feet. Next slide, please. So this is a blow up of what I was just describing to you before. You can see that the existing slope is overly steep. We're putting in a sliver fill to, to reduce it down to 50%. The appellant is incorrect. This is completely consistent with the design standards of these micro dosing uh, geoflow systems. And we have to have the retaining wall to make sure that we do not have an overly steep area so that we can have this extraordinarily sensitive system for the microdosing field. Next slide, please. It's also interesting to point out that our next door neighbor, the appellant, has two retaining walls in the same area, roughly appear to be five foot and six feet, staggered down on the steeper portion of his property directly below the house in the same area that we are proposing to do the retaining wall for our microdosing field. Next slide. However, he does not have a micro dosing system. We're not certain exactly what the geology is under his property. Perhaps the landslide stops exactly at our property line, but what he does have is traditional seepage pits in the same stretch of the hillside that we're proposing micro dosing, taking that water and putting it in an uncontrolled fashion with no evapotranspiration directly down into the hillside. Next slide, please. Our system has been approved not only by the health department, but by the geotechnical uh, department for the city of Malibu, who required us to have the evapotranspiration system to make sure we had the very safest project possible. Next slide, please. So the project is consistent with the municipal code, the LCP and the La Costa Overlay District, district and it is consistent with the community character. Next slide. Again, our neighbor's property is slightly smaller, 
They have 4,496 square foot house with 480 square foot garage. We have a 2,963 square foot house with a 434 square foot garage. Understand floor area ratio is a commercial design standard, not applicable to residential, but it does describe to you how much house is going on a particular size lot. So we have a FAR of 0.32. Their FAR for the house that they have on their property is almost 50%, 0.49. They have four stories. We're proposing three. Our lateral projection coming out from the street is 40 feet. We pulled it back at the urging of the Planning Commission. Their lateral projection is 71 feet, 31 feet more than the La Costa overlay allows. If there's concerns about visual impacts to Pacific Coast Highway, I don't think it should be something that is put upon the applicant's project. They've addressed it. They're landscaping the wall. It's a very compact design consistent with the city standards. Next slide. So the variances are required to improve the slope stability. So the microdose drip field serves an advanced system that substantially eliminates effluent from percolating into the ground. And I do want to address uh, uh, the comments of our our neighbor, uh, Rody, who uh, I'm sensitive to that. But I also want to point out that the house that was there for 30 years did not have these caissons going all over the property, did not have the retaining walls, did not have the microdosing system. It was far inferior to that which is being proposed today. This project will demonstrably improve the stability of the property and will, in fact, ensure the protection of her property and the other properties down slope as has been determined by the city geologist and the consulting geologist. So with that, I would like to retain the remainder of my time for rebuttal and I'm available for any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. Uh, All right, do we have any other public speakers uh, on this item that are not part of the appellant or applicant team? We do too. We have Sandra Martin and Dwayne King. Thank you. So first we'll hear from Sandra Martin. Uh, yes, hi. I'm I'm the architect actually of this uh, project, and uh, I don't have any common comment uh, other than what Dan uh, was saying. I will um, save my time for any question that you have for me. Next, we'll hear from Dwayne King. Mr. King? Can you hear me? Yes. We can. Hello. Uh, Good evening, council members and Mayor Fair. Uh, Dwayne King, resident of Malibu and owner of a property at 21224 Pacific Coast Highway, proximate to this subject parcel. I've been living in Malibu since 1969 and very surprised at the number of friends and neighbors who brought to my attention the construction uh, proposed on this site, specifically this massive retaining wall to be built toward the bottom of the site. As they drive by the subject property several times a day, you know, I try to envision how this wall, you know, will impact views from east and uh, eastbound and uh, westbound PCH traffic. And it's a daunting challenge because there are no story poles. There's no specs or plans available uh, to, to you know, consider. Uh, after thinking about this for a while you know, and its impact, It's clear to me that it would be nothing but this massive negative wall. And when I heard the project was on the agenda for tonight's meeting, I decided to sign up and be heard. As a real estate attorney by background, I've reviewed the relevant code sections, which are uh, namely provision 6.5 of the LIP with respect to the scenic views and construction of proposed wall. It's obvious the planning commission either overlooked or decided not to address these code sections as it would be extremely hard to square the LIP language with the impact this wall has on the views in either direction on PCH. Uh, The retaining wall and its characteristics are entirely inconsistent with 
the language in the LIP. So I would be respectfully uh, requesting that the mayor and the council members reconsider the approval of the wall. Thank you. Thank you. So now we can go back to Alan. What? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I can, can, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, I, I apologize. I lost my internet connection and uh, I called up a, a number and I was on hold for a long time, but I, I, I greatly apologize. I, I heard most of the, uh, uh, the applicant's presentation. I mean, I think the bottom line is there have been no studies of the alternate uh, that's available. And we don't know whether it would be less or, or more visually obtrusive, but we know that it wasn't analyzed. We know that the applicant never erected story poles or pr produced any um, rendering that showed the elevations of the wall. And, and I submit that the findings for consistency with chapters six and 13 of the LIP can't be made. There have been no similar size walls approved to this height in this area. All the properties have similar topography, but there are no similarly sized walls to eight to nine feet in height. And there are no approved variances that we know of. Clearly, neither the Planning Commission uh, or City Council uh, staff reports or resolutions uh, reference any. And I submit that this has to be reviewed, and it wasn't. And under, under the LIP and the requirements for the issuance of a postal permit, they should be. And thank you for the opportunity. And again, I apologize for losing my internet connection. Alan, does anyone else from your team want to talk as far as rebuttal goes? Jim, would you like to say anything? Can we unmute James Moore, please? Thank you. Okay, can you hear me now? Hello? We can. You can hear me. Okay, great. Um, yes, uh, just a few comments. Uh, the uh, first of all, I, I still don't see renderings of this wall from from uh, the applicants. Uh, as far as the size of our house and our neighbor's house, we all built like for like after the '93 fire, and we were afforded 10 percent, and that's that's what we did. No variances. Uh, this, as far as the size of the leach field, um, my understanding from the staff report is that that it may not need such a large leach field if you reduce the number of bedrooms uh, and or the number of fixtures, whichever is more restrictive. That's in the staff report. Um, I don't under, we don't understand why this, this uh, the walk around for the fire department just came into the, the picture uh, at this point, uh, really last minute. How did that get past the fire department? The, uh, um, as Mr. Uh, Craig Hill mentioned in his his letter, there is a concern about what happened with that retaining wall on Hume Road that did collapse and caused a lot of problems. The uh, hopefully you've seen the renderings we did. Again, we did that the best we could based on the information we had, which was very limited. But if you look at those renderings, it's I think you can see how massive this wall really is. And with that, those are my comments. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Moore, does anyone else from your team want to speak? You have almost three minutes left. Um, I think unless uh, unless Alan has any more comments, I think I think we've covered it. Uh, like I said, I just hope you look at those renderings, and uh, um, and the uh, uh, those retaining walls that that he mentioned on our property. Those are just planters. Those aren't retaining walls; just planters, so we could plant vegetables. That's all those are. And with that, Alan, do you have any more? Uh, no, I, I think that I've say, said it all. It, it all goes to, you know, we're talking about 55 linear feet of walls in excess of six feet. And, and nine feet is 50% higher than what's permitted in the code. We, we have no renderings, no story poles, no studies. Uh, and I submit that the findings, uh, you know, there is not substantial evidence in the record to support the necessary findings. And I thank you for your time and, and your consideration. Okay, thank you. All right, and then the applicant team, can we get Don Schmitz unmuted, please? 
I bet you guys wish you could have a mute button on me all the time, don't you? <laughs> Can you hear me? We can. Okay. So uh, uh, briefly, without any redundancy, I want to address some of the uh, closing comments and some of the things that were said. Uh, first of all, talking about other landslides further up the canyon, things of that nature are, are, are really beside the point. Uh, this isn't the big rock landslide. It's not the Hume Road landslide. It's a very small landslide that's been investigated in very great detail. And uh, we have passed the review from the city geologist. I also want to assure the council that uh, several different wall iterations and plans were processed by uh, the applicant team, uh, and they were vetted uh, with Adrian. I'm sure he can speak to this. Uh, two six-foot-tall walls were uh, were investigated, and of course, we went with the one wall at nine foot in that one corner. There's just no question that this geoflow uh, system, this evapotranspiration system, is completely superior to that which the neighbors are utilizing, which is a standard uniform plumbing code system. It cannot be overly steep. That's why we need the retaining walls. Council members, these walls are not going to be cheap. It's not going to create a yard area or anything like that. Its sole function is to create the appropriate area for the geoflow system as was required by the city geologist and by the health department. That's the only two variances. This is entirely a clean sheets project except for the development that we have to do to accommodate the safety concerns of the city geologist and health department. The walls have been reviewed. Everything was looked at in very great detail. The planning commission approved the project. It is consistent with the uh, view shed protection policies and it's worthy of your support. Thank you very much. Thank you. And John, is there anyone else from your team that's speaking? Uh, well, I think we, the time was bouncing back and forth. Do we have time left over? Yeah, you have two minutes. We're having an issue with the timer right now. Okay, so you faked me out pretty good with that. <laughs> there is just one other thing that I would, would like to say to, uh, to everybody um, that's deliberating on this. Uh, our client, uh, Mr. Perrin's in his 70s, and he's been working for a very long period of time and spent copious amounts of money to try and conform with the applicable regulations, not just of the planning department, and yes, addressing the protection of public views to and along Pacific Coast Highway. I note that the appellants don't bring any substantiating documentation that there's gonna be significant deleterious impacts to the view shed of Pacific Coast Highway from this wall, because there's not going to be. There's a lot of development and existing landscaping, and we're going to be covering the, uh, the wall with, with the vines in that area. And the vast majority of the wall, I don't know, 75% plus, is, is it six feet? It's entirely code compliant. But my point is this. When you have an applicant who spends an additional, I don't know, five, six months after spending a year or two on a project designing it, listens to the planning commission, listens to the neighbors, go back and redesign and brings it forward and gets the planning commission approval, this shouldn't be penalized further. Like I said, the man's in his 70s. He would like to retire here and enjoy this house. And I do not think that this uh, appeal has any significant merit. And again, I would urge you to uphold the planning commission approval. Thank you. Okay, is that it for uh, appellant and applicant? Yeah. yeah, that concludes all the comments. Okay, um, so do we have, uh, Skylar, I see you have your hand up. Thank you. Just in the, uh, in all transparency and full disclosure, I did receive and had a phone call with Mr. Schmitz um, for the applicant on this property. I did not receive any communications from the appellant other than what was in our staff binders. Thank you, Skylar. Do we have any other council comments, disclosures? Uh, let's see, Rick and then Jefferson. Yeah, I was contacted by Don Schmitz and um, requested to have a Skype meeting with him, but I asked him if he wouldn't mind meeting me on the property site because I want to see it for myself, and he was kind enough to do that. And uh, so we met at the property, walked around, and discussed a lot of stuff. Did you learn anything that was not in the staff report? Uh, I don't 
don't think so. You know, the 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 issue with the, when I read the staff report, the wall stood out to me. I didn't remember the the height or anything, so I asked him about it when we were there, and uh, I said, "What's the deal with the wall? How big the wall?" And he said, "That's oh, six feet." And then I went back and afterwards and read the staff report again, and it said, you know, it's 55 feet long, and it goes as high as nine feet. And so I recontacted him and said, hey, um, you know, I thought you said the wall was six feet. And I knew he had a, he had a PowerPoint presentation, so I asked him to send me the PowerPoint presentation because I want to see a rendition of the wall. And so I've kind of been seeking a rendition of the wall, and I haven't seen it and i feel like i'm i would like to see what that freaking wall looks like that's my only thing so i mean i i was impressed with the fact that they were um they designed the building so that the uh, gentleman who lives there already can still have his great view it's a kind of killer view i mean he's got a wonderful view of pacific coast highway in malibu and the sighting of it and everything is back so that they're not compromising that. I didn't really have any problem with the building or anything. It's just, I would like to see your rendition of the wall because the wall is the one thing that, you know, it kind of stands out. Did the uh, PowerPoint forward you? Was that what we all saw? Uh, yeah, I think it was. Yeah, pretty much. And, you know, you can see and there's no real, there's that one thing where it has the picture of the honeysuckle, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really show how that wall is in comparison to the property, et cetera. So that's my, I mean, if I could just see a freaking rendition of what the wall is like and how much of that 50 foot is greater than six feet, that would give me the information that I need. Other than that, I don't really have any beef with that. Ms. Mayor? Uh, yes. Uh, and then uh, Jefferson had his hand up next and then Skyler. Okay. Just uh, since we didn't, uh, do disclosures before the item was called. If we could just quickly do disclosures from everyone and then give both the applicant and the appellant and our public speaker a chance if they want to speak just about the disclosures, give an opportunity to comment on that since they, they didn't get a chance. Okay, thank you. Um, do we do a roll call for that? How do you want to handle it? Well, we have two down. If we could get the other council members to uh, make their disclosures and then send it back to the applicant and the, app and the appellant. Okay, so we have Skylers and Ricks. Uh, can we do Jefferson, then Mikey, and then me? Yes, thank you, Mayor Jefferson. Here, uh, I did the uh, what Don Schmitz calls the wind windshield drive-by, and uh, so I've only made that a uh, visit. I didn't learn anything uh, other than what's there. I was contacted by the offices of Don Schmitz to have a meeting. I just could not make the meeting, so I did the windshield drive-by. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jefferson. Mikey? Um, I actually lived very close to this house when I was a teenager. Uh, no surprise, I lived all over Malibu. Um, so my house I lived in was just on Ramble Vista, the one house outside the photo that was shown earlier. So I know this area very well. I was also a planning commissioner for seven years and dealt with a lot of the issues that seem to be concerning. So I have that background. And I did have a brief conversation with Don over, like, I don't know what we were on, not, not Zoom or something. It was terrible quality. But we did talk about a little about the project. I learned nothing that was uh, new from what's in the staff report. Okay, thank you. And I had a uh, phone call with Don Schmitz at his request. Uh, to talk about this and um, did not learn anything new other than what's in the agenda. Thank you. Okay, Trevor. If, if we could just give uh, first the appellant a chance if they want to make a comment about any of the, just about the disclosures and then give the applicant the same opportunity. Okay, thank so you. we can get Alan Block unmuted. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Ex party communications, you know, I, I, I mean, I understand, uh, you know, that they're appropriate. It seems that all the council members, you know, disclose uh, their conversations and, and, you know, as long as they keep an open mind on this item, I, I don't have a problem. Okay. And then can we get Don Schmitz unmuted? 
Yes, uh, Don Schmitz for the record. Uh, strictly on the issue of the ex partes, uh, the, uh, to answer uh, Trevor's question, yes, I sent exactly the PowerPoint presentation I showed to the public and to the uh, council uh, tonight. It's exactly the same PowerPoint presentation. I also showed that to uh, Councilman Mullen on the site visit. Uh, it's regret regrettable that we had a miscommunication in regards to the height of the wall. Clearly, the height of the wall at that one southeast corner at nine feet has always been the subject of the variance application. Uh, so he contacted me on that today, and I did clarify that. And uh, that's why I sent him over the PowerPoint presentation, which does delineate the area of the wall, which is over six feet in height. Okay, thank you, Skylar. Um, Don, I had a question for you, which is in kind of in regards to Rick's. Do you guys have anything that you could provide to us right now, maybe via email, that would be a elevation of where the wall is, like looking, uh, you know, like the view of it, not just a top-down view, but something that's looking at the elevation? Well, at my finger uh, tips, no. Uh, if you guys are hearing me, my microphone's bobbing, so I indicate that you can. Uh, I do know that the uh, project applicants uh, close to a year ago, maybe a little bit less, did vet that with uh, uh, with your planner uh, and took a look at the two six-foot walls or the nine-foot wall, which would uh, accomplish the gentling of the slope for the microdose system. Uh, but no, I, I have not brought anything to present uh, to you tonight in that regard. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, other council member comments, questions? Mikey? Um, I just want to say a couple of things here. Um, I think, you know, to Mr. Moore's point, it's, it is, um, it's really hard when somebody builds next to you and there's been no one there for decades. It's super, super hard. And I think one of the first things I learned as a planning commissioner was I was really caught off guard that lots that were unbuildable were being built. And I didn't understand it. And um, I believe it was Joyce before Bonnie was had the helm. You know, I said to her, I said, so was this, why is this? And the answer, I already knew the answer because with, you know, as technology improved and if you had enough money, you could pretty much put caissons in and build anywhere. So comparing it to another project, as I think was said by Trevor or Don or somebody, that does make sense. So there is increased technology and you have to prove a, a factor of safety, which, which took me a while to figure out. The other thing I'll say with, um, is that I've, Never seen a project like this where doing two walls appeared less than one wall. Um, it just, it creates this massing effect that I'd be shocked if two walls made look better. The one thing to the Moore's point, I guess, is yes, it's a little hard to tell what it would look like. I like the honeysuckle to cover it. I could also see maybe some sort of bushes in front. Um, to kind of break up that massing because I can see that that's an issue. And yes, and codes have changed since the original house was built. And clearly by the size of the houses in the neighborhood, the old size of houses just isn't really a factor here for better or worse. It's just the way it is. Um, so um, give me a second. Looking at some of the other appeal items, I also learned many years on the Planning Commission that I know there was a code violation and some grading that just has to be fixed. It's not a reason to uh, uh, deny the application. Um, we find there's a massive amount of code violations when you're a Planning Commissioner, some intentional, some not, but you have to rectify that before you can go forward on a project. So that's, that's, that's really important. Um, lots uh, on your appeal number six, lots of lots in Malibu are very challenging. And I'm sure this is one of them, like I said, I know your street very well. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm sure this is a challenging project for 
not only the applicant, but for the neighbors. I, I agree there. Um, I don't think your appeal number three is that I don't think there's a case in this point to make the residence smaller in terms of the treatment system. Um, it is, let me put it another way. It's notable to me that the plan, our planning commission passed this item. They look, take a very strong look at the size of buildings, um, their situation on our property. And um, I think that's something they are hyper-focused on. They made this project come back again before they approved it. So I think that's notable, and I I don't have a reason to overturn that that I see. Um, hang on. I thought when I became a planning commissioner, I thought I was going to be the planning commissioner that never approved a variance. My very first meeting, I found out why I was wrong. There is a reason for variances and they cannot be granted freely. They have to be looked at seriously. To Mr. Block's point, they have to pass a number of steps. Um, at this point, I believe that this one has. Um, and I'll listen to everybody else and, and keep my mind open as always. Um, so the, I think the planning commission did a good job of trying to shield this wall. I think the one wall is smarter than two. Um, I just, there's no way that that double stack won't just turn it into a, a, a bigger issue. I know that probably when homes were built there before, they didn't need this wall. Things have changed and that's, it is what it is. Um, but I'd be open to seeing if there's a way of breaking up that massing a little more with maybe uh, additional kind of planting that might just break up the linear vision of it there. Um, that part of the neighborhood, um, a lot of the planting over the years, it's grown and grown and grown. And um, it's, it, you know, like I said, I lived right near there. I know how the planting uh, typically on most lots is, 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 pretty, is pretty good. It's a mature neighborhood, even after the fire burned it all down. Um, so anyhow, those are my comments for now. Um, and uh, I'll listen to everyone else and we'll go for it. Okay, thank you, Mikey. Um, I, I will say I echo uh, most of Mikey's comments. Um, I think it's worth noting, there's geologist approval, planning department recommendation, planning commission approval, I think is particularly noteworthy um, if you follow our planning commission, there's often not the kind of consensus that you see uh, with this project. And a uh, critical item, fire department approval. So um, I also lived in that neighborhood. Uh, I lived, in fact, I lived there during the 93 fire. Um, so I'm very familiar with, with the topography there, the lots um, and what was necessary with the creation of the overlay district to make rebuilding possible there. So um, I don't really have much more to say about that. Uh, and I will leave it to other council members. Uh, Skyler, you have a comment, question? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I don't have any issues with the project as it's done. I think that they've done a good job of, you know, making it fit sort of the parameters that are in place for there. I very much understand the variance in regard to the the septic system, um, the, especially the wall for that. As much as you'd not like to see something like that, I don't think you have a choice based on the property here. So I'd like to make a motion to uh, deny the appeal and approve. I'm looking for the uh, postal development uh, resolution 19-20. That's staff's recommendation, right? Yes. Jefferson. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate that. Uh, working along with the comments from the other council members and listening to Mr. Moore's comments, uh, the wall is large, um, high. Uh, it's going to have a substantial footing. Um, it's really a, an engineering project in itself. And I understand evapotranspiration and microdosing from learning so much about the La Paz project, which was a Don Schmitz project as well. So the science is there. I, I agree that uh, it's a better way than just uh, putting in 
uh, cesspools or uh, fields that would spread out all over. When you do the micro dosing, it also invites a, a healthier plant structure uh, above. So that part I get, I understand, no problem. The issue is the visual blight and the masking of the wall. And I did read some of the report about what would be planted there. Um, of course, it wouldn't be succulent because that's to uh, prone to sliding. So it has to be deep root and it has to be significant enough to hide the wall from the visual impacts that you'll have on PCH, addressing Mr. Block's issues. So if we can find that that is not going to be something that would be lax or something that wouldn't be fulfilled, I would feel better. Thank you. Thank you, Jefferson. Uh, Rick, I see your hand up. Yeah, I got a question for uh, Adrian or Don, if Adrian doesn't know. I'm looking at uh, their PowerPoint. Is that wall, am I reading this right? Is the wall 20 feet back from the property line? I didn't give you the dimension on that. Um, but I also wanted to just uh, make clear, so the retaining wall is mostly six feet. Uh, there is a section that is 55 feet long where the wall is taller than six feet. Um, and it reaches a maximum height of six feet. Um, there is also a wall rendering that the applicant provided a long time ago. It's pretty primitive, but we can see that if you like. I think Parker's pulling that up for you. So um, here's the, the rendering the applicant provided. Um, Unfortunately, it doesn't provide a lot of information um, in terms of the topography and other elements uh, that are proposed on the property. Um, but you can tell with um, the lines, the area that we're talking about. So it's the western uh, south portion of the retaining wall that will exceed, exceed six feet in height. And the measurement that we use for retaining walls is uh, we're measuring the very bottom of that wall um, to the very top of uh, the wall, uh, and it includes freeboard. Uh, and there's typically anywhere between six to a foot of freeboard on top of the retaining wall. And so the nine foot includes all of that. But um, the wall is uh, offset from the rear property line. As the question, I can give you the exact dimension if that's uh, it'll just yeah, that'd be great. Second. I mean, I, th yeah. I think it's 20 feet, but this this is actually what I was looking for. I was looking for some type of a rendition of what the heck the wall would be like, and this is great because it, you know, it was it almost seemed like it was right next to the neighbor's house, and being set back like that makes a big difference. And I appreciate that. No problem. Uh, okay, thanks, uh, Adrian Jefferson. Thank you, Mayor. Once again, Don, uh, if you could answer the, the question about. Uh, adding additional load to the beach side or the hillside um, in front of the wall. So if you were to hide the wall with an additional 100, 50, 50 yards of soil stacked against the front side of the wall so that the visual impact from the highway is not so significant, would that extra load have bearing uh, anywhere if you just did a couple of feet against the wall? that you could put the plant material and the plant pallet from that point up? Uh, I was actually uh, waving my hand at the screen and then I hit the, uh, the button there. Uh, the uh, issue of additional screening is one that we're completely amenable to. Uh, one thing that I can uh, offer up uh, without any uh, hesitation whatsoever is to plant additional bushes or or smaller trees with the following caveats. Uh, we do not want to have anything that uh, requires a lot of irrigation because we do not want to add water to that hillside uh, to protect our neighbors down below. And we don't want to have anything that would be inconsistent with the uh, fire safety standards. All that being said, there are certainly certain uh, native species like Quercus agrifolia, you know, coast live oaks, that we uh, probably could plant to uh, uh, screen the wall, we'd be completely amenable to doing that. As for uh, some additional berming 
uh, Jefferson in front of the wall, I would, uh, I'd be okay with that, but I would have to ask, uh, Mr. Jake Holt, who is, uh, the consulting uh, geologist, uh, whether or not that would create any sort of problems for us in regards to loading on that hillside. But in principle, um, I wouldn't have any problem with that whatsoever. Okay, Jefferson. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Don, for that explanation. As you can gather, um, we didn't want to add uh, water or any kind of system uh, on the downside of that wall because of the neighbor down below. However, realizing that you're in the you know, visual, visual corridor on PCH there, which is really the one thing that Mr. Block was sticking on, um, that would be something that if you ask the engineer and you don't put a lot of load up there and you don't put a drip system on it, you put native brush, uh, it's easy to maintain. You may have to weed whack it every year. Um, the grasses would come back. They would absorb the top water. And during rain events, you wouldn't have that great accumulation of water because that would be a normal slope look anyway. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Jefferson. Okay, Rick? Yeah, one last comment. I'm much more comfortable with it now that I've seen that rendition. I understand that it's set back from the neighbor's property. And I, I would like to say this about the um, property builder is I appreciate what they did in moving it back so that the neighbor can still rent retain his great view. And I think that was good. I was impressed by that uh, aspect of how they adjusted the design. So I uh, just wanted to say that. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, it looks like that concludes council comments and we had a motion, yes? Skylar, is that correct? Yep, it was um, staff's approval. Yeah. That's the recommendation, I'm sorry. Do we have a second? Uh, Jefferson. Thank you. Last comment. I would like to say um, one last, just the last comment on the comments before we go to a vote is if Don or the uh, applicant can assure us that if the load stacking of just a couple of cubic yards in the nine foot section makes it look more balanced, the coastal visual corridor would not be an issue for Mr. Block. So I think you have an answer there, Don. Does that sound something that you could support? Absolutely, Councilman. Uh, uh, I would just say that uh, uh, we are being directed to uh, work with your professional planning staff. Can there be any sort of uh, uh, solution for piling additional soil at the base of the retaining wall to further soften it? Can we incorporate it, uh, more verticality in regards to the screening landscaping? Uh, that's a message received, and we will faithfully implement that. Can, is, is your geologist on? Can he can he weigh in? Yes, Jake Holt is here. If uh, if uh, you could unmute him, please. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. We can. Yes. Yeah. The the only screening you can do. Oh, we lost you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the only screening you could do is by vegetation only. We cannot add any dirt on the south side of that wall. That's against code. It's it's unstable. It would make the slope stability worse. All development, all grading needs to be on the north and upslope side of our pile supported retaining wall by design. So uh, any any masking of you know that. Uh, the height that's over six feet would need to be just by strategic vegetation. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Okay, uh, Jefferson. Excellent, Karen, thank you very much. So I would live with the strategic vegetation. Uh, that way we don't have to deal with the visual corridor issue. Um, I think that's what uh, Mr. Block was after was hiding the wall. Uh, evidently, loading up the lower side would be too much weight on the uh, the whole project. I get that. I just wanted clarification, but I think you need to have a very secure vegetation plan, uh, deep root, uh, bush 10 to 12 feet high, maybe 14 feet high at the most, uh, staggered, and then you're, uh, you bought me off. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Trevor? Sure. Uh, 
Council Member Wagner, I just want to point out that the condition of uh, screening here is currently condition number 18. And it says the property owner applicant is required to install and maintain a vertical living wall or other similar landscape along the south facing retaining wall that help visually screen the wall from Pacific Coast Highway. Are you proposing a change to that or is that sufficient to cover what you're looking for? It's sufficient. I just hope it really happens. Okay. So did you, are you seconding um, council member Peak's motion? I will second it with that knowledge. Okay. Um, I just want to jump in really quickly. Um, Mr. Moore has his hand up. Did we want to call him or no? Is there time remaining? Mayor, it's at your discretion if you want to. The, the public hearing has been closed, but if you want to hear him, you, you're welcome to. We let Don speak, so we should probably let him speak. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Great. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, a couple things is that as far as doing two walls, uh, we could. you don't have to do two six-foot walls. It's possible to do a six-foot wall and a three-foot wall with three foot distance between it, um, but that was never explored. And secondly, I think what you're really missing here, and I, I really respectfully request you look at those renderings that we provided because they are from PCH. And we had them done by a professional uh, architect. And uh, again, we didn't have, uh, as, as Adrian mentioned, we didn't have you know, a lot of great information, but I think we did the best we could. And I think if you're really looking at this wall from PCH and you can see it from both directions, how massive it really is. And I just respectfully ask before you take a vote on this, you take a look at that. Um, Cause we do still think it's very massive. Even if you try to try to, to cover with foliage and things like that, which is really not what the, the Malibu lip says. The Malibu lip says that Mr. you Martin? should. Yes. Is there a, uh, a specific page in the staff report of what you're referencing? Uh, the, uh, it, it, I mean, for the rendering of the wall? Are you talking about the rendering of the wall? Yeah. Yeah, I sent it to the, I, I sent just those two renderings to, to the, the city clerk uh, later today, but also in my written comments, it's exhibits one and two. I don't think and I have that. Look at that. If you can. Adrian, are you able to put that up? I don't know if we have that. Heather, if you got those, can you just email those to all of us real quick? Can I do that? I, I received my copy of that. I received one from Heather. Thank you. Okay. And also, as far as the leach field, I, I don't understand if you can reduce the bedroom count and reduce and or reduce the number of fixtures, why that doesn't reduce the size of the leach field and therefore the size of the wall. And that's in the staff report. Uh, yeah, I, I looked at the, I have the rendering that you sent up and I think what makes that hard and I get, I get you did your best. I, I scaled that and your wall is really scales to me to over 12 feet, potentially 10 to 12 feet and it's white. So that's why I was in favor of, I, I get it. I, nobody wants a giant wall. I'm with you there. That's why I think what, Jefferson said originally with some staggered planting in front of it, um, including whatever vines on it as well, I think would be the best way to break that wall up. That's just my opinion. But I, I think, I think you're, you know, I get what you're doing here and you're not wrong. It is a big wall. I, I just think this, the scale here looks, like I said, I scaled it. So it looked a little off to me, to be honest. Do you want to bring it back, Mayor? One one other thing that I mean, even when you look at like this rendering, if let's say the the house right now that's currently located down on PCH just try to decided to do what some of the houses down the street have done and remodel and make their home a lot bigger, you wouldn't even see the wall anyways. I mean, you kind of have to treat each project on its own because you don't know what will happen in the future. Well, I, I obviously, I, yes, I very much understand that, but I just. I mean, it's a difficult thing. This is a tough one because that wall is, is definitely different than the neighborhood, but that code is 
that code is real and that situation is real. It's a tricky neighborhood to build in. It absolutely is. That's why they have their own overlay district. And so I, I understand Mr. Moore's point. That's why going back to maybe Jefferson's comment of some staggered planning to really break it up and make it so it's really not seeable, which Don said he's amenable. Would, to me, the idea is to get rid of it. I think putting two walls in makes the, you'd have to have more planting and make it bigger. I think it'd be easier to hide this one with, you know, some staggered planting in front of it um, and the vines on it. And, you know, it'll disappear pretty quick. That's, but that's my opinion. I made a motion. We do a roll call. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Correct? Yes, the motion was for staff's recommendation. Okay, uh, roll call vote, please, Heather. Someone else? Uh, Jefferson? Yes, we can add into that the staggered plantings. As we, after, with our vote, we can add staggered plantings. It's, it's really simple stuff. It's not going to cost any more. You, you could, could make a friendly amendment. You could add that to condition number 18 to include staggered plantings in front of the wall. I would, like, that. I would like to uh, adopt that into the uh, to the resolution and then second uh, that with that understanding written in. So to confirm the motion would then be staff's recommendation with condition number 18 amended to uh, require staggered plantings in front of the wall. Does that correctly uh, reflect your motion and your second? Yes. Skyler? You're good. Okay, so that's the motion. Uh, roll call vote, please. Council Member Pink? Yes. Council Member Wagner? Yes. Council Member Mullen? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson?
not factor in a second wave of COVID-19 cases requiring further stay-at-home orders, which would cause greater impacts to revenue projections. Every department was asked to reduce their expenditure budgets to bring the whole budget into balance. The services of outside consultants have been reduced and many of the tasks they performed will now be handled by staff. Due to these impacts on revenue and resources, there are many tasks that remain unfunded. The fiscal year 2020-2021 budget has been balanced by making these reductions and using special revenue where possible. In fiscal year 2021-2022, there will be over $1.3 million in increases to expenditures, including debt service and an increase in the sheriff's contract, as well as a depletion of those special revenue funds that we've used to offset them. The council will need to consider future years when making decisions about this budget. Next slide, please. The city's budget is based on the expected revenue for the upcoming year. In fiscal year 2020-2021, the city anticipates receiving $54.3 million of revenue, including $30.2 million of general fund revenue. General fund revenues are projected to decrease by $2.1 million from the prior year. Many of the city's tax revenue sources are anticipated to decrease because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Sales tax alone is projected to drop $750,000. The economic effects of the pandemic are also anticipated to negatively impact the number of applications coming through planning, building safety, and public works. Revenue from licenses and fees and service charges is projected to decrease by now a combined total of $1.2 million. Next slide, please. Property tax accounts for 46% of the general fund revenue in fiscal year 2020-2021. In prior years, property tax made up 40 to 42% of the general fund, but projected decreases in other taxes have given it an even larger share. In prior years, licenses and permits and service charges were 12% of the revenue, and now each has dropped to 9%. Sales tax and transient occupancy taxes have both dropped from 11% of general fund revenue to 9% and 10%, 10% respectively. Next slide, please. Staff has refined the budget's revenue projections since April 29th budget workshop and based those on current year actuals and the latest plans for the reopening of businesses. The COVID-19 pandemic is affecting hotel taxes, but there are, these are not as impacted as, as was presumed in the first round of the budget. We are now projecting revenue of $2.3 million in the current year and $1.8 million for next year. This is an increase of $300,000 for the proposed budget. While interest rates have been fluctuating due to the pandemic, Staff has also increased the projections for interest revenue by $245,000 based on what has been received in the current year. Revenue from parking citations has been trending very high, so this revenue source has been increased by $50,000. These increases, however, are mostly offset by the significant reductions in licenses and permits at $102,000 and service charges at four. $415,000. These decreases come from projected losses in film permits and municipal use fees and fees from other community services programs that are anticipated to be slow to reopen um, due to the county orders. Earlier this year, the council discussed bringing forward an item for the November 2020 election that would increase the city's transient occupancy tax rate from 12% to 15%. The proposed budget does not include a rise in revenue due to a possible tax increase. If the council wants to pursue this, a formal decision must be made at a city council meeting before August 7th, 
of this year. Next slide, please. The proposed expenditure budget is based on the council's priorities and work plan. The work plan for 2020-2021 is attached at the end of the budget and details the city's priorities and which departments will work collaboratively to achieve them. The city council set its top three priorities for fiscal year 2019-2020 as public safety, Woolsey fire recovery, and school district separation and these have been maintained for the current iteration of the budget. Next slide. Total expenditures are projected at $63.1 million. The general fund expenditure budget is $33.3 million and includes not only city operating expenses of $30.2 million, but also some one-time capital projects that are being funded with general fund designated reserves. Other major expenses include $22 million of special revenue expenses. Legacy Park project fund expenses are budgeted at $1.9 million. The Civic Center water treatment facilities operating budget is also projected to be $1.9 million. All expenses for the operating the facility will be reimbursed through assessments to the connected properties in phase one. Based on the current wastewater rates, there will be a loan of approximately $615,000 from the general fund that will be repaid starting in fiscal year 2021-2022. A new fund for the Southern California Edison Woolsey Fire Settlement has been included and will be used to fund the ongoing recovery from the Woolsey Fire. The city received $13.5 million in December 2019 from this settlement. Expenditures of $3.3 million are anticipated for fiscal year 2020-2021. Next slide, please. Budget expenditures have not changed since the April 29th presentation of the budget. The overall budget represents significant reductions in expenses from prior fiscal years to meet the expected $2.1 million loss in general fund revenue. Certain costs cannot be reduced, such as property and liability insurance, debt service, law enforcement, and other mandated activities. To trim expenditures, all department heads look carefully at their annual budgets and reduce travel, training, operating supplies, printing, professional services, and any other non-essential expenses. A cost of living increase for city staff was also removed to reduce expenses. Next slide. Budgets for the ongoing operational costs and the capital improvement projects related to the Woolsey fire and now the COVID-19 pandemic have been separated into their own budget pages to allow for better tracking. Both the operational expenses and the capital costs are anticipated to last for several years. Woolsey Fire operational costs are projected to be $3.1 million and capital costs are projected at $2.7 million for fiscal year 2020-2021. The operational costs will come from the Southern California Woolsey Fire Settlement Fund. The capital improvement projects will be funded by FEMA, Cal OES, and Cal JPIA. The budget also includes $284,000 for ongoing costs for cleaning supplies, personal protective equipment, and improvements to city facilities to address the current safety requirements related to the COVID-19 pandemic. This number is just an estimate and could be much higher depending on new information from Los Angeles County and other agencies. Next slide, please. The city has prioritized the Woolsey fire recovery. City staff and consultants have been dedicated to helping homeowners through the rebuilding process. To date, 240 applications have been approved by planning, 106 building permits have been issued, and four homes have been completed with more slated to finish soon. To shift expenses from the general fund, consultant costs have been reduced by $1.1 million and $961,000 of staff time 
the equivalent of seven full-time employees from planning, building safety, and public works have been transferred to this effort. The funds received in the Southern California Edison Woolsey Fire Settlement can be used to cover these costs on a one-time basis. This shift of using staff for the rebuilding efforts has an impact on the city's robust work plan because existing staff resources cannot assist with rebuilding and other tasks simultaneously. During the budget process for fiscal year 2019-2020, the council authorized waiving fees for Woolsey Fire like for like and like for like plus 10% for primary residences from November 9th, 2018 through June 30th, 2020. At the mid-year budget in January, council extended the fee waivers through December 30th, 2020. Uncollected fees are projected to total $4.2 million through that time. The proposed budget assumes that the fee waiver program will end on December 30th, 2020. Next slide, please. Public safety remains one of the city's highest priorities. Law enforcement is a major part of that public safety mission. Other notable expenditures include homeless outreach services and animal control. Next slide. The city will spend over $8.5 million on its contract with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department next year, which includes $713,000 for the beach team. This represents an increase of 6.07% for the county's required administrative increase and the liability trust fund. This contract expense is 28% of the city's annual operating budget and is the city's largest single expense. It should be noted that the new sheriff station at the Santa Monica College Satellite Campus set to open in fiscal year 2021-2022 could add up to $3 million to the city's annual sheriff contract. City staff was in the process of coordinating several town hall meetings to discuss the station prior to the outbreak of COVID-19. However, it is now unclear when those meetings will be held um, as we await um, having meetings in person again. We recognize how vital it is to hear from the community on this important subject and don't want to give it short shrift. Next slide, please. In fiscal year 2020-2021, the city must make debt service payments on Legacy Park, City Hall, and Trancas Field. The first interest payment of $550,000 on the certificates of participation for the 2018 land acquisition must be made in the coming fiscal year. Debt service will total $3.7 million. In fiscal year 2021-2022, the debt service for the land acquisition will increase to almost $1.2 million for two interest payments and the first principal payment. Next slide. The proposed budget includes $16.3 million for capital projects. Ongoing multi-year projects include the street overlay project, improvements to PCH and improvements to Civic Center Way. The design for phase two of the Civic Center water treatment facility will continue. The construction of the new temporary skate park will be completed and the design for the permanent skate park will be underway. It is important to note that no general fund undesignated reserves will be used for capital improvements in fiscal year 2020-2021. The city will use special revenue funds, grants, and designated reserves to complete these projects. I should also say that the city, um, the designated reserves are being depleted. The reserve for deferred maintenance on city facilities was over $1 million two years ago and will be $500,000 at the end of fiscal year 2020-2021. The city has not contributed to this reserve in several years due to budget constraints. Next slide, please. The proposed budget includes funding for 82 full-time employees and the equivalent of nine employees working as part-time staff. This is a reduction of six full-time equivalent positions from the current year, saving over $300,000. The reduction has been achieved by leaving vacant positions unfunded and projecting fewer part-time staff hours. No layoffs of staff have been necessary at this time. 
Additionally, the student interim program has been suspended for the 2020-2021 fiscal year. All salary ranges, positions, and benefits are approved by Council as part of the final budget, which will be presented on June 22nd. The City typically provides an annual cost of living adjustment to employees. The adjustment is derived from the Consumer Price Index for the County of Los Angeles using an annual percentage from February. The cost of living adjustment of 3.4% has not been included in the proposed budget for staff salaries. This reduced expenses by $265,000. The ongoing costs of public employee pensions and retiree health benefits continue to be a difficult topic for many municipalities. CalPERS contribution rates, which are now at 18.75% for classic employees and 7.87% for new employees, have been increasing slightly over the past few years. Staff is monitoring the economic forecasts closely for their potential impacts on the CalPERS contribution rates. If CalPERS adjusts its discount rates and investment portfolio, the city will be responsible for higher annual contributions due to a larger unfunded liability. At its last presentation, CalPERS indicated that returns for the year were at 1%, far below the targeted 7%. The city would begin to pay higher amounts for its unfunded liability starting in fiscal year 2022-23. This amount would ramp up over the following five years. Next slide, please. The Public Employees Retirement Pension Reform Act, or PEPRA, was implemented to reduce retiree costs. Any public employee hired after 2013 falls under the PEPRA rules. For the first time, the city's proposed budget projects a greater number of new employees over classic employees, which helps curtail pension-related expenses. The city has worked hard to be aware of CalPERS pension trends and plan accordingly. This is made slightly easier because the city does not have any public safety employees or unions, which limits its liabilities. Additionally, the city has always had a conservative PERS contribution plan, which helps again limit those costs. In addition to pension costs, the city will pay $217,000 next year to cover health insurance for its existing retirees. By requiring five years of employment before health benefits are vested, the city has been able to limit future liability. In the next year, the city will contribute $524,000 to these other post-employment benefits, which is a mandated cost. Next slide, please. Each year, the council awards funds to local nonprofit groups through the general fund grant program. This year's budget includes $150,000 for grants. The application deadline was extended from March 31st to April 10th to give applicants more time under the COVID-19 stay-at-home orders. 25 applications have been received, totaling $573,000. A summary of the applications has been attached to the budget staff reports. The grants will be discussed by the Administration and Finance Subcommittee at a date still to be determined, and the subcommittee's recommendations will then be brought to the council. Next slide, please. Due to the anticipated reduction in revenues and demands on resources from the COVID-19 pandemic and the continued aftermath of the Woolsey fire, the proposed budget does not provide funding for all the tasks that the council has discussed over the past several years. To reduce professional services expenditures, the equivalent of seven full-time staff have been reassigned to work on Woolsey fire rebuilding. This will reduce the availability of city staff to complete other tasks that are not mandated or compliance activities. Some of the major unfunded items include on-call services for the California Highway Patrol, enhanced services, staffing, and capital outlay to address issues related to homelessness, an environmental commission, community outreach to program the city's vacant lands, the Malibu Lagoon State Beach Management Plan, business licenses, implementation of the IT strategic plan, departmental audits, and the Malibu Canyon traffic study, 
It also delays for one year the implementation of the dark sky ordinance for commercial properties and the enforcement of the dumpster lid ordinance. Next slide. The one-time use of the SCE settlement fund to fund the Woolsey Fire rebuilding process allows for a balanced general fund budget in the, in the upcoming fiscal year. This will not be a solution in future budget years. Additionally, there are significant expenditures coming in those future years, including the full debt service on the 2018 land acquisition, increased sheriff contract costs, and increased CalPERS costs. Staff asked the council to consider making some further reductions in preparation of these future expenses and to provide direction to staff. These reductions could include the development and implementation of a retirement incentive program, the elimination of positions and the, and the consolidation of those job functions, the elimination of tree maintenance in the upcoming year, the reduction of various community services programs and activities, and the reduction of non-compliance related sustainability programs. Council could also eliminate or, redu or reduce other line item expenditures, including community grants, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's contract, homeless outreach services, the joint use agreement with the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District, city code enforcement, and street maintenance services. Next slide, please. At the start of the current fiscal year, the city had a general fund undesignated reserve of 70% of the annual general fund operating budget. This reserve remains strong even after the use of $13 million of reserves to complete the land acquisition and after the impacts of the Woolsey fire. Strong revenues in the first three quarters of fiscal year 2019-2020 contributed to maintaining this reserve going into the COVID-19 pandemic. Even with decreases in revenue projected under the current economic conditions, the proposed budget now provides for a general fund undesign undesignated reserve of 75% of the annual general fund operating budget. However, Without the one-time use of the SCE Woolsey Fire Settlement Fund, the reserve would be at 65%. Council policy requires that the city maintain at least a 50% reserve. To maintain the highest credit rating, the city must maintain at least 65% in reserves. Having this reserve has helped the city overcome the Woolsey Fire and now positions it to weather the COVID-19 pandemic. Maintaining a strong reserve is also critical preparation for future disasters, such as another fire or an earthquake. When looking ahead to fiscal year 2021-2022, without the ability to use the SCE settlement fund and other special revenues and unavoidable increases in costs, including debt service, sheriff contract and CalPERS costs, the general fund operating budget would be approximately $36 million. If the conditions related to the COVID-19 pandemic remain in place, staff would assume revenues would stay flat. There would be a $6 million delta that would have to come from reserves. This would push the general fund undesignated reserve to 44% of the operating budget under the 50% city council requirement. And this is why staff is looking to make further reductions to set us up for stronger future budget years. Next slide. The proposed budget anticipates a starting general fund undesignated reserve of 22.83 million and an ending reserve of 22.83 million. The undesignated reserve will remain flat for the first time in a while and no contributions were made to any of the designated reserves. All the facility and infrastructure repair projects from the Woolsey Fire must be completed by the city and submitted for reimbursement to FEMA. Historically, these reimbursements have taken years to be received. In the proposed budget, we are showing these FEMA costs as a liability against the general fund in the amount of $7 million. Since the last presentation of the budget, the city did receive a $1.7 million payment from CalJPIA for Woolsey Fire-related costs, 
which is why this liability has been reduced from that previous version. The SCE Woolsey Fire Settlement Fund is being used for the cost of Woolsey Fire rebuilding and the city's 6.25% share of the FEMA projects. Based on current year expenditures, this fund will start the 2020-2021 fiscal year with $10.4 million and end with $7.1 million. Next slide. The final budget will be back for council review on June 22nd. And this completes my formal presentation. And I am here for questions as are the department heads um, should you have them for us. Okay, thank you. Um, we have public speakers, yes, Heather? We do. Um, I'm gonna call them in order and then we'll go back to the top. First, we'll hear from Mark Pastrella, then Craig Hill, Andy Lyon, Keon Shulman, Joe Drummond, Doug Stewart, Scott Dietrich, John Mazza, Georgia Goldfarb, and Ryan Embry. So first we'll hear from Mark Pastrella. Can the sound? We can hear you. Okay, very good. Um, good evening, I'm Mark Pastrella. I'm the Director of Los Angeles County Public Works and here to uh, give a little testimony tonight about uh, efforts in the Waterworks District 29 system to uh, create a more resilient community in, in the Malibu and the Topanga area by hardening our, our water system uh, throughout the Malibu. Um, before I start, I just want to say hello to all the council members, and I'm hoping that all of you and your families are doing okay during this really unprecedented times um, due to COVID-19. I see Rick giving a thumbs up. I'm glad to see that, Rick. And um, Thinking about you all as we've been, LA County, been serving um, all 10 million residents of Los Angeles, including um, during the uh, protest that we had just last week. So I know you all have been uh, hunkering down there like us and um, doing a great job and keeping the numbers down on COVID-19. So good on you. And again, I hope your families are doing well. Um, so again, I'm here tonight to talk to you a little bit about what's going on, maybe give you a little update in Waterworks 29. Um, I have been looking since and been informed, of course, like you by the Woolsey Fire about the um, susceptibility of our infrastructure in the Malibu and the unincorporated areas of the Santa Monica Mountains. And um, of course, considering um, some of the new normals that are going on, I've also been working very closely with our partners now in SCE. I noticed you have a chunk of change in your budget from SCE as we do as well from the settlement. But also, I have to report to you that um, SCE has been out hard working at um, improving their system, um, probably most likely due to the liability they're going to be facing if they keep going the way, operating the way they're operating. Um, but in working with them and looking at the, um, some of the unplanned um, or planned, excuse me, outages this summer or during the COVID-19, uh, it got me thinking about um, the resilience of the waterwork system with respect to power and having power outages that could last more than say a day or two. And if I, if the council members remember um, the system that serves Malibu 29 is a system in which we um, feed by um, pressure feeding up to the elevation of the tanks. And then we have about a two days worth of supply in the tanks that serve all of the Malibu in each different Canyon system. And um, when we talk about power, of course, um, uh, the systems that use power for a system like ours is uh, pump stations. Um, LA County Waterworks Districts has some, something in the order of 30 pump stations um, throughout the Malibu and the Topanga area that have 70 different pumps within them, each of them requiring a certain amount of power to operate properly. And so we have been looking and working with neighborhoods um, in the Malibu on the, uh, the system and prioritizing um, how we will respond to an emergency that would last like I said, more than a two day period um, with an electric outage. And knowing again, so identifying that the pump systems are the vulnerable key or chain, weak, weak link in that chain, should we lose power. In fact, during the Woolsey fire, we, um, you all know that our neighboring water district, uh, uh, Las Virginis had lost power to one of its generators up in an area and had a difficult time getting that generator back in place. And, we too had lost telecommunication um, and not uh, weren't aware of what was happening in our um, the north end of the of the Malibu for some time, and this was due um, primarily to power outages. 
And so again, power being the issue, not necessarily in terms of firefighting, but in terms of like keeping people safe in their homes so that they can, as you say, um, shelter in place for more than a two day period. And there, if you can imagine, there are a number of events uh, besides fire that this could happen. You could have a major earthquake that would split the line at Malibu. You could have wind storms that could cause the power to go out. Um, and of course you could have um, planned uh, emergencies like the, like the SCE planned outages that happened, uh, so to call uh, PSPSs that um, they haven't started yet. But as a reminder, we have a big windstorm going on this week in hot weather. So taking a look at that um, and recognizing that the water delivery system and um, throughout any water, domestic water system um, in the world typically is not built for firefighting purposes, uh, like a wildfire fighting purposes. It is definitely built for a single structure fire that occurs in a neighborhood um, fighting, the largest, fighting the largest home um, for maybe an hour or two hours. Uh, but in no way would we want to, uh, do I want what I'm about to tell you, um, give anybody the false hope that somehow I can build you a system um, that would um, be intended to fight wildfires and stop a wildfire, uh, the likes of the Woolsey fire. That doesn't mean that we don't want to improve the system for resiliency. And like I said, to provide water beyond the two day period. And so looking at the pump system that I mentioned earlier, we, we have uh, started a study and actually been working with homeowners in, um, several canyons, but particularly Big Rock um, area. And these homeowners have been um, really working with us well and um, working us through what it means to live in a canyon like Big Rock or in a community like that. And um, the experiences that they had where they want to stay in home or they feel that they can do some work at least um, during a wildfire scenario to wet down the house or to somehow um, create a more, a more fire resistant system. But again, to just a minimum stay in home and have safe, clean water to drink. Um, they are relying on three pumps in that area um, to keep them going. And recently it offered to, um, we're so interested in having those pumps becoming permanent pump stations um, that had offered um, to actually pay for the design and construction of uh, pump systems up there. And I recently uh, looked at a letter that a manager had sent out saying that we would um, accept their, their design and construction. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight that I'd rather have the district um, fully fund such a system. And I'd like to actually do a study throughout the Malibu that prioritizes locations where um, such, such permanent facilities make sense over mobile. And um, to update you, we have already invested in, we have five mobile um, generators that we currently uh, own and operate and we can move around the Malibu. We have already procured five more of those and intend to utilize and have them in place during this fire uh, season. But on top of that, what I intend to do is actually um, begin a study starting today on and analyzing um, what that what makes most sense with respect to improving the resiliency um, specific to improving our pump station uh, capacity. So what we'll be doing is identifying all site constraints at each pump station um, throughout the Malibu. We'll be benchmarking solutions with other similar situated water systems like the like Los Virginuses. And I can tell you Los Virginus is talking about doing sort of a hybrid um, approach and we think we'll end up with something like that too, where they have about 50% of their system in permanent um, pump stations um, and generators, excuse me, and then another 50% uh, mobile. Um, we'll also be looking at the situation in the Australia as a benchmark. And then of course, um, taking lessons learned from recent um, recent events like the Woolsey on the, related to how our operations in the field work and whether or not we can actually manage mobile or would make more sense to have permanent um, generators in a location where we would not have to man that um, generator to keep the system going. Well, as a part of this, we'll be performing a benefit cost analysis at each station and preparing a comprehensive final report containing the results of the expended analysis. Um, I will be presenting the report to all interested communities throughout the Malibu and the Topanga. And I have uh, directed my staff to complete this report by August 14th, 2020. Now, um, each of the pump stations in the district will identify the financing to be used to design, construct, and implement whatever improvements are selected, including stationary generators, um, should that be determined to be the preferred approach at that particular location. 
Um, I had heard, and I know that there are maybe people, uh, residents there ready to testify in front of you tonight. And I had been made aware that um, you may be considering um, uh, a budget item where you may uh, be willing to partner uh, with the community on such approvals. But I would suggest that you wait um, to make any such budget decisions until the analysis that I just described to you is complete before moving forward on, on those decisions. Because I'd like to have the city and the residents in this area first rely upon their district's funding for such improvements, support us in efforts to gain grants uh, from the state as well as the federal government, and as sort of a last resort, look to the city or to residents to fund um, such improvements. Um, I look forward to working with you on this and look forward to any questions you might have about my testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, next, we'll hear from Craig Hill. Hello, good evening. Craig Hill, former planning commissioner. Uh, Mark Estrella, with all due respect, your evaluation of the situation is woefully inadequate. It'll be on me to be the first to say that we know that oh, shush, we have uh, four hours of water in those tanks when there's a fire, not two days. That's what we need to be planning for. People will be up here. We are ready to go with a little bit of help from the city or from somewhere we can afford to put in the generators. We can't rely on having the 10 generators you just mentioned floating around Malibu. We need three right here at all times. If you want to do a study where you could put in permanent platforms and permanent generators and, and you know go through all the permits and maybe take three to five years for that, great. Maybe we could do that. But we need those generators for this season when we can do it. So to talk about two days, no. This, your perspective is just at a completely different scale than what we need. Now, what we were pitching was not about our pathetic need for water over here on the end of town. It's largely about that we can save the city a ton of money on this. The biggest cost savings of your next five year budget. If you look at the permit fees for rebuilds that you wouldn't have to pay if we had 150 or more houses here burned down, the lowered reassessments of property tax that you wouldn't be getting if those houses are reassessed down, the retail tax deficiency of people who moved out of town, we're looking at $5 million of savings in Big Rock as a ballpark figure and maybe 20 to $30 million in all of Eastern Malibu if, 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 the, if there were similar proportion of houses burned down. So that's huge. Now, with the undesignated reserve, you want it at 65% of the operating budget. You have to have it at 50. Well, you're at 75 now. That's $3.3 million above, of which the 75K is 2.2%. It's a drop in the bucket. So, um, you know, there you could be even be funding other things with that, that additional. You could be funding Skylar's solar panel project that would actually, I don't know what the return is. It's seven years, I think. But after that, it's a net money saver. So look ahead. Also, we've got dark skies. That's cheap. Dumpster lids. That's cheap. Environmental commission. I don't think it's as much as your 150,000 your budget said. And what about 12,000 for the planning commission? Meanwhile, the city spends a lot on third party con consultants. But one outside consultant would be worth hiring would be to look at overall institutional efficiency like big companies do. We're nearing our 30th anniversary. So let's have a performance re review for the city, not necessarily the manager, but for the city as a whole and see you know, where we could tighten our belt and let's get them to hold a mirror up for us to have a look at ourselves. But seriously, the big rock pumps, we're on it. We need to go now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Andy Lyon. Uh, Andy doesn't actually look like he's in the meeting. So we'll check for him at the end. Um, Keon Shulman? Yes. We can yes. Hear you. yes, good evening, Mayor Fair, City Council members and staff. As the staff re report states, the City Council established there are three top priorities for the city were public safety, rebuilding after the fire, and the school district separation. 
Enforcing a dumpster ordinance is a public safety issue. Malibu was a leader in the Santa Monica Mountains in recognizing the problem with rat poison, poisoning our wildlife, pets, and children in a resolution not to use the poison in July 2013. Malibu's leadership spread to 10 other surrounding cities and beyond who also adopted similar resolutions against rat poison. It is critical we follow through with the dumpster ordinance, which directly impacts public safety. We understand the expense of monitoring all the dumpster uses, but primarily importance is the funding enforcement for violations, whether detected by city staff or by citizens. Fees obtained this way will help the city finance and pay its own way. We have to have an we also need to have an update as to the progress that waste management and universal waste systems have made in upgrading their dumpsters. They already had over two years to comply to upgrading the dumpsters that are feeding and multiplying the rodent population throughout Malibu and other cities around the Santa Monica Mountains. Thursday, June 30th is the designated deadline. The city's last the city last year adopted the long-awaited earth-friendly management policy, reflective of the, city managed, the city's mission statement. These guidelines are the stepping stones for a green policy. It is important to establish an environmental commission to help implement these guidelines. These guidelines. The recent slip-up by city staff, which delayed the LCP amendment, was unfortunate. An environmental commission could have tracked it through the Coastal Commission process and been on top of it. Please move forward this commission as soon as possible when public funds are available so we can have more oversight. We have a fine new director, Yolan Bundy. The commission would give her support achieving Malibu goals. What could be more important for public safety than developing an environmental commission? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Joe Drummond. Hi there. I just wanted to um, thank Mark Pastrella for his comments from LA County on actually wanting to subsidize the generators. And if he can get his study done by August, then that's great. But if not, then we can't wait very long, that's all. Um, I understand you all be voting on a proposed budget tonight, and I'm here again to ask for a reduction in the view preservation permit fees. I don't know if this is the time to do it or not, but according to Jessica Clevender back in September of last year, the uniform application fee for a view preservation permit from the Planning Commission is $2,529, even though it's listed on the city website as $2,265, which needs to be corrected. On the uniform application, it states it's $2,529. Either way, this is an exorbitant sum for any resident who has already paid $337 for a primary view determination to protect their ocean views. Not one person in Malibu has yet to apply for this permit, likely due to the prohibitive fee. To obtain a view preservation permit from the planning director when two parties agree to trimming and make an agreement is another $337. However, if the foliage owner is unwilling to cooperate, the fee rises to $2,529 because it must go to the Planning Commission for some reason. The paperwork is completed by the applicant and it's really just before and after photos, so not sure why such a prohibitive fee is necessary. It should be a maximum double what the regular fee is of $337, nothing more than this. If you could please lower this fee during your deliberations tonight, that would be great for residents of Malibu trying to recover their valuable ocean views after the city ordinance. Thanks very much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Doug Stewart. Good evening, uh, city council members. Uh, the budget tonight represents probably the most significant financial challenge the city has faced since at least the 2008 Great Recession. We are now highly constrained for cash, available resources are limited, and focus is being constrained for the first time in many years. I'm not sure everyone in the city realizes how difficult a position we are now finding ourselves in for this year, and as the city staff has indicated, future years may be even worse. I think the city staff's done a particularly good job, in my opinion, of providing a balanced budget 
for you to start your discussions. They've been clear in highlighting the fragility of their assumptions and have placed warnings throughout the report about the financial dangers ahead. We should keep those in mind. To show how tough the times are, there are three pages of now unfunded items in the existing work plan and barely one page of other possible cost savings. You clearly don't have much room to maneuver, and next fiscal year could be even worse, especially if revenues don't rebound. Unfortunately, the cause of much of this financial mess is COVID. It has also limited the discussion with, for sure, the residents, as well as, no doubt, the council. By my estimate, the council has had probably less than four hours of public session time on this upcoming budget, and tonight is probably the most detailed list of all the financial impacts. The, council, the council's administration and finance committee has not even met on this proposed budget. What is missing, in my opinion, is a meaningful conversation and input with at least the residents as to what the city is now facing and a full opportunity to present their case of what they feel is critical and ideally how to pay for it. Leaving the residents out of this process and then not understanding how difficult the uh, situation is for the city is a recipe for a loss of confidence in the council's final decisions. Ideally, this could also be a basis to construct what ifs of, for the uses of additional revenue should it materialize, or worse, what would have to be affected by a f further economic downturn, such as a COVID second wave. Basically, given the harsh realities of the city finances, you need to get the residents to buy into the budget you eventually adopt. Perhaps the A and F committee would be the best platform for such a forum, but I'll leave that to your best judgment of how to structure this should you decide to pursue this recommendation to do outreach to the city. Thank you for your time and good luck on this budget. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Scott Dietrich. Lisa did a great job. Hello again. Um, it looks to me like everybody's trying to deal with this as best we can, but we just absolutely cannot afford another fire if we can prevent it. And we have something before us that the guys in Big Rock have presented that gives us hope. I love what Mark's trying to do, but I can't imagine that even if he finishes the study by August, that it would be funded um, and implemented before fire season. And of course, we all know it's Santa Ana right now and the wind's howling. So, but, you know, you, you, he's not going to be able to get anything done for October. The water's going to run out in Big Rock. It did last time i mean they just don't have enough water they need auxiliary pumps and i think that it's incumbent upon the council to come up with that seventy five thousand dollars <throat> by next year maybe mark will have uh, you know 29 and public works and grants up and running that would be wonderful but for right now um, you know, you've got a substantial amount of money in grants. Set aside $75,000 of that to fund something that could save our behinds if, in fact, there's a fire in eastern Malibu. We just can't afford to have another fire at all. And speak. And this, this is just a wise investment. It cost us so little compared to the potential return, or I should say cost of a fire. And the other thing Lisa mentioned that, you know, I just questioned, she said CalPERS is talking about a 1% return this year. If that's all they're getting, they ought to be fired. I mean, with the market, you know, you could buy Tesla for under 350 and it's over 950. What in the heck are they doing, and why are we not screaming at them? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from John Mazza.
John Laza. There we go. You there, John? John? Okay, we'll swing back around to you. Next, we'll hear from Georgia Goldfarb. Yes, hello, can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Um, hello, Mara, and again, and council members. I'd like to express some concerns about the city budget. I am not a budget expert, but it seems clear that our budget is far larger than those of the vast majority of small cities. I am sure that all Malibu residents want to be confident that they are getting the services they want and need at a reasonable cost. But some elements stand out in particular. Um, the compensation of the city manager by salary and benefits, as noted by the State Controller's Office for 2018, is significantly greater than for other cities of this size, and indeed for many cities of significantly larger size. Following data is from the State Controller's Office 2018. Uh, so comparing Malibu's salary and health benefit rate, uh, benefits with two other groups of state for the city manager. So ours is uh, salary, 300,000, health and retirement, 70,000. That was 2018 and the 300,000 is, as I understand it, current. Um, so in comparison with 72 cities of population eight to 15,000, the average salary is 178,400 compared to ours with the 300,000. Health and retirement, 36,400 compared with 70,000. Looking at a uh, population of 12,000, there are 17 cities. The average salary is 166,400 compared again with hours of 300. And health benefits uh, and retirement, 32,800 compared with 70,000. Um, yes, and it seemed like, uh, seemed like the city was spending nine, well, I'm just going to skip that, uh, jump onto something else. So my suggestion, not being in any way an expert at all on this subject, is to get an independent firm which specializes in assessing the accounting and efficiency of organizations. Depending on the firm, this would be an excellent expenditure of city money. I have been told that other cities are making salary reductions not increases, of from 5 to 10%. Some uh, staff in colleges are dropping 20%. This is the time for complete transparency and for an in-depth evaluation by companies which specialize in this, and that would be our use of our uh, budget. We are all paying for this. It is the council's responsibility to ensure that we are paying a fair cost for needed services. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Ryan Embry. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, well, um, I have a whole lot to suggest and I'll try and speak fast. I hope the staff can take notes. Uh, the elephant in the room is that the payroll is not sustainable. There's been a lot of dancing around this issue, but you really have to adjust the staffing levels to fit the budget. It's the first place that any organization looks to reduce expenses. There was um, a misconception that licenses and permits um, revenue was down, and that was you know, just too bad. Well, licenses and permits are generally cost recovery. So that means there's less activity, which means there should be a, a commensurate reduction in the staffing levels for those tasks. This is a very difficult subject to broach, especially for elected folks, but it's your job to deal with this. The city staff that we have are very well paid. The benefits are top-notch 
and there would be no reduction in benefits based on any across the board reductions to the salaries of the staff. And the salary reductions being proposed by um, other speakers and adopted by many other jurisdictions and cities takes into the account that the reduction in cost and time savings to the employees for the option to work from home. You don't have to have all your dry cleaning done. You're not paying for gasoline. You're not paying for wear and tear on a vehicle and a half an hour commute each way. And if you calculate professional staff time based on their salaries, that's a huge amount of cost savings and it gives free time to the staff to use in other ways their opportunity cost. So you really have to address this and I'll be watching to see you bring it up. There, you need to also work throughout the year to find an, every opportunity for additional cost savings, not just put this to bed um, when you do eventually adopt the budget, but this needs to be an ongoing process. And you do have to hire some efficiency expert. I agree with uh, Craig Hill and Georgia Goldfarb. Um, I called it something else in my notes, but there are specialty firms that do the top to bottom and they uncover some of the no brainer things or some of the very difficult to discover things. So um, hiring freeze, obviously. Um, Retaining salaries at 90% level and 100% of benefits, that's a very doable option. The, the next is um, you need to revisit the cost sharing agreements that you have. First of all, the, uh, the beach team uh, is a benefit to Los Angeles County. They should be paying for half of it or more. Your time is up. Okay. And I don't see Andy in the meeting, but we should go back to John Mazza. If we can get him unmuted. Are you there, John? John? Well, he's unmuted, but it looks like we can't hear him right now. So that concludes public comment for now. Okay, thank you. No more public speakers? No. Okay, thank you. All right, then the public hearing uh, is closed. So we will go to council comments. Um, would anybody like to go first? I see Rick and Skyler. I'm sorry, I don't know who had their hand up first. Skyler did, go for it. Um. I was gonna ask if you could pull up that slide from Lisa. There was one slide that she said, these were some areas where we could cut cost. It was a list of about six or seven different things. Uh, I don't know who could do that for us, but that would be awesome. And um, I mean, yeah, it's look, the unfortunate part of all of this is that, you know, it's real and uh, we're dealing with a unprecedented pandemic in our modern times and it's having a big issue um, in regards to our budget. I see that that's up now. So um, if there's consensus from council and I'm, obviously everyone else wants to speak, but I think we should try to figure out if there's a retirement incentive program um, and eliminate consolidate. I think the, the top two things I don't, know about the tree maintenance um, and how everybody feels about the other items. But uh, I think there's, you know, we could definitely work a combination of some of these and try to shave some costs. I agree with you. I think we should look at all of them. And I, I just wanted to, I, I wanted to really actually thank Mark Prostrella for uh, taking the time to really pay attention to what's going on in Malibu with our water district and recognize the, the need um, the public safety need 
um, for our entire community. Um, I would love to see a little bit of emphasis, you know, or, you know, some green lighting kind of given to the folks in Big Rock that have worked so hard and have, you know, really, you know, started um, a, a great job of community outreach and whatnot to, you know, move the needle on this. And I actually thank them for putting all the time that they have in. And I hope that the county really looks at this seriously and considers, you know, a substantial amount of funding for the gener permanent generators uh, in a lot of our city to make the uh, water system more resilient, especially in a time when the power's out. So uh, that's what I have for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Skylar. Uh, Rick, do you want to pick up where Skylar left off? Yes, no. Rick, can you hear me? Jefferson is also available, but he's um, just calling in. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just looking at Rick because he had his hand up at the same time as Skylar when we kicked this off. Okay. Uh, hey, it looks like we might have lost Rick. Um, so if you want to keep, keep going, and I'll try and figure that out. Okay, uh, Jefferson or Mikey, would you like to say something? Thank you, Karen. If you can hear me, um, visual, visual is off because of the power outage. Um, my comments, I'll hold off till after Mikey, if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Mikey? Okay, um, first of all, I wanna thank all the speakers. Um, a lot of good points by a lot of people. I want to thank you, Doug, in particular. Um, you um, clearly understand financials. I think there's there's definitely some people that do not really understand where we're heading right now and how serious it is. And this budget alone, in my opinion, is gonna it's gonna be frustrating. It's already gonna be frustrating. And I hope it doesn't get worse, but as you know, a city councilor, we got to, I, I mean, for me, I have no idea if there's gonna be another disaster coming. So why wouldn't there be? Why wouldn't there be a fire? As I'm talking about, why wouldn't there be an earthquake? It'd be a zombie apocalypse for all I know. Um, but this is, this is no fun. This is no fun. I've spent a long time reading this budget. I uh, bent Reva's ear for, hours going over my questions on every single page of the budget um, to make sure I understood it. I know budgets very well, but this one's different than I'm used to dealing with, as I've said before. Um, there's a lot of uh, special funds and, you know, separating it all out and make heaven all make sense. Is, it's, a, it's a bit of work. And the bottom line is everyone's saying we have whatever, 75%. It's, it's false. It's only because of the Woolsey um, payment that we got, the settlement, or else, you know, we're heading down towards 65. And for next year, we're not covering it. So we do have some really serious issues. And um, hopefully things will improve. But, you know, since Karen got elected, they haven't. I'm just kidding, Karen. Um, now, since I got elected, they haven't. So um, this is going to take me a minute. So let me go through this. We have a lot of unfunded items here. I wanna make sure people understand what some of them are. Um, we are trying to budget for CHP during PSPS events. Definitely an issue. We know last time those PSPS events, it was not easy. Um, our sheriffs are great, but um, they are focused more on crime. For before the Woolsey fire, the number one issue we constantly had in the city was PCH. That was everyone's main concern for what I could see. So I want to make a proposal that has nothing to do with saving money, but I want to use it now because now's the time we're talking about budget. I want to propose to consider taking two of our positions and turning them into CHP positions so that we can focus on the highway at times that we need it. We can talk about it later, but I'd like, I'm hoping to get uh, that on the agenda to talk about 
I have nothing against our sheriff department. It has nothing to do with what's going on in the world right now. Um, it's just I'm looking at how we're going to deal with some public safety issues. And I think we'd all love to see some focus on PCH when we need it between car clubs and speeding and on and on and on. I don't know about everyone else in the city council, but I can spend a chunk of my weekend dealing with people, dealing with issues on PCH. And um, so that's that's something I'd love to see agendized if I can get consent on that. Um, other un unfunded things, homelessness, huge issue in the city that's gonna get worse. Um, it was just fairly recently until COVID hit that my phone was just blowing up nonstop about the homeless issue. It's not gonna get better. It's gonna get worse in my opinion. And we, we don't have the additional funding, but at this point, I'm gonna hope we can get grants. I saw some uh, news from the state, the League of Cities that led me to hope that we can, um, we can get grants to help out here. Because I th think soon, it's really, really gonna be a lot of people. Um, well, it is difficult for me already. I think it's a terrible situation. We have to find that balance. We have to find the balance between not only compassion, but protecting the citizens of the city of Malibu and being able to use some of our codes that right now we can't under Martin versus Boise. It's just not, it's just not right. The environmental commission, it is not free. It is not cheap to run a commission. It just isn't. I've looked into it in detail. Right now, I don't have an answer for this. This hurts. How about all the vacant land the council before Karen and I bought? Like a dream right now, I don't know how we even start a city um, discussion on what to do with it, which is going to have robust discussion. And we're not all going to agree. We all have our ideas. Um, I hope we can find a way to start community outreach that doesn't cost $200,000, $250,000. So I know how hard that is. I know some of the community outreach in the past just wasn't enough. It wasn't sufficient. So we have to do it right. Good news is, though, at least we'll have a skate park. Um, the Malibu Lagoon, State Beach, Coastal Geomorphology morphology and Hydrology Study, super important, 275 grand. I haven't got a clue. Maybe we can find a grant for that. Business licenses, um, Skylar knows, I know how much we need those. They're really important to help in our small businesses and for a bunch of other reasons around that. Um, Dumpster lid ordinance, dark sky ordinance. I'll get back to those in, in a minute. Department audits. I think a couple other people said it. Super important to audit. Every business needs to audit as it as it moves along, or else you're just not going to function at the right capacity. You're not going to see the things. I think maybe Georgia pointed that out, and somebody else, maybe uh, Doug. Um, IT strategic plan. There are solutions out there that we would love to have at the city. I have no idea how to fund that right now. There's, there's technology out there that we would love to have and the citizens would be very happy if we had it. I don't, I don't, have, I don't know how to approach that unless maybe Peter at Oracle has some sort of grant program or something. Um, Malibu Canyon traffic study that we came up with recently. Yeah, we need that. Maybe grant money there. I, I literally don't know. And of course, the big rock generators. Um, I'm, I know Mark's still there, I see you, and I heard everything you said, and thank you so much. I'm still not quite sure what it meant in some details. Um, I do hear great for this, this uh, fall and winter. Um, today, it's June 8th. And it was a full fire wind event, as far as I could tell. That's very early, very scary to me. So I love what you're saying, Mark. I'm not sure how it protects Big Rock. And Big Rock is interesting because it is kind of it is kind of the keeper of the gate from a fire sweeping through all of eastern Malibu. So it, it does worry me greatly. Um, some of the cost-saving measures, I know uh, Skylar brought it up. Brought it up, retirement incentive program. I would love Reva to give us much more detail on what that might look like. We talked about it a bit. 
I still don't have a grasp on the financial end of what that might mean ultimately. Um, and it wouldn't happen overnight. I realize that. Um, I know some cities have done it. Um, I think there was comments on massive overpaying of employees. I, I, I don't think I've looked at all the numbers, by the way, comparatively. I don't believe that to be true. It's also true that it's much harder to get employees in Malibu and keep them, especially quality ones. We lose a lot of good employees all the time because so they can have a much smaller commute. Um, so it's not as easy as you think. It really, really isn't. I think eliminating positions we have done, we're down six plus really more like 13 with where we're at now by getting rid of the consultants, it's going to have a serious impact. We're really going to notice it, and it's going to be frustrating if you're trying to get things done. So I think right now we hold where we are and see where things go, and if we have to make that call in months or whenever, we make it. Right now, to go less is going to be tough. I am interested in how it might consolidate functions, though. How can we reorganize the city to run more efficiently? Um, we should always be looking at that, obviously, but now we have an extra impetus to do that. Um, creating a better workflow and the planning process might be a way to look at it. I know that's been a, a difficult area with a lot of challenges for a long time. And another area that technology could really, really help. Tree maintenance, I'm very reluctant to touch that. That just seems to be playing with fire, so to speak. Um, Reducing community service and activity. In a way, we're already doing that because pretty much every program has been canceled and probably will be through the summer. So I, I, don't, I hope and think that we don't need to touch that yet. Um, and we can look back that way later if we have to. And then, of course, there's a, a, a ton of other line items we can look at. Um, <clears throat> and I worry about that here. We have an increase, as, as Lisa said, and by the way, Lisa and Viva, thank you for all your work and your staff on this budget. This is a monster project. I don't know how you, you get it done, and I know it's difficult, and I really do appreciate the detail you put into it. But next year is pointed out another $629,000 in debt service. That's real. We don't, it, it's real. That's a lot of money. And we haven't even talked about school district separation which is number three priority for the for the city council this year. Um, and the sheriff substation was mentioned. Uh, right at this point, the way our budget's going, that's just going to end up being on hold, which is not what any of us want. It doesn't help make this city safer in any way, shape, or form. So what are my proposals? I want to get consent from this calendar to agendize putting on the November ballot, raising the transit occupancy tax from 12 to 15%. I think it's fair. I think it's comparable. And I think it'll pass easily and I'll go door to door if needed. We buy a lot of services for a lot of people that come here. And raising that to basically the same rate as Santa Monica is a no brainer to me. So this item alone in a full year will raise about $250,000. And in this upcoming year, 21, 2021, we'll raise a pro about $125,000 more dollars if it passes in November. So call it $100,000, be conservative. I absolutely think we should. There's one other budget line projection that I keep coming back to. And I want to be conservative, and I love that Lisa and Reva have done a conservative budget. It's the way it absolutely should be because we have to remain solvent. But it's line, it's number 3111, the property tax revenue. Last year, we exceeded the projected revenue by 9% or $1 million. And I think it caught us all off guard. And that won't happen again. I don't think so. I don't think we're our... our property tax rolls are going to go up another 9%, not at all. Um, and this year, we also have reassessments starting to come with all the properties that burned down the Woolsey fire. 
And I don't see prices dropping at all from what I'm seeing. And I've checked with a number of people. So to me, I think we can conservatively raise it 1%, not nine point something, 1%. And right there, that's another $112,000 a year. So call it, call it $100,000. And that's it. I'm not going to, there's a ton of areas we can go in and try and save more money. Um, as far as additional income, like adjusting property tax projection and the TOT tax, that's it. So to me, I think we have, I'm saying another $200,000 to spend, in my opinion. How would I spend it? And it's fully open for the, for the council to talk about it. And I would spend it right now. I think, and I don't quite understand the details, Mark, but I think I earmarked $50,000 to Big Rock to help with those generators. I am worried. I've been worried about that. I think, I really think the east side of Malibu, it's going to catch fire at some point, and I'm extremely worried about it. One of the reasons I joined Arson Watch. Um, I love that you're a firewise community. All work you've done on it. Some great talk, particularly with uh, Jeff Greer about this. I think, however, we get them in, I think that should be a priority. Public safety is really our number one priority. This is a number one priority in public safety, as far as I can tell. And if Big Rock burns down, I don't know that it'll cost the city a lot of money in the sense of fee waivers. We won't have the money for the fee waivers. So let's not have it burn down much to people's point that it would save a lot of money. We don't want it to burn down. Um, I will suggest to Big Rock though, and I don't know your total plan, that it better be more than generators. You better have a bigger plan than generators. The generators are not gonna save it alone. You need to, you gotta be careful. You have one way in and one way out. You really, do you have radios? Do you have a repeater? Do you have, training do you do you have a plan and i'm sure you probably do and i just don't know it but it's going to be more than generate and take more than just having water and you got to be careful next i was elected on a platform of supporting our environmental initiatives which i hope we can continue to move forward on so for me the i don't know the reason i'm not suggesting the environmental commission though it's my passion is we can do a couple of things to move environmental issues forward that won't cost as much money. And that would be the dumpster lid ordinance and dark sky ordinance. I see the dark sky might have to push out a little bit with COVID in some ways, but we got to move forward on that. We spent so many years getting here. And the dumpster lid ordinance, I agree, it's essential. Um, I know in our neighborhood too, I'm just gonna to add to it, and maybe this comes back to something Keon has talked about and Joel. We started in raptor poles and we're gonna put up an owl box. It is amazing the amount of rats that we are getting up here in Malibu West now. Different subject, but I thought I'd throw that in there. So lastly, so I'm 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 I've just asked to spend another 150,000 total. The last thing I would do, and maybe it comes because I'm a business coach. And I think I heard it from a couple other people. I would absolutely do fifty thousand dollars for the departmental audits. I think I think they're essential when you run an organization the size of our city that you do audit and you do make sure of that everything's going right. The best practices financially, how it's run, every bit of an audit. So that's how I'd spend the two hundred thousand dollars. I feel like I found, and I think that two hundred thousand is conservative. I would also add it has nothing to do with spending money or saving money. I spent a lot of time thinking about this. I, I would have the view preservation fee at 750 bucks, like I think we're going forward with on uh, on on appeal fee. I get that it costs more. We have so few of them a year. I agree that that's kind of one of the reasons people move to Malibu. That system is funky. Um, I don't think it'll cost the city a lot of money, but that's just my feeling. Um, so that's my proposal, and I hope the council will seriously consider all everything I said, and I'd love to get somebody to agendize. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Mikey. Okay, uh, Jefferson? Yes, thank you, Karen. Uh, appreciate that. Thank you, Mikey, for the details. Uh, we also need to remember that we are here for the people that live here and that their desires were some of the priorities. We know about the school separation, but not much is going on with that. It's going to wind up down the road. It's not going to be a top priority, even though it is in our minds and our hearts. But the simple ones that we can achieve and give some rewards to our elected, the people that elect us, are simply the dumpster lid, easy, no-brainer, as Mikey said. Dark skies, let's achieve that. That should be on the budget. To the folks up in Big Rock, and I know Mark is listening, we were able to achieve upgraded water service up uh, in Lechuza with District 29 money. We were able to upgrade at Bush Drive, which was passed a couple weeks ago by the Planning Commission to get their tank replaced and fixed and up to, up to par. We did one a couple years ago up in Carbon Mesa. And why District 29? And I'm sorry but to Scott, but why are we dragging our feet? These people need service now. So I'd say if we can't come up with something now, as some of the speakers spoke about, then we have to come out as a city and support these people until that District 29 does what it's supposed to be doing. So brief comments, simple amounts, things that we need to achieve, and things that our people have asked us for, and the city policies support that because they put their time and effort into it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Rick, I see you. Okay, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, I want to thank Mark Pastrella for staying up late and attending um, our meeting. You know, you have a very large flock of towns that you take care of. And, you know, we're sort of on the peewee end of the scale at 13,000 people. So I really appreciate it. I know you've got a lot of uh, things on your plate and you've always come out here and treated us like we're the most important customer and you're engaged in all of our issues. So I wanted to address your comments about that, which I sincerely appreciate. And I would like you to address, you know, if you're, if you're a, a big rock guy and you've been doing all the cat herding and fundraising and you think you've got something going and it might be implemented here this fall. And now you hear, you know, as much as, as much as we like you and as much as respect you, some other guy in the government giving something that sounds like a study and a delaying tactic. Can you address that for them and talk about what kind of timeline that would result in in terms of implementation of the fixed system that you're discussing, as well as what could be done in the interim to put them at ease about the immediate need for this fire season? I'm, I'm wondering if you thought about that. Thanks, um, Rick, and um, uh, thanks to the, all the council members. Um, it isn't a problem for me to stand up, but I do appreciate Malibu. Um, the, the system that I'm contemplating um, hardening, um, that component of it, which is the, as you guys know, is the um, generator, stationary and mobile, is a hybrid um, approach that would allow us to be mobile with certain, certain pieces and then um, stationary and others. Um, the folks that have done a great job, the community up in Big Rock did a great job. You know, I got a lot of history up in the Big Rock. I started my career in Malibu and um, actually was hiking around Big Rock after the land, big landslide up there the years before. And, um, you know, it's, you're right, Mikey, they need to, the community there needs to do more than just a generator system. They need to have a community emergency management plan. I need to check in with them and get a hold of the fire department and get up there and see that uh, fire is also looking at what other things we can do to create resiliency and um, fire capability, as well as hardening on their landscaping, if we can do some of that. So it's all those pieces, you're right. It's not just the generator system. Um, it's the other pieces of the infrastructure that we, we definitely want um, to be done. It needs to be community approach. And to the credit of the folks up on Big Rock, they have been doing that. I mean, they're really stepping up. Let, let me be clear, my, my testimony is really a reaction to me seeing how we were dealing with them. We had sent a note out 
saying um, they could proceed and we would maintain a system they built with their own money. Um, I, I don't personally think that's the right approach. I, I actually think that the, these people are paying district fees um, like the rest of the Malibu in 29, and that if the, if the district can afford to and, and considers it a priority, which we did make comment to them, that we agree with them that this would might not, we might not agree that it's going to make a system up there that they could fight a wildfire with, but if it's going, we did agree that it was going to make the system more resilient and make the community more resilient by having stationary system there. So we've already gone on record with them. My testimony tonight is to tell you that I want to find the money and put it in um, in the timing that they're talking about. Um, I want to get that done. The other thing is, is that I want to look beyond that neighborhood and see where else we need to prioritize stationary, um, uh, you know, generators. The fact of the matter is, um, I got staff that have to put those mobile state mobile generators in place, and that is not always easy to do, as you can imagine. In a wildfire, I don't want gen my uh, folks running up into wildfire to start a generator. So, um, you know, we don't always have a good warning. We don't have always good warning. So I may know about a planned or unplanned outage. Um, and even with any other kind of um, disaster, we, we, we've come to know that. And the worst thing that could happen is if we lost the life of the citizens, their homes, or loss of life or injury to one of my crew members. So I'm, what I I'm wanted to testify tonight was we're making a commitment in the district to find the funding to do this. But on top of that, I want to look at the whole system of prioritizing. So I may be... Um, I may be uh, open to city funding or some component um, of city funding to help us out with that, um, but I don't think I need that right now. We're talking about $300,000 potentially for um, Big Rock to get done, maybe even less. And um, we had already committed to full maintenance of the system um, of this, whatever they were going to build on their own up there. So um, I just think that we can do better in terms of the way we're treating citizens who are already paying fees. Um, I heard um, Jefferson say that. I, to I totally agree that um, we make a promise when we collect these benefit assessment and these fees to, to deliver a service. We have to stay in our budget. And I take a look at what we got going statewide and also in our own budget and think that we can accommodate that project. I just, the only thing you hear about th that you might have sensed delay was I wanted to look at it comprehensively. I didn't want to look at it as an individual neighborhood. I want to look beyond that neighborhood and see what other because I think we're going to identify probably probably something in the order of another, you know, whatever. Uh, we got 30 stations. We're probably going to look at about another 10 or something, 8 to 10 places where we think up in the Topanga, most likely, we're going to need to put some stationaries up there. So um, and try to move the district to um, benchmark to our neighbors to the north of you guys there. I'm working with Dave Peterson up the hill at Las Virginis, and, you know, I went through his plan He's got a 50-50 hybrid, same like what we're proposing, and he's starting to move on that already. So um, yeah, I just wanted you to be updated on what we're doing in the district. I didn't want you to be uh, make a decision without the full picture of what we're trying to do. Well, I, I appreciate you uh, answering my question, which is essentially for the Big Rock people to keep on essentially on their timeline for something to be in place this season. And then also looking at the comprehensive system throughout Malibu. And, and that... What you're talking about there is a uh, will have a massive impact on the resiliency of the neighborhood. I mean, the, the entire town. And I really appreciate you uh, being willing to step forward. And I know that you're a man of your word. And, uh, and just for everybody out there, at my part, I have a generator that uh, runs the whole fire station. It's maintained by the county. And it works like a champ. And every time the power goes out, instantaneously it comes on. And it ran my fire station for three and a half weeks after uh, the Woolsey fire burnt down everything in the Santa Monica Mountains. And they do the county does a great job of maintaining these things. So I think the other thing for the Big Rock people to think about is rather than you guys going out and buying something that is standard, that's maintained by the county of Los Angeles, that's just a one-off. And I think what uh, Mark is talking about here is let's get something that the giant system of the County of Los Angeles uses and let's do that because they have normal guys who go out there and maintain those things. And I think that's the way to go. So I, I really appreciate that, Mark. And that's a, 
that's a big step forward. And Reba can tell you that I've been making her life miserable the last couple of days. And so thank you very much for coming out, answering all those questions. And I think that should put everyone at Big Rock, Big Rock at ease. Although I know they're, you know, they're going to have questions about it, but we'll, we'll deal with those as we go forward. So thank you very much for that commitment. The other thing I wanted to say was uh, ask you, Reva, because uh, Georgia brought up the issue of your salary and comparable towns. And, you know, there's a lot of towns that are 13,000 ish throughout the state of California. And I don't know what she's comparing it to, but I know we've done this before. So do you by chance have command of some of the figures of the nearby towns like like Agora, like Calabasas or any of the beachside towns that are of comparable size to us so you can look tell her how your salary compares to your competitors that are of like kind. Thank you, um, Rick. Yeah, um, the numbers that um, she was taking off of the state compensation website, um, the state controller's website um, actually is a full in number with benefits. And so I do not make $300,000 a year. Um, I actually make a uh, completely comparable to what our neighboring COG cities make and actually compared to other cities our size um, that have a similar general fund or population. I actually fall within probably around the 50% uh, mark of where um, other people, other city managers' uh, salaries are. Um, but in terms of our COG, uh, right there with what everybody else within our COG is making. Um, so those are our closest comparisons. Um, uh, so the city of Calabasas uh, actually has a vacancy right now, but that city manager was making uh, just shy of 250000 Agora 249000 and uh, Westlake about two hundred and forty. and um, my current salary is 248000 So um, right, right in with what uh, my uh, neighboring cities are making in terms of um, other uh, beach cities, I'm comparable to Dana Point. Um, I make less than Encinitas, less than Manhattan Beach, less than Laguna Hills, less than San Clemente. So um, the, the complexity of Malibu, uh, when you go to compare it, you can't just compare it to a city of 13,000. You need to compare it to cities that have the same type of co complex issues that we have. And while we do only have 13,000 residents, um, as you all know, we actually have a visitor population of 15 million. So the um, issues that are face that we face, uh, not only as uh, council members that you all face, but as city staff are, are, are actually considerably more than just a small town of 13,000. So I'm very grateful to uh, the salary that I do receive. Um, the proposed budget does not include any type of pay raise for me. Um, so that's not something that's in there. I do not receive a cost of living. So my salary would remain static this year. Um, and well, happy, I, I appreciate happy to go into you. any other details if you'd like me to. No, I, I appreciate that. And uh, but I also wanted to illuminate that for Georgia and everyone else out there that, you know, we look at these things. We don't just go throwing away the taxpayers money uh, willy nilly. And we look at uh, what other people are making. And you can't really compare our town to, you know, a, an inland landlocked town of 13,000. That's got a, uh, you know, a geography of, of one tenth the size of of our town. So there are a lot of complexities, but I appreciate you bringing that up, Georgia. So I hope that I've been able to address that somewhat. I would like to talk a little bit about some of the things that Mikey uh, brought up. And in general, uh, my my thoughts on the, what we're talking about tonight. And I'm going to go back to what Skylar said about that list of the things we can do to tighten the belt and reduce uh, the bit and, you know, the early outs for all of that things, all the that list of things, even the trees. I think that you should look at all of those and see if we can address those first before we go spending any money. When I look at this budget, I, I frame it <clears throat> in where we are in time. We went through the Woolsey part. We're doing the, we just did the, we're in the COVID-19 thing where we essentially pulled the handbrake on all of the uh, commercial establishments in the city of Malibu. We basically said, stop business and we're still in that and we've got a ways to get out of it so i think before we reach into the uh wallet and start spending money on things that we are all passionate about we should probably stick with the big three and the big three are public safety recovery from the 
for the Woolsey fire and the school separation. And as Jefferson said, the school separation thing is kind of a little bit on autopilot. It is funded. Uh, we're, it's probably going to be delayed a little bit about because of this COVID thing. And it's not a big giant part of the budget. Um, without question, the rebuilding of the burned out homes from <clears throat> the Woolsey fire should be a very high priority. Without question, I think public safety is always numero uno. And from my mind, the only thing I would <clears throat> be interested in poning up any cash for in this whole thing, and I would only do it commensurate with a reduction in other areas, was this big rock thing. And I, but now we can wait and see what the county is going to bring forward and maybe we won't even have to spend any money right now on that. Maybe we will for the long haul, but I would prefer to see us, you know, it, it's like, it's like we're, my military aviation days. We just lost an engine. Okay. So we have to jettison some unnecessary cargo and maybe we have to jettison some fuel, but we got to keep the plane aloft. And now it's not the time to be doing all those nice two things. It's time for us to get down to fighting weight and really be thankful for the fact that we're not a lot worse off like many other towns are, like many other towns. I don't know how Santa Monica is dealing with all the things that I have to do. I mean, they were having problems just before this, and now they went through a freaking riot, and they had a bunch of their businesses destroyed. So we don't have that. We're lucky, but it doesn't mean that things were all rosy for us, especially when you look ahead. And I know everyone's passionate about the things that they want to do, but if we're going to do those, if we're going to do any of the things that you want to do, my suggestion is let's save the money first. Let's tighten the belt and let's see how we are in, in a couple months. And then maybe we can do those things. Just my thoughts, but I'm more of a, you know, um, look out for the taxpayer's money. And I'm, I want to emphasize where we are in time. And I do believe, I will say this, I do believe that the underlying economy in general is much stronger than everybody thinks it is. And that's why I would like to see us get out of all this restraining bolts that have been put on the businesses. Once we get out of the barn, I think things will be a lot better, but we still got a couple months before that's going to happen. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I'll start out by saying we're in a global recession. So if you've been paying any attention to the news, you know that right now thousands of cities in the U.S. are bracing for budget shortfalls or they're in the middle of them due to this coronavirus and, as Rick said, pulling the handbrake on everything. So uh, Santa Monica, for example, has laid off, I don't even remember the number, 500, 700 people, a huge percentage. Um, you know, what looks to me like a free fall. Uh, as we heard from Lisa, Mikey reiterated, we've got the debt service. $550,000 this coming year on the new property acquisition and uh, more than that the following year. Um, benefits are mandated. Um, some of the cuts would be, I think, insignificant. Um, so I'm trying to go in some kind of order. Um, this, the, the SoCal Edison settlement, $13.5 million, that's a one-time fix. Um, and I'll reiterate again, I'm so thankful that the staff uh, put the work in to making that claim and that it was negotiated the way that it was by the city attorney and that we got the money when we did. So I'd hate to think where we'd be right now if we hadn't gotten that settlement. Um, so uh, yeah, this is, this is austerity time. It's belt tightening time. Um, and if we can't figure out how to do that now, then next year, we're looking at something like a $5 million cliff. We don't wanna do that, okay? Uh, Mikey, I'd love to think that you found $200,000. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, I realize the projections are conservative. 
Uh, but even $200,000, while that's a lot of money, it's not going to get us out of where we are right now. And I don't even want to assume that we have it. Um, we're not filling unfilled positions. Uh, we are releasing some of the contract uh, work and putting that on staff. Nobody likes to think that things are going to take even longer, but I think that's what that means. So I'm just the bearer uh, or the reiterator of all kinds of bad news right now. Uh, Reva, you've commented on your salary and from documentation that I have uh, with our COG cities and uh, other coastal cities, it's, it's right there in the middle. Um, so what- Here, Sarah, Do you have any more questions for uh, Mark Pastrella? If not, we might want to let him oh, sign sure. off. I just want to be um, we're done with that area, we could uh, wrap that up for him. Yeah, thank you for the reminder. Um, Mark, sorry to keep you on here so late on a Monday night of all things. Um, thank you for being uh, here in our meeting and thanks for your going to bat uh, for Big Rock, which means for all of Malibu. Um, I too would like to think that the county could enhance um, what's being done already. Uh, infrastructure can always be improved uh, in spite of what we have right now. Um, and I, I feel for everybody at Big Rock, uh, that area hasn't burned since 93 and, and everyone's just holding their breath. And the Santa Ana conditions today are a reminder. Skylar, sorry, can I finish? Um, so I guess one question that I have is what, uh, what kind of safeguards can you give all of us um, about the timing of the implementation of these infrastructure improvements. Okay, thank you, Karen, um, Mayor Ferrara, for your question. And um, thank you, Rita, for um, reminding everybody I'm, up, I'm with you still. Um, so um, the, First of all, we it's not as if we haven't been out looking and like doing the improvements and you heard from the other councilman, we were about some of the stuff we did up in Lachusa already and um, recovery, um, not only not only waterworks, but um, the flood control folks on our side of the house have been doing a lot of preliminary um, clean out um, for, for um, storm season, um, season two here we go into um, post fire debris flow and things like that and there's been a lot of like work that you may or may not be aware of that we've been doing to um, create that resiliency we talked about and to um, improve the system or get it to capacity to handle what, um, you know, the, the, the future hazards. Specifically about um, Big Rock, what um, I intend to do, we've already procured um, these mobile um, transform tra uh, generators and um, they're due uh, soon. And we already have five others that we already have in our possession. So, um, what we are doing, working with fire department, is identifying high vulnerability locations, like you're identifying these areas that haven't burned, for instance, Big Rock 93, which was the first fire I was involved with up there in the Malibu. And um, so we, along with fire, are looking at that, and of course they're pre-deploying um, equipment, and we intend to do this, the same thing. So pre-deployment, so looking at Big Rock, calling it a priority already, and pre-deploying, um, these uh, mobile um, generators is already in the plans, already in our works. And then, um, as I said earlier, um, the idea is that we fund the project that's already been contemplated for that area um, and get them in place by um, this, this uh, fall, meeting the timeline that they're expecting. As Rick's, Rick said, they have an idea of when they wanted to get it done. And we're we're, we're working through the details with the folks up there. I think a couple of them were going to actually testify to that. We actually talked to them before they made testimony, walked them through what um, we were proposing and seemed to me that um, at least the president at HOA was pretty happy with what we were telling them. So um, you guys have my commitment that uh, I'm going to hound this. We're going to come back to you if there's a problem. That's the other thing. If we see that timeline, uh, we're going to fall apart on it. We'll come back and what you'll come back, I'll come back in August with this, um, plan that I have 
um, directed staff to develop, and it's going to have an emergency management plan so, uh, attached to it that talks about operations for for specific events, so a fire event or a power outage event. So you and the, then after you, to socialize that, we'd be getting out to the community. And I like to do that in collaboration with your emergency management staff, along with fire department and sheriff um, to prep for the upcoming um, fall season. Um, so um, there's a lot to this resiliency, right? A piece of it is the, sta the stationary generators. But again, I go back to what Mikey was saying is, it's also getting each community, each canyon to have its emergency management plan in place and ready to go. So I'll, uh, I'll touch base with Chief Osby tomorrow, um, get him going, get a commitment out of those guys to work with us and come back to you guys with more like, sort of like, Reva, you can like schedule us to come back and do like a comprehensive plan of a uh, resiliency plan that we're in association with both fire and sheriff for, for the Malibu. I think it's the best thing for us to do. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, we would all love to see you come back uh, with uh, an update at the next meeting if possible. I'll work with uh, Mark and Chief Osby and we'll come up with something uh, to bring them back at the right time. Okay, thank you. Thank all you right. Mark. I'm going to continue with some comments. Um, so That's thank you, Mark. We can let you sign off now. Thank you for being here. Um, yeah, but budget goals that that we have work work plan goals that we have um, uh, an increased CHP presence, um, homeless services. I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. We have 38 million unemployment claims in the country right now. I don't think that means we're gonna have a decrease in our homeless population. So we can't wish this away. If we could, it would have been gone already. Um, so where could we find funding? Where could we free things up? Um, I'll start with what um, I think, Skylar, you said it at the beginning. Um, can we incentivize early retirement? Can we offer an incentive package, um, maybe based on uh, each year of employment? Um, that's, that's something I would like the council to consider. So I'll move on. Um, I think and the costs are going up, we could reduce or possibly even eliminate the joint use agreement with the school district. Most of those costs, I'm sorry everybody, are for adult recreation activities. And if you are somebody who participates in those, I'm sorry. This, this is the time of austerity. So that's a possibility, and I'd love to hear the council's uh, opinions on that. Um, I think uh, I'll jump ahead a little bit here to raise revenue. I agree with Mikey. I'd like to see the council uh, move ahead with putting an item on the November ballot to raise our transient occupancy tax. Uh, right now it's 12%. Um, some cities charge as much as 15%. And, you know, we don't have a lot of hotel and motel rooms here. Um, and it also applies to short-term rental. And that's revenue that's paid by visitors, not paid by our local residents. Um, is there a possibility of combining positions or possibly even departments? And I think we could look at savings there. I'm, I can't guess to know how. We do that, but I think we we ought to consider that. Um, is it possible to eliminate positions? I don't like to even suggest that. Uh, a lot of the staff um, put everything they have into this. Um, but if that's something the council needs to consider, 
and we have to talk about it. Um, I think, I think that's about it, but I think we, this is, this is a serious time and what we don't want to look at is an even bigger cliff from now. And I don't see any getting around that. So I don't know if other council members want to comment. Uh, Rick, I see your hand. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate your, um, uh, the gravity of your tone and the appreciation that you have for the uh, situation that not only us, but the whole world is involved in and the rest of the country. These are difficult times. It's not going to last forever. I actually think that, you know, that sometime in the not too distant future, we'll get back to normal. But we don't know that that's the case and anything could happen between now and then. But uh, uh, I, I wanted, I'm, and I, like, as I said, I'm in favor of looking at all of the things on this list, but I did have a question you know, it says, there's just a it's part of a sentence there. It says, the contract for law enforcement with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, we could look at that. I'm not one of those who's like defund the police at all. But is there any comment you wanted to make about that, Riva? Or is that just, we want to look at little bits and pieces of that. But I'm not, I'm not a defund the police guy at all. So are you asking if I want to comment on um, making changes to our sheriff's contract? Is yeah, I mean, I'm just, or? is there, is there something we can do there? I mean, I know it's a big thing. It's just, it's in there, but uh, are you talking about little peewee changes to it? My gut instinct is that isn't the right place to start with making cuts. I think that public safety is so important uh, to everyone and particularly to this community. I think we have issues um, that come with the number of visitors that come into our community. And I would hate to put um, any of our residents at risk um, by uh, trimming some of the budget. Um, certainly it's uh, for, for sheriff, um, certainly it's an option. Um, I believe it was Mikey who suggested maybe we supplant um, some of the uh, minutes that we purchase from the sheriff department and buy those same services from CHP. Um, I think that's a, a good uh, way to start. Um, you know, I have had conversations with the CHP as part of the um, short-term agreement that we have with them. Um, and so if that's something that we want to have them available for things like a PSPS event, um, having a, a, a more long-term contract for one or two officers from CHP in lieu of having those services provided by the sheriff department might be a win-win for us. Um, but I am very um, hesitant to recommend our sheriff services because of the risk to the public safety. Um, and, and with that being said, you know, I, bringing forward anything where we have to cut anything and not provide a full array of robust, robust services to our community is really painful for me and painful for Lisa. This isn't a position that anybody wants to be in, um, particularly um, when we have recovered so well from such a horrible event like the Woolsey fire. So, um, you know, I, it hurts me to even have to write out suggestions of where to make cuts. So, um, well, that's kind of where we're at in terms of sheriff, but I'm happy to go through. Okay, some good. Of the that, things that, that you clarified up. what I was concerned about. It's like, um, I'm not so sure that's an area, especially after recent events that uh, we should be cutting back on. So good. I'm thank you for clarifying that because I, you know, that, that sentence is just sitting there, but it's, uh, I didn't want to go the way of some other towns and defund our law enforcement at all. But I, as I said before, I think that I agree with you, mayor and, uh, Thank you for your words. And I think that all of the things that are in the category of stuff we can look at, I would recommend that maybe you come uh, bring back an item where all of them are considered. Is that too broad, uh, Riva, or is, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I guess I sort of wanted to just touch back and give some feedback. Oh, Skylar wanted to speak. Do you want to go ahead, Skylar, before I give my comments? Um, so, so a couple things, you know, in terms of, um, let's start with the TOT, adding that to um, a, 
an agenda to come back with an item, I think that would be a good thing to do, putting an item on the November election that would raise the rate of our TOTs. I think that's a, a very positive thing that doesn't impact our residents, um, but could definitely provide some uh, revenue to the city. Um, so I think that's definitely something we should consider. In terms of looking at an increase to our property tax, um, we are very conservative with that number. Um, a couple of things that happened um, at this time, which have never happened before, is because of you know, a lot of people paid their property tax late. Um, and so our April collection that normally gives us a very clear idea of what our year end number will look like, we uh, didn't receive that full payment from the county. So we're supposed to receive it uh, before the end of the year, but I don't have it yet. And I'm very hesitant to count um, you know, money that we don't have. Um, also, I'm very concerned about a drop in other revenue sources and um, particularly our sales tax. Uh, I've heard just in the last few days that I Casa Escobar closed, that Coffee Bean closed. Um, and so as we start to hear of more businesses completely closing, that's just sales tax we're not going to get back at all. Um, and so to raise property tax 100000 while we have a have start having that same loss in sales tax, I just don't feel comfortable raising that revenue source right now. Um, you know, if we come back in a few months and things look better, absolutely we can make an adjustment, but I would be very hesitant to recommend that as, as a solution. Um, you know, certainly willing to give some more information on what a retirement incentive program would look like. A lot of other cities have done that, and that's definitely something that we could offer, whether we have employees who are interested in taking that. I don't have that information, um, but definitely an opportunity uh, to um, reduce some costs and still keep those positions filled. Um, as you heard, we did eliminate six vacant positions this year. We also eliminate a cost of living for staff. So we have tried to trim back where we can without eliminating positions. Um, you know, I'm trying to, to hear the things that are the most important to the community and find a way to solve for those. I'm glad we were able to work out the Big Rock um, situation with the county. Um, you know, the, the one thing I'm sitting here of looking for money while everyone was talking and that we do have um, a $65,000 fund balance in our designated reserve for capital improvement projects. And the designated reserves are typically reserves that the city council has set aside for a particular use. But because you set them aside, you can also move them back into the general fund undesignated reserve. So we could um, free up the remainder of that designated reserve that was for capital projects and move that into the general fund and um, be able to fund the dumpster ordinance um, implementation with those funds. Um, so that might be a solution without a, a big, horrible impact to anything. Um, certainly can come back with what, uh, you know, consolidating positions and all of that. If that's something the council would like, uh, we could take that direction and do some analysis on that. Um, and uh, I think that's about all I have for the questions, unless you have something more specific. For me. No, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And um, I not a raise the tax guy normally, but I would support Mikey's thing about the, the TOT. I think that's a win-win. So, and I just wanted to, in my view, we should give you the maximum amount of flexibility to belt in the, uh, tighten the belt as necessary. And it sounds like maybe you can uh, shake I out. Want, I want everyone to hear, I'm very, very worried about next year. I okay. think we've made this work in this moment of time and this is a snapshot. There's a lot of unknowns. They could go our way or they could not go our way. I'm also very concerned that if we have another major disaster and we need to tap into those reserves while we wait for us to be paid back from the FEMA from Woolsey and the FEMA from COVID, and there's another disaster, we're not going to be able to make it. And I'm not dire in my predictions ever with my budgeting, but right now I really feel that we all have to say this is a dire situation. Be very, very careful at this point. And if things turn better, then it's a win and we can go back to the way we used to do businesses. But right now, we need to be very mindful that in a year from now, we're going to be five or six million dollars short. And then we're going to really, really be facing some very difficult conversations. Okay, message received and understood. That's all I got to say. Thank you very much. Thanks, Reva Schuyler. 
Thank you, Karen. Okay, so can we just go down the line here and see if we have consensus on the uh, temporary occupancy tax thing so we can square that away and give direction to staff to bring that back? So I'm in favor of doing that. The transient occupancy tax? Yeah, so we can bring something back so that I can go on a ballot. Yeah. Thank you. Is anybody not in favor of that? Is, is Jefferson, are you there, Jefferson? Yes, um, I'm, we had a power outage here. Um, I'm on voice, and um, I'm in agreement on raising the TOT. Confirm? Confirm. Got it. Okay, so. Putting it on the ballot. Yeah, so we'll, we'll bring an item back and deal with that. So then, the, other than that, um, Lisa brought up, like, the slide that I had come up earlier that was sort of the areas of where the council or where the city can, you know, possibly make some strides in cutting the budget. I, I think that we should bring all of those things back um, with what the plans are kind of along the lines of what Rick said. Um, you know, I would like to see us figure out a way to cut our sheriff's budget by five to 10%. I don't know if that's possible or not in any way, shape or form, but I think that we could ask them to be more efficient with how they're handling our There's a way to, to, to get, you know, that's a very large expenditure, and, you know, even 5% out of that is a substantial amount of money. So, you know, and we can roll back into that as the years go on. But, you know, right now we need to figure out how to be very, very fiscally responsible. So in, in response to that, you know, one of the things we could do is I could certainly sit down with um, our representatives from contract law at the sheriff's department and say that we're looking to uh, reduce some of our costs without um, putting any of the public safety of our residents at risk and see if they have any solutions for us. Um, there may be some opportunities of things that I haven't thought of that they could help us with. Yeah, I think that that would be a wise thing to do. And now it's awesome that, that, you, that you have the ability to do that. Um, you know, and whether that means I know like Ryan Embry brought up, hey, let's get the county to pitch in more for the beach team. Those are the county's people more than the city of Malibu's people, you know, and I know that that I think I, I want to say I brought that up six years ago or maybe even longer. Than I've that. been asking for that for about 15 years, so we can keep asking. OK, and, you know, maybe we get told to go count Sam. It doesn't hurt to ask or just negotiate something different. Um, so that would be. And so I would like to make a motion that, you know, I know this is kind of more of a give direction thing, but that would be what I would support. And it's kind of going off of what Mikey said and what Rick said and what, what everyone said. I'll second that. Okay, so uh, can somebody help us uh, summarize the motion? Mikey, I'm sorry, you have a comment? I just wanted to still see if I could get consensus on exploring a couple of CHP positions. Nothing against our sheriff, just I think we constantly need more focus on, on PCH. And I just want to see if we could agendize it to come back and, and see if that makes sense. I don't, I, don't, I don't have a problem with that as being sort of part of the sheriff's cost cutting, you know, element that we're looking at here and saying, you know, maybe if we, and I know that that wouldn't necessarily be cost cutting, that would be say, okay, we're- It's not, not cost cutting, it's a, a game of game of right there. It's a diversion. So um, if if Reva thinks that there's an opportunity to do something like that, which I could go with a nod of a head, Reva, that we should definitely have our options open on that. You know, it's not gonna hurt to have that. And, you know, it seems like with our, uh, liability trust fund numbers from the sheriff's department and everything with them continuing to go so high, it may not be a you know bad thing to look at, you know, having our own department again as something it was probably very expensive, but you know, I mean, I remember when those conversations were had before, our cost with the sheriff's was around $5 million a year or $6 million a year. Now, now they're two and a half million dollars more than that. You know, we're getting closer to $10 million a year. Yeah, I'll support that CHP thing, Mikey. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, well, one, one other thing, I'm gonna I'm gonna give another try on. I'm not gonna give up. Um, Reva oh, mentioned yeah. nope. that was consensus then to open the conversation about reducing the sheriff's um, contract and then also um, transferring some of the duties to CHP for you said two officers. Is that correct? 
Yeah, that's that's what I was thinking. It's kind of looking through the contract with the sheriffs. Um, it's kind of a um, it's kind of a smorgasbord. You kind of order what you want. It's you know, it's a la carte. So you know, I I it, which was interesting. I hadn't read it before in detail. Um, so yeah, I'm wondering about a little a la, switch up on the a la carte menu just to really to focus on the highway because it's been such a such an issue, and that's what CHP does. They focus on the highway. Okay. Um, I didn't know if there was direction or not on the retirement incentive program. Was that something you wanted to discuss? Yeah, it should be in with all those other ones. Yeah, yeah. so everything that was on that slide, Reva, we should we should bring back and have that as something to discuss. So, so when can I just make sure I'm clear on this? Because this is the public hearing. So the next round of the budget is when we adopt the final version of the budget. So when you're asking us to analyze all this, do you want us to analyze it and bring back some options as part of the adoption of the final budget because normally I would just bring back a budget and you would say okay we're good to go with that so I, I guess I need a little more direction on how to have this come back in two weeks and I have to have it adopted by the end of June. Can, will you pull back up that slide or whoever's in charge of that real quick? That way we can and I, I apologize I'm not trying to draw this out but these are you know important issues for us. That way we can go over it item by item and give very clear direction on that. Okay, so while looking at these right now, Reva, do you have any idea of what the uh, cost savings are for any of these items? Um, on the in, uh, retirement program, I, I don't. Um, I think it could end up being uh, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars if um, all the employees who are eligible took it, but I don't know what the willingness of that is, um, but we can certainly explore that. Um, and that could happen um, concurrent to the budget ad adoption because it would certainly provide us some cost savings um, down the line, uh, you know, months out from now. Um, in terms of eliminating positions and consolidating functions, that's gonna depend on what the council wants us to do with that. If you wanna give us a blanket, eliminate one position per department, um, we can do that and bring back what those cost savings would be, or you could say do that effective and pick a date, um, and we could do that. Um, street maintenance is forty-five thousand dollars a year. Not something um, that I would recommend, especially where I hear the winds out right now. Um, you know, we certainly wouldn't want anyone to be injured from a falling tree. Um, but it was something I thought was just an, an area that didn't cause as much um, heart wrenching uh, for everybody. Um, certainly in terms of our community services programs and activities, um, very, very important um, to have those, but some of them maybe could we live without for a year? Um, would we reduce the number of art exhibits that we have and, and consolidate some of those things so that we just have one uh, art exhibit for the year? Um, that might save some things. Um, you know, I just I hate to take away things that mean so much to all of us, but that might be an area where we could reduce some of that. Our special events um, probably are going to have some cost savings there because it doesn't look like we're going to have big events, but could we eliminate big events for the whole year? Yeah, we could do that. It's not something we want to, but we could not have, you know, Easter hopping and Jumash days, and that would certainly re reduce costs. Um, but, but I would not want you all to say, well, let's reduce that and then spend that money somewhere else. That money needs to just not be spent this year so that we have more of it next year. Um, you know, I think we touched on the sustainability programs. I'm finding a solution to at least get the dumpster ordinance back in play for us. Um, and then the rest of them, the community grants, um, we haven't had the administration and finance subcommittee meet. Um, but we could certainly reduce some of the expenses in there. Some of them I think are extremely important. The money that goes to the Malibu Boys and Girls Club, for example. Um, I wouldn't want to eliminate that. Um, our homeless outreach services, not an area where I think we want to reduce. In fact, if anything, we're going to want to increase that. So um, that's kind of a list. And I don't know if I answered everything well or not, but that's, that's my thoughts. Okay, thank you. Um, so I would like, and just everyone we can, you know, chime in, whatever. But uh, for as far as a retirement incentive program, I think that we should figure out a way how we're going to offer that. And, you know, um, I think you should proceed with that. I don't know if that has to necessarily be part of the budget. Maybe that's a, a bonus because you don't know who's going to take it or not. So I don't know how you 
calculate that into the budget, but I think right. it's- Right, so what other cities have done is what they, you know, a typical uh, program would be that they offer, um, say, $1,000 per year of service with a city. So if you've worked for a city for 14 years, you get a $14,000 lump sum payment now if you take a retirement, your typical retirement, if you're at retirement age. What that does in terms of cost savings is typically employees who have been with the city the longest are at the top of their pay scale. And so it would allow us to rehire that position, but having someone come in at an entry or more entry level salary, thereby saving 30 or $40,000 for that same work to be done. Plus there's cost savings during the vacancy period. So um, again, I don't know how much, but you could certainly give me direction to develop that program. And then once we did find out what those cost savings are, come back to the council with uh, that information. Oh, I think I think that we should do that. I don't know where everybody else stands. Yeah, I agree. Does anybody disagree with that? Okay. All right, so um, I think that we should try to eliminate one to two positions per department. Is there a consensus on that? I'd like to see a, a study on what it means because I already know services are going to be greatly impacted uh, going forward. So I think we got to be careful. But yeah, I mean, we got to look at it. Okay. Um, is anybody else super opposed to doing that? Well, I, you know, I, I think the preference would be what you've been doing, which is as people leave, don't fill some of those positions rather than just taking somebody and throwing them out the door. Um, or maybe that will also be covered somewhat in your retirement incentive thing. But, you know, uh, I would just be careful that you don't shoot ourselves in the foot too much in terms of our ability to serve the residents of our city. Maybe what we could do is come up with a, a goal of a dollar amount that we're trying to reduce cost by. So, we could say we want to either eliminate um, positions or consolidate certain functions within the city in order to save us X amount of dollars this year, which would carry over to the next year. So, you know, that could be a way of looking at it as opposed to doing it. Get, I'm just giving you some suggestions. But if we have a goal of what we're working towards, then that gives us a, a way to come back with a plan for it. I agree with that, Reva. So... In, in terms of that number, Eva, I mean, I think that it should be somewhere between 500000 and a million, but I don't know where everybody else looks at that or whatnot. I need to see a better breakdown on that. I wouldn't, I'd be just, I don't want to know how to guess on that right now. I, I think if I agree we with start you. at the $500,000 and work, see what that gets us, and then you can yeah. make the decisions if you want to make those choices to eliminate those positions and functions. I think we need to start you know, yeah. And you make it back and say, hey, we can only do 250000 That's all you're going to get. Well, plus, if we don't know the retirement center program, that impact, too. So the two do kind of have to work together to some degree. I mean, if nobody takes the retirement center, that's one thing. If everyone takes it, it's a totally different thing. So... But with the retirement incentive, there's two parts of it. There's going to be some cost savings, but the goal is not necessarily, unless you direct us to eliminate those positions, some of those are could be core functions that we may need to keep using, you know, whatever that might be. No, I get but, it. But I hear you. Yeah. And again, every dollar we save this year is money that we don't have to cut again next year. Right. I, I think the other important thing of the, the second thing up there, which is eliminating positions and consolidating functions has to do with the city's efficiency to operate. And I think that we can, you know, try to be a little bit more efficient with how we operate in the midst of this headache. We are doing everything we can to do that. We'll continue to do that. So, um, I think we should keep the tree maintenance. I don't think, does anybody want to remove that? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, what's the I had a associated with that, Reva? Not on, not on camera. Um, I think Jefferson wanted to make some comments, but the quick answer is the tree maintenance program is $45,000 for this fiscal year. Okay. Je Jefferson, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, it's difficult because of the power outage. Um, I won't be on screen. I'm talking through a phone. 
Uh, I just wanted to touch back quickly on the sheriff and the CHP. If you change that kind of venue and you reduce some sheriff time and you try and get CHP time, there's going to be a lack of performance in that because the CHP customarily, they are the highway, but they're not accustomed to Malibu as much, and they're going to have to come up to speed on Malibu. They'll usually give us motor officers, or if there's a tragedy or a fatality, then they'll send somebody as well. We just got a new sheriff's captain at the station, Bracera, and he has been pretty hands-on, and I think we need to leave the sheriff's thing alone right now, not put the, the CHP back out here with two people, diminish the report. Let's see how the new guy does. And if it's not working out well, then we can go back to the other assessment that you mentioned was CHP trading off hours or minutes with the sheriff. He just got here. We just finally got one landed after the tr four tries in a row. And now we have a guy who was out here when I was a deputy. He was out here when I was a deputy. That's how long he's been around now. But let's give this guy a chance before we start yeah, I, I, diminishing I'm not sheriff. Ready. My thought wasn't to go after Chuck at all. I think he's done a very good job. I think Jim's amazing. I think they're all, they're all great. I was literally trying to figure out how in this mix to really focus on PCH. That's all. Trying to, it's on weekends to get a little more help when, you know, it's just that's, the sheriff has other priorities. I was trying to get a mix of priorities. That was my only thinking. Yeah, I, I can appreciate that. But having spent time on this highway as a deputy, uh, I know how this, it works in the RDs, the reporting districts. Uh, you're just going to have a, a, a lack of a shorter time that you're going to have the deputies here in town. Uh, and these are guys that once they get trained, they get embedded. They know the routines. The chippies coming out of, out of DeSoto Avenue and the 101, they rotate more often than sheriffs do. So, I think we just got to leave the sheriff thing alone for a while just till we see how Chuck, how Chuck does with the assignment and the times. And we can look at the stats. We get them every month. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jefferson. Can we pull that slide back up? All right. So, in terms of the uh, community services programs and activities, I, I think that we should look at what things are going to be eliminated just by way of COVID um, to, to know what we, you know, and then if there's a way, Reva, to give us like a little bit of a menu of those items with cost um, to say, you know, hey, you know, and I don't know, I, I wouldn't know what just like to say right now and say, okay, I'd like to save. $50,000 from the community services budget. I don't know what that would do. You know, and we I have dropped it a lot. I mean, we already have the template. <laughs> We've, if you look at the uh, check registers every, uh, every month, you'll see a ton of refunds because so many programs were, were cut. So I feel like we've already cut a lot there. So that my thought was. I think the only areas that we could reduce, because as we try to make the expenses uh, reflective of what we think will be happening with COVID, um, but we know that's why I was suggesting that if we looked at maybe the special events or the cultural arts events, that that might be an area because of COVID, where we're really not going to be able to hold those as uh, frequently or as large as we have in the past, that that might be an area. So. Uh, we can certainly kind of sharpen our pencil with those numbers. And if we think for the next round of the budget for the adoption that we can find some savings there, we can do that. Um, and, and we'll look at that. I understand it's hard to do on the fly. Well, and I just want to point out that we made cuts to those programs kind of commensurate with what we thought the cuts in revenues would be. Um, and I think initially that was sort of looking at the first six months of the fiscal year, thinking that maybe things would start to pick up again in January. But again, that's truly an unknown. We have no idea, you know, will we will large scale events like Chumash Days be allowed to happen? I'm not sure. Okay. Um. As far as sustainability and, and the rest of the things that are on here, um, 
I don't, I, I would just ask Reva if you could just, you know, try to d direct us in the best way that you can as to what is, you know, I, it's like, cause we don't have like a, a straight dollar amount for any of these things of like, okay, hey, if you just cut this, then it's this amount of money, right? So I think it's important for us to say, and, you know, if, if you can come up with, you know, a savings of 250000 to $500,000, I think that would be awesome out of this kind of menu of different items. I don't so, know. Uh, given the timing of everything, um, I think what I would recommend at this point, that you've given us some really good direction of things to work on um, to be able to come back with the budget substantially where it is right now, um, with that exception of transferring that designated reserve into the general fund. Um, for some of the environmental services. Um, and I have kind of a, a laundry list of things to work on. And maybe what we do is come back and have another budget session um, in August when we have a little better idea, um, similar to kind of how the governor does a, a revised budget. Um, I would suggest given the fluid situation of what we're facing, um, hopefully by August, we'll have a better idea of what restaurants have opened or not opened, what retail has survived. Um, and then we also give us some time to do an analysis, um, know if there's any takers on a retirement incentive program. Um, and I can do some better um, analysis for you on what some of these things will look like. Um, if you still want us to move forward with speaking with the sheriff and the CHP, uh, I can do the money's in the budget is how we who we pay the check to would be the change in that. So that would kind of be my suggestion, particularly given the late hour that uh, we have uh, suggestions of what to work on, but come back with the budget substantially as it is now um, in two weeks, adopt that, and then work on changes. Okay. And then hopefully within that, you can get the sheriff's department to agree to give us a little, you know, COVID discount. <laughs> I, I guess I was unclear. I heard Jefferson's comments and his concerns about the CHP. Um, you know, if we don't do something, we will not have any money in order to hire the CHP to help with traffic direction during a PSPS event or anything else. Um, what Mikey's suggestion, which was super uh, creative, would be to just have one that was basically on our payroll, um, not a payroll, that's the wrong word, but on contract with the city. Um, so that we had them all to the time. Um, and I'm sure uh, asked that we had someone who was familiar with Malibu that's made in the area. I'm sure that's something that we could work out with the CHP. Okay. Uh, Are you proposing that in the, the, the budget in two weeks or is that one of the items coming back? Um, I think that's something that could come back. Again, the funding is in there. It's just whether we keep it completely funded paying towards the sheriff or if we reduce that and hire something different. And again, that's up to the council on how you want to do that. I was just trying to respond to Mikey's suggestion on that. And that's fine if that comes back as something separately. I yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I agree with Mikey. That's the main avenue here is a state-run highway. Let's uh, explore that. Yeah. The other thing, too, is if they have one person out here and when an incident happens, they're going to send likely a lot more. It's going to call for backup if you need. So, yeah, the backup might be 45 minutes. I can get more information on what that would look like for you to make the final decision. Awesome. Do you get Not only that, if, I'm sorry, if the sheriff, uh, if you reduce the sheriff hours and you have a CHP officer out here and he has to prosecute a 1015 or, or a... Uh, a, uh, a 1027, 1028, anything that that CHP officer has to do, his backup is not going to be to sheriff. It's going to be for another CHP officer. So you're really complicating this when you get into them, these minutes here and minutes there and hours here and hours there. Um, I, I'd be happy to sit down with any council member and explain them, to them how it works. I don't ask Rick how his fire department works. I just want to see the right guys get there and do their job. And if we diminish the sheriff's department at this point uh, in any way, you're just going to have to educate chippies. Uh, I'm, I'm really in the, in the weeds with you on this one, but I get it. But I think you're headed down a path that is not going to be visitor serving or membership serving. Thank you. Um, one last comment. I'll go back to with all this change, just the business coach and me, is really reluctant to let go of departmental audits at some point here. I mean, to me, it's kind of, it's important, but 
that's not my feelings. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't work with one of my clients and not do do audits on what they're doing every year. It's just it's just a to me it's a smart move. It's the way an organization should run, but that's me. I, I agree with you, Mikey. I'm, I haven't had much chance to speak because of the electric situation, but audits um, instill confidence in our population. That's that's definitely something that. If you look back at cities that are successful and states that are successful, the audits in, induce confidence from your population. And uh, I agree with you on that, Mikey. Thank you. Um, Reva, do you have enough direction on this item? Yes? Okay. Yes, I do. Thank you. Maybe too much direction. I guess, Mikey, I, I have a question, just a uh, curiosity. Um, I agree if, if we could have uh, a lot of things on our wish list, uh, departmental <laughs> audits would be among them. Uh, do you see something else to cut to make that possible right now? I'm more looking for income and cutting more too. It's a combination. We just put up a whole bunch of things to look at cutting. And I'm, you know, I mentioned something I think is important that we should consider funding. I know it's hard. I, I know where we're heading. I get numbers. This is tricky. I'm not saying it's perfect, but you know, we're, we're, we're anticipating potentially a lot of change in our organization. And that comes, you know, it, it comes with a cost. It really does. It's going to be not going to be easy. You know, my clients are changing dramatically with COVID and trying to come back. It's not easy. There's no easy way to do this. But looking at internally at your organization carefully is an important part of doing that, in my opinion. No, I don't so, agree. And we don't want to be penny wise and pound foolish. And I don't think this city is known for that. Um, so again, I think if we, we move forward with kind of the program that I had suggested that we do a, a, another look at everything in late August, or early September, when we have a better idea of the climate, um, that we could certainly uh, revisit a lot of these conversations. And if there's funding, right. and you know what, I'll be the first to say I was too conservative, and we can go ahead with some things. Well, and I will agree with that. I was going to say that because at that point, we'll maybe we'll have made some fundamental changes, and that might make a lot more sense at that time. Right now, we're trying to figure out what we're doing. Is exact. Now is not the time when we're trying to figure it out. So I would agree pushing that a couple of months for sure, at least. Yeah, I agree too. Okay, so Reva, um, do you have enough input from us for direction? Yes, I think we're good. Lisa, do you need anything else? Good. No, I think I'm good. I We have something we can bring back in two weeks, and then we'll look towards something in a couple months when we have more information under our belts. You guys are clear that we're bringing back the budget similar to what was proposed here and then which items are being brought back later in August? Okay. Yes. Great. Okay. Thank you. So do we do a roll call on this? I think, I think we have consensus here for the direction, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, Heather. Okay, so that was item 4F. We will now go back to where we skipped ahead, and we will look at item 4B. So 4B is the assessment district of Big Rock Mesa. Do we apologize. Uh, um, I think I'm red. I don't know why the color, color is, my video is red, but um, so good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, one thing that I want to ask is see if we, if we can combine items 4B, 4C, and 4D together. They're all related to um, placing the assessments on, on the property taxes for the landside maintenance districts. That's allowed. We've done that. We did that last year, I think. Do we need to have a motion to do that, or can we just agree on it? Yeah, we should do a motion since we're consolidating the agenda that was previously approved. So I'll make a motion to consolidate the items 4B, 4C, and 4D. 
Second. Second. Yeah, I get you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Motion and a second. Could we have a roll call vote, please? Councilor Peak. Yes. Mayor Preston Pearson. Yes. Councilmember Mullen. Rats. Yes. Mayor <laughs> Wagner. Yes. Mayor Fair. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, so this evening or this morning. Uh, we're conducting a public hearing to place the annual assessments uh, for the operation and maintenance for the Big Rock, Calida Barco, and Malibu Road landside maintenance districts. And uh, we'll, we'll place these assessments on the county property taxes. And um, the annual assessment for Big Rock uh, for next fiscal year is about $320,000. Annual assessment for Calida Barco for next fiscal year is about 171,000. And the annual assessment for Malibu Road um, is about 58,000. And um, those numbers have increased by the consumer price index about 1.95%. Uh, so tonight we need an action by city council to so that we can prepare all the paperwork needed to place the, these assessments on the property tax roll. Um, this is needed before the end of June, so meet that deadline, and so we can get all this included on the property taxes, and we can get that revenue back to do all the um, operation maintenance. Um, kind of with that, um, I'm available for questions. Great, thank you, Rob. Skyler? Um, Mayor, do we have any public speakers? Heather, do we? We have public speakers for 4B, Big Rock Mesa. Uh, I don't know that all of them are still here. Let's look. First, we have Joe Drummond, followed by Craig Hill, Hank Corwin, and Georgia Goldfarb. Um, to, 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 to clarify, all these speakers are only for item 4B, right? Yes. Okay. There are no public speakers for 4C or 4D. Okay. So first we'll have Jody Drummond. Hi there, still here. Um, there is so much that is not studied or measured in our current dewatering system. Local high groundwater in the area as perch conditions are not being mitigated as well as recharge from septic and irrigation. Fecal coliform has been detected in almost all discharge points exceeding legal permit limits due to too many on-site wastewater treatment systems already in Big Rock. This figure here modified from Thornhill and Pollard from the 2018 Fugger report is instructive. This is from E.D. Michaels report. While the rate of Big Rock Mesa water usage has remained close to constant during the 2006-2016 decade at approximately 180,000 gallons. The average rate of dewatering declined linearly from about 94,000 gallons per day to 47,900 gallons per day. Thus, for the decade, there was an average decrease in the dewatering rate of 46,100 gallons per day equivalent to an average dewatering rate decrease of 4,610 gallons per day. That is, each year the annual average rate of dewatering was 4,610 gallons per day per year less than the year before. In other words, by the end of 2016 to two, 2006 to 2016 decade, the capacity of the Big Rock Mesa dewatering system had been reduced approximately 50%. So the measurement of septic and irrigation recharge not being mitigated is significant. All the water that goes into a house must come out into the ground. Fugger's response of that there is less groundwater, which is why the dewatering system is producing 50% or less than 10 years ago due to drought does not address these issues. Every Fugger annual report states water conservation is the most critical remaining means of controlling groundwater recharge on the MESA, yet the city approves new expanded outs and development over and over again here, which adds more irrigation and septic to our delicate hill. Fugro has not measured groundwater recharge or studied how to reduce its effects on the landslide debris mass, let alone given any statement on the stability of the hill. 
and apparently it's even questionable that available groundwater elevation data is even applicable to normal analysis of our particular hill situation. E.D. Michael states, it's questionable that the available groundwater elevation are even applicable to normal analysis. It seems like most of the BRM landslide debris mass moves in response to secondary permeability to which non-equilibrium analysis, which assumes primary permeability does not apply. This is explained more clearly in the landslide mitigation book I sent you all yesterday by Slosser, Keen, and Johnson that states the hydro hydrologic complexity of a compound landslide may not be reflected in records of long-term dry season pumping responsive to watering wells. Behavior is a multi-level flow system may only be recognizable during episodes of increased recharge in the rainy season. It's no coincidence that this is also most critical time relative to the instability of secondary landslides. Clearly, so, yeah. Your time is up. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to say every home that adds a bathroom or even an extra bedroom with one more person adds water to our delicate hill, which is not adequately being dewatered enough to prevent a large scale landslide in its present state, let alone with more development. So we need scientific answers on our stability before we add development. So if you could please add this moratorium item to your next agenda at the next available city council meeting as soon as possible and let Big Rock's voices be heard for the safety of our hill. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Craig Hill. Hi, I'm over my astonishment. Uh, Fugro does some monitoring and puts the data together annually, but evidently no single expert is charged with evaluating the data and rendering an opinion on whether the neighborhood is more or less safe than the year before. It seems maybe someone, the city or the consultant, I don't know, is leery of accepting the liability that must already be attached as theirs through the structure of the district itself. There's a lot of uncertainty. One can't assume, as has been the practice, the ground stability tracks linearly with the absolute level of the groundwater. There are many dynamic variables interacting, so what might have been safe groundwater level 30 years ago might not be safe today. The rock might be more fractured now, where the top elevation of the water might be the same, while the bottom has soaked deeper, etc. The significance of the data can change over time. Hopefully, the new consultant, which it looks like we're going to have, will do better. Now. Both residents and instruments have observed land movement in small amounts, but in areas all over the hill. So all that uncertainty requires that the city suspend any further development that increases water inputs to the hill. Now within that constraint, if an owner wants to remodel, fine. And if you have a bare lot, of course, there's the exception based on constitutional rights. But in the absence of a more accountable and ongoing assessment of the hill's actual safety, a qualified moratorium is the only defense defensible option against city liability. Meanwhile, page nine of the report is damning. A significant number of the listed devices for which we've been paying for maintenance and monitoring have not worked in years. All three hydroggers on my property haven't worked for 20 years. No one's visited them in 20 years. Past geo reports noted that they had collapsed and would never be revived. But recently, I, I noticed that they were still listed as deliverables in the assessment report. Page nine also notes that the city con quote, contributes the costs of weed abatement and storm drain cleaning, unquote. But a large storm drain runs in my canyon, which Public Works didn't know was city owned till I showed it to them in aerial photos in 2018. They still haven't examined it, let alone maintained it, nor have they cleared brush around it per the requirement of weed abatement, despite my having asked several times. Now, it's far enough from my house that I'm not required to clear it, but it would help for neighborhood fire preparedness in addition to maintaining the pipe. The system needs an overhaul. Certainly we shouldn't be paying more money. We should be getting credit return for the years of maintenance and monitoring not performed. And the city should stop letting the requirement of exercising professional judgment fall somewhere between the city geologist, Fugro and public works. We need one person to whom we can say, give it to us straight doc in, when we go in for our annual checkup. So I'd recommend continuing this item pending further input from the new consultant who we don't know who that is yet I think based on everyone's concern, because otherwise we don't know what the, the amount of the workload is, the scope of work, but clearly uh, the system is an overhaul. So thank you. Thank you. Next is Hank Corwin, but I don't think he is in. I don't see him in the participant list. So next is Georgia Goldfarb. 
Um, hi there, can you hear me? We can. Yeah, okay. I support the petition to halt the development in Big Rock until most of the wells are functioning properly and the slide is stabilized. The addition of new development, which would add more plumbing fixtures or the additional use of them by increasing the number of people who can live here is ill-advised. Let's not pour fuel, so to speak, onto the fire of the slide. Fugo's recent report documents many deficiencies in the number of wells functioning and the piezometers which assess groundwater level. The fact that the city may hire a new firm to oversee our landslide uh, maintenance district suggests that they agree or that they may agree that the previous assessment and repair were inadequate. Inclinometers document con continued slide, but the number may be insufficient to give a true picture of the stability and weakness of the hillside. I urge you to pause these types of development in Big Rock until the entire dewatering system is properly functional and the hillside can be assessed in more detail for slide progression. We do not have another disaster. And if I have an extra moment, I might comment that, um, Rick, perhaps you uh, didn't hear the source of my data previously on the budget and the city manager's salary. It is the state controller's office. And I would suggest I'm concerned about your dismissal of the relevancy of the data. Um, and I think that is precisely why we need an outside firm to make cost and efficiency assessments. So thank you for your time. Thank you. And that concludes public comment. Okay. Thank you, Heather. Uh, all right. Council comments? Mikey? There we go. Um, Rob, could you, could you talk about their comments um, in general? And I might have more specific questions. I, as you know, I've been on a number of these emails, but I'm not a, you know, an expert in this area. And uh, I'd love you to elaborate if you could, please. So, uh, um, so, so we've had Frugro as our operation and maintenance contractor for several years. <clears throat> um, their contract is set to expire this year. And so what we did um, a few months ago is start the process of um, requesting proposals from consultants and, and doing that process of looking into seeing if we can get a, another consultant or is it the same one that's going to come in. But what we also did is that we reached out to the property owners of Big Rock. I've had two members of the community actually be, were involved with reviewing the proposals and doing consulting interviews and and they were part of the selection team that, that came up with selecting um, the proposed consultant. And, and the next council meeting, we are, we are proposing to come back and uh, with a new consultant that will operate and maintain the assessment district. Uh, one of their functions that I'm gonna have them do right away is evaluate the whole system, evaluate the data that's um, it's been gathered from, from Frugro come up with a comprehensive evaluation on the whole system, um, provide a comprehensive um, response to Mr. Michael's reports, the, the, the one that, um, that's always been referenced about uh, how everything is not been maintained and, and it, it's, there's, there's a lot of problems with stability. So that's gonna be one of the first tasks that they're gonna be doing to uh, once they get under their contract, or once they get their contract approved and moving forward, their their request to halt development is pretty a pretty serious step. I mean, you you know, not allowing development comes with its own liability too. Could you comment on that? Um, on on, on the danger social. I'm sorry, that wasn't fair. On the uh, it's late or it's early. Um, it's early, yeah. Their, their fears that, and I've seen the data, that the amount of, and I know there's different sides to it potentially, the amount of non-working hydrologers and uh, all, all the equipment is built up a fear that, you know, there could be another slide. 
Um, right. Can you talk about that? So, so I've responded to a lot of these questions previously, and um, I've had Furgro actually make a response and to that to this to this issue, specifically about groundwater and slides and the stability of the Big Rock area. And based on, on the data that they collected and looked at and evaluated, um, the actual groundwater levels for the whole area it is really stable and down low. And that has to do with a lot of the, um, the improvements that were done to the pumping system, which was done several, several years ago. And also because we've been in, in a drought system, of course, you know, uh, and so groundwater level is really low. And, and so the reason that we're not pumping out as much groundwater is, is because there's not a whole lot to pump out. And so, um, so it, it's been, Furgo has been honest with me and has stated that the groundwater has been like, has been stable and um, there hasn't been any significant movement to cause, cause alarm that um, the landslide will be forming soon. What about the claims of all the equipment that's not functioning? Um, for, uh, yeah, the, well, there's a bunch of hydroggers that get put in and, and there's been a ton of them that have been put in for over the, over the years and, and the 30 plus years. Those have a very short lifetime because they, they get, they get calcified and they get clogged up and you can go and you can go in and maintain them and maintain them and, and maintain them, but they usually have a, a lifetime to only for a certain number of years. Um, and, and then you would have to go and replace them. And so um, not all of them um, are needed to be replaced based on the information that I, that I received from Frugro. Some of them um, that are close by adjacent to the areas that aren't functioning uh, are still functioning, but they're not, they're not delivering a whole lot of water because in their opinion, they weren't needed. Um, additional hydroggers weren't were really required or needed for that area. And, and when can we expect to hear the report from the new company? Um, we're working on them right now. I'm, I'm trying to get a date on when they'll have that information and I'm hoping soon and I'm hoping to have that information to uh, um, the community, get that information to them, be able to hold meetings hopefully in, in the future to kind of talk about what we can do to move forward if it's kind of continue what we're doing or if it means revising the assessment to get more funds to do to do more improvements to be more computerized and move forward that way um i've had i'm hogging the mic so i'll let anyone else ask questions okay thank you skylar can i make a motion to approve items 4b c and d Second. Here we have can we have a, can we still have some discussion? Jefferson, do you have um, comments? Yes, thank you. Uh, Mikey and I uh, have visited several, several times uh, up to the uh, sites and did some walkthroughs and some neighborhood visits with the uh, HOA folks. There were eight or ten of them at one of the meetings. And uh, they had some pretty solid knowledge of things that were working and weren't working. I don't think that they would want to go on record as being the people that say we want everything to stop unless they had some real strong feelings about the quality of the delivery of the information that they're receiving. So I would be very cautious uh, up there, and I really need to hear that this new company is going to give them fair assessments. And uh, I, I think we need to move cautiously here. Okay, thank you. Um, Skyler, was that your hand up or? Yeah, I was just gonna say that, I mean, I understand that they have their concerns, but it doesn't mean that we can't, we need to approve the assessment district and we have to deal with those concerns sort of a little bit, you know, separately. If what we get back in the report from the new consultants, not what's working, then that has to be revised. I don't think that this is the time to do that. So Roger the, that. The report's going to come before the rainy season, right? Or is it coming a month, two months? What do we What do we think? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I will push them to try to get it done sooner than later. I'm, I'm hoping that we'll get everything done before September. Uh, um, but that's just something I, I, I just started communications and dialogue with them. And, and so I'm, I'm waiting to hear back to when that can be done. Um, but I'm hoping they have, fortunately, they have prior knowledge of, of the systems for Big Rock, Calabarco, and Malibu, Malibu Road. So I, I think their, their, their knowledge of getting up to speed on, on the different systems and will be a lot quicker than most consultants. And so I, I'm, I'm fairly confident that we can get something sooner, especially before the rainy season, but I, I, I want to talk to them first and get a good really um, kind of timetable on when we can get that. All right, would you keep us posted? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Rob. All right, uh, should we go back to our motion and our second? Okay, uh, Heather, roll call vote, please. Council Member Peek? Yes. Council Member Mullen? Yep. Council Member Wagner? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Yes. Mayor Fair? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we are on to item 4E, and it's the Temporary Restaurant Recovery Program during this COVID-19 pandemic. And do we have a staff report, please? Sure, Mayor, thank you so much. I'll try to make it brief, uh, given that it's uh, already tomorrow. Um, so um, as part of uh, the reopening process by the county and the state, um, they're asking restaurants to open restaurants, but still allow for social distancing, which means for restaurants, it's going to require the elimination of existing seating and tables in their restaurants. And so what's before you this evening would be an urgency ordinance that would allow our restaurants to come in and fill out an application um, and expand their restaurant seating into common areas outside or perhaps parking areas. Um, this is a similar um, ordinance that uh, many other cities have done. Um, in most cities, uh, they can expand into public right-of-ways and public parking spaces. Um, in Malibu, the setup of a lot of our restaurants and our shopping centers would actually mean that uh, restaurants would be expanding into common areas. So the application that is attached to the staff report also would require that they have approval or sign off from their landlord um, in order to do this. And we recognize that this could impact um, some parking, um, but also feel that the need for parking and the demand for parking is a down right now, will continue to be down um, because people are just aren't out and about as, as much. So this would be an urgency ordinance. It requires four fifths vote by the council and our recommendation would be that um, as soon as restaurants can go back to regular activities that um, there would be a 72 hour period uh, by which uh, restaurants who are participating in this would need to remove anything that they've expanded into the exterior. Um, and then just to be clear, <clears throat> this would not allow them to have any more seating um, than they currently have. So making up a number, if you right now had you know, 20 tables inside and you had to reduce it down to eight to meet uh, uh, the requirements for COVID-19 by expanding outside, you would never be able to get more than 20. So um, I know we have some planning staff, Justine Kendall still on, and I believe Bonnie and also Trevor who can answer uh, more specific details, but that's the, the high level for you for tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Reva. Um, I, I'd like to start out by saying um, I just want to thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, as Mikey has said repeatedly, businesses everywhere are just getting killed. And we, we all want to, I believe we all want to see anything done that we can to help our local businesses. Mayor. Yes. One public speaker. Would you like to hear that? Thank you. Excuse me. Please. We have John Mazza. Okay, thank you.
John, are you there? He's unmuted on our end, but we don't hear you, John. Okay. Looks like we can't hear John. Okay. Uh, all right, Skyler. I make a motion to approve this emergency ordinance. Uh, also, I have a couple of questions, though, and I just want to mention to John, I know you're there. We got your letters, so thank you. Uh, I know you're in trouble getting through, but thank you for sending letters. I'd like to add to that, if I may, too, uh, Mayor, um, that we have the uh, sunset clause, as was mentioned by the city manager. The sunset clause is within 72 hours of when the L.A. County Health Department's determination is ended and things go back to normal, that the 72-hour period be enforced. Equally, the bollard rules and laws must be followed. I think Trevor might want to weigh into that, that we can't have tables extending out past the bollards that exist in these shopping malls. Is that fair to say, uh, Trevor, would you have an opinion on that? Staying inside the bollards and the sunset clause moving with the county health department. Well, there'd be, there's flexibility built in for a case by case basis. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if, if uh, the bollard restriction could be relaxed, if you want to make sure that the bollard restrictions are absolutely respected, then um, you should make an amendment to this to to clarify that um, it has to comply with that ordinance. I would move that into the motion that Skyler had made that uh, the uh, extended uh, table seating or any kind of seating in the restaurants not go past the bollards because then the city is liability uh, if something happens um, and the bollard rules are overlooked so part of the application, part of the application process sorry to interrupt you uh, council member wagner uh would be for the city to review this uh from the eyes of public safety which would include any type of bollard or, or uh, safety measures so we do have the discretion to deny an application if we feel that there's a public safety compromise um mayor okay. i would just add to that um while many shopping centers do have bollards, many shopping centers actually do not have bollards. So um, I expect that actually many in many cases, um, the, if seating were to expand, for example, onto the sidewalks or common areas of shopping centers, if there isn't already parking, head in parking in those locations, then there would not be any bollards in place anyway. So. Um, I, I'm not sure if this will come up as frequently as we might think. Okay, I'm just making a point in case something goes wrong, at least we addressed it. Yeah, I mean, part of it was also options we're putting into a parking lot. And if you're going to have sitting in the parking lot, you're not going to have bollards around. So it would defeat some of the, 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 the ability, uh, the flexibility built into this in finding those seating areas and putting in other safety measures as appropriate. There's also gonna be an indemnity requirement on here to help protect the city in the event um, that there is any type of complaint or injury. Thank you, Trevor. I'm just trying to protect the interests of the entire city, just not the mall owners and the restaurant owners because we want them to stay and do well and flourish. However, if this, when you do this seating review, moving seating and tables to the inside of a mall area, uh, for instance, uh, the one where uh, Malibu Kitchen is, or uh, one of those there, you would put the seating um, where it's protected by buildings and non-parking areas or planters and things like that seems more advisable than just pushing them out into the parking. Just wanted to make the point. Yes, I think that's good advice. And I, I think the intention here is to help design a, a site up the, in, as safe as possible on a site by site basis. And that's why a lot of the flexibility and conditions, um, the ability to impose conditions is included in there. Um, it's hard to anticipate every single location in the city and what would be best in that situation. But I appreciate you raising the, the Ballard issue because it, you know, it, it, how people are parking and circulating is definitely important in how any spaces are expanded. 
Thank you, Counselor. I appreciate it. Just covering covering your uh, end of the woods there. And thank you, Reva, for re- recognizing that the sunset clause would be based upon LA County Health Department determinations. And, and I just want to mention quickly, I reached out to a, a couple of restaurant owners I know in Malibu and shared this agenda item. And the response I got was it looked very comprehensive and, and uh, they appreciated it. Uh, any other council members care to comment, questions? No? Okay. Uh, remind me, we have a motion? The motion uh, approves uh, test recommendation. I made a motion and I think that Mikey seconded. Yeah. Um, Trevor, do you want to read? The motion was to approve staff's recommendation, approving the, uh, the emergency ordinance. So we need a, a fourth this vote. And it was second by uh, Mayor Pro Tem Pearson, correct? Yeah. Do you need to read the title of the ordinance or no? Yes. Would that also include the sunset clause making it into this motion? That's built into the ordinance, I believe. Yeah that it would phase out. Um, just just want to make sure what will happen is if one restaurant takes advantage of the situation after the health department has said, you folks are back to normal, go back to normal seating practices, and one restaurant doesn't, uh, it puts another restaurant at a disadvantage if they uh, have the advantage of extra seating and one restaurant plays by the game and one restaurant does not. It's on page five of the ordinance, Councilmember Wagner. Okay, because I didn't get that part, but thank but you. I only it, got the purple means, page. The temporary restaurant seating area must be vacated or returned to its original state within 72 hours of the termination of this ordinance or the termination of the issued temporary restaurant recovery permit. I appreciate it because it didn't, on my package, I only got the purple page. Thank you. So then that would be to approve ordinance number 465U, an emergency ordinance of the city of Malibu implementing a temporary restaurant recovery program to allow restaurants to alter operations to add seating area to aid physical distancing during the COVID-19 emergency, finding the same exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act and setting forth the facts constituting such urgency. Does that accurately reflect to your motion and the second? Yes. Yes. Okay, could we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Peak? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Yes. Council Member Mullen? Yep. Council Member Wagner? Yes. Mayor Fair? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you, Heather. Okay, so we are on to. Sorry. On to 7A, and that is the uh, appointments to the Harry Borowski Memorial Youth Commission. Uh, thank you. Good evening or good morning, Mayor Fair, members of the City Council. Uh, the item before you is the annual appointment of commissioners to the Harry Borowski Memorial Youth Commission uh, for the upcoming 2020 21 year. Our recruitment resulted in 25 candidates from grades 7 through 12, and 14 of those applicants were returning commissioners currently in good standing. 11 of the applicants were new applicants with no commission experience. And so due to the coronavirus pandemic, each applicant, all 25 applicants, submitted candidate statements by video. And then we held virtual Zoom interviews with the 11 candidates who had no previous experience. Uh, the panel consisted of Casey Ernest from the Boys and Girls Club and Judy Villablanca, one of our Parks and Recreation Commissioners. And all the interviews went really well and were successful. So our staff recommendation is to appoint all 25 applicants that successfully passed the application and interview process. Uh, Skyler. We have any public speakers, Heather? We do not. Okay, thank you. Skylar? Are you muted? 
Yeah, I was just going to make a motion <laughs> to approve the commissioners for the 2020-2021 uh, Youth Commission. Second. I'd like to just add a quick comment, if, if I may, before we take the vote, that um, I know a lot of these families and folks, and I'm happy to see that there's a great amount of diversity here. And thank you uh, for the review of these young individuals who are future leaders, because we have a great deal of diversity here. I'm happy to see that. Thank you, Jefferson. Agreed. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Councilmember Pink? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yep. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Yes. Mayor Fair? Excuse me. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jesse. You're muted. So sorry. I'm sorry. Um, the final item, 7B, uh, extension of the Woolsey fire fee waiver deadlines. Uh, and this is Council Member Peak's item. Um, Skyler, would you like to uh, speak to this? Yeah, so I'm sure um, many of the council members have heard from certain residents, maybe not, I don't know, but I know that I've heard from a handful of different people um, in, in addition to the comments that we've received uh, from individuals that are having trouble with their insurance companies and or awaiting uh, possibly funds from a settlement with SCE or another entity um, that are going to help them rebuild. And as a result of the delays in, in those um, extenuating circumstances, they are not in a position to take advantage of the um, fee waiver program and also the delays. Um, you know, there's been a lot of delays related to COVID. I don't know that this should necessarily apply to that because I think that many people that were already in that process um, have been able to do that. But I think that we should be specific um, in it, you know, that it should, it should apply to those that have had uh, the delays related to the challenges with their insurance companies um, and legal stuff. Um, if there's a way that we can narrow that, I would ask Trevor um, that we do that and, or how best to do that uh, in terms of clarifying the language on that. Um, and then You're looking to limit exactly who it would be extended for? Yeah, it would be, a, well, it'd be extended People in litigation with SCE. For, for, for anyone, um, that I mean, the language that's used in the staff report is uh, for anyone's circumstances beyond their control, including but not limited to issues between homeowners and insurance carriers or issues related to COVID-19. So, you know, I, I think that this gives this sort of is, is a little bit broad, but I do know that there's many people that just haven't been able to, to move forward with this process yet. So I don't know if there's any speakers on this or not, but. I just think that that we should uh, we should we should extend that because if anything, those are the individuals that, that this program is going to mean the most to. Okay. Um, do we have any public speakers? Um, you have three. Okay. Whether they're still here, let's see. Um, Vince, Maselli, followed by John Mazza. <laughs> Poor John. Uh, followed by Joffrey Von Owen. Jeffrey Von Owen. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's go ahead with the public, public speakers, please. So, Vince Maselli. Hi. Can you hear me? I can. Yes. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you, Skyler, for putting this on the agenda. Um, and I agree with your comments. I would just qualify that. Uh, it's not just an issue of insurance uh, pr company problems um, because a lot of people did not have enough insurance to rebuild anyway. And in some cases like mine, I'm having to put additional funds together and that takes some time. So I can't really start building or even start building unless I can make sure I have all my money there. 
So I think just to limit it to just the, you know, uh, the, the narrow area of, of insurance company problems and or COVID problems or whatever is, is a little too narrow. So I would hope that as you staff put something together, they take that into consideration that a lot of us, you know, have lives to live as well as trying to deal with this. And um, it takes time. These things take time and have the pressure of not, of having a deadline, whether that be June 30th or, sh- or sometime thereafter during the entire process I think has to be looked at because even the two year timeline with the uh, code code changes or whatever is somewhat of a pressure issue for a lot of us because you know we have to, we still might have to get plans to put together and engineering and things like that and if we don't have the money together we're not going to going to go out there and spend it not knowing we actually have enough money to actually build the house so those are my comments thank you uh, next is John Mazza. John, are you there? It's unmuted on our end, but we can't hear him. Okay. John, if you're there and you can't talk, can you click the raise your hand function or signal other way? I have his email here. I could read it for him. That was already distributed, right? Everyone has that? Yeah. Okay. Do we have um, another speaker? Is he the last one? No, then we, the last speaker is Joffrey uh, Von Oyen. Hi, is my video on? Uh, no, but we're not allowing video right now, so. Oh, okay. but we can- All right. Well, I'll I'll um, I'll keep it short in any case because it's it's after one a.m. I just wanted to say that I, uh, in hearing about this, uh, I I support uh, Councilmember Peak's idea in the sense that it will especially help. Uh, retirees and uh, older residents of Malibu, folks who've lived in Malibu a long time and may not have adequate insurance or liquidity to quickly rebuild uh, or have the same types of options to move or sell their property in the way that younger residents might. I think that for older residents uh, who are counting on their home and its value as part of their retirement and uh, their security, I think it's quite important that they have uh, as many options as they can right now, especially in light of the pandemic, especially in light of what financial circumstances they may be in uh, because of that, to make sure that they have a chance to to rebuild and not incur uh, additional fees at this time uh, when they may have limited options. So I would just say that it's an issue that particularly folks it, it's, it's particular to older folks, and I think we should keep that in mind. Okay, thank you. That concludes public comment. Okay, that concludes public comment. All right. Um, council comments? Yes, uh, I'd like to second the motion if it hasn't been seconded already. And uh, add to the comments. Do you have some comments, Jefferson? Uh, Rick, yes, you have I have. Sorry, uh, Jefferson, do you have another comment aside from that, or should we have Rick speak? I do. I wanted to uh, thank the speakers, especially Vince, who's a realtor, um, and remember that uh, to him and some of the others out here, I'm in the exact same boat. Um, I have an errors and omission. Uh, uh, lawsuit filed against Allstate uh, as well as my SCE claim. So it's going to be some time. Uh, all we try and do is keep the properties alive, keep them weeded, keep the septic updated. So you have to do the minimum, and uh, hopefully these folks can get through with it until they get their settlement. And thank you, Skylar, for putting this forward. Uh, I couldn't agree with it more. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Jefferson. Rick? Yeah, so what was the original purpose of this fee waiver program? As I recall, it was to help people whose primary residence it was to get whole again, but also give people an incentive to kind of get the ball rolling and, you know, get them moving. So if we're just going to say, uh, you, uh, you know, I mean, we just turned down a guy because his paperwork wasn't in order for being his primary residence. So there has to be some pretty clear definition of, you know, why you're delayed or how long we're going to extend it or whatever, because I think it could go on for years. So I'm very sympathetic to it, but I think we should be careful about, you know, how long this thing goes on. And I want to hear from the city manager about the impact uh, on the budget from this point on and what she thinks this is going to be. This is the era of belt tightening. And I don't mean to sound callous or not compassionate as I'm very understanding about how incredibly hard this is, but, you know, I think we have to have some parameters. Okay, thank you. In terms of the impact, did you want me to answer those questions? I'm sorry. Please. Yes, please. So in terms of the impact to the budget, you know, we did calculate the fee waivers into both the current year budget and the proposed budget that we just discussed. Um, you know, I'm unclear as to what exactly, and obviously you haven't made a specific motion, um, if we're just extending the deadline for certain hardship cases, I don't know how many of those we might have out there. Um, so it's pretty hard to calculate the impact. Um, I would hope that we assume that those cases are all primary uh, like for like um, uh, rebuild so that we, they're already in our calculations. So it's sort of extending the pain of the fee waiver um, finances. But, but again, it's hard to calculate without knowing specifically what the motion would be to it. Do you have any major financial concerns about uh, extending this program? I have concerns about extending a fee waiver program, but I certainly understand why you would want to do it for certain hardship cases. I just and I would hope for Trevor to weigh in on this, that we are very clear on what uh, those parameters are and what works. So I, I think that would be more my concern coming from that. Okay. okay. Reva, Trevor, please. Yeah, if, if uh, directions to bring this back, I would I would ask that you give clear direction about a bright line rather than um, that we talked about it last time, the difficulties in a sort of uh, hardships or ambiguous uh, criteria and the, the, the type of appeals and what that can lead to. So if there are certain criteria, um, staff can look into what, you know, what good measurements would be of that. But I think you want to be very specific about the type of relief you want to provide or otherwise just fully extend it for everyone that qualifies as a primary resident. But I think it's important to have bright lines about this. And what documentation would we be asking people to demonstrate that they needed an extension? So I agree with Trevor that it may be something that where we just do it, extend the deadline for a period of time. Yeah. Is yeah. That, I mean, that's kind of what I'm getting at is if maybe we just keep it simple and just extend it for six months for primary residents for like for like and not have these little qualifiers. Because, you know, someone could say, Oh, it's my insurance company. Well, I, you know, I sat on my, didn't do anything for a year and then I get my, had a battle with my insurance company. So there's all sorts of, you know, verification process that you might be wasting staff time on. So maybe it's just best to extend it. Uh, okay. Thank you, Rick. Mikey, you have your hand up. I would agree with that because, you know, in my talks with people, it is, it is a couple of different things and some of them are a little hard to bright line, such as, you know, your house burned down, you're underinsured, but you may not have a lawsuit and your wife has a heart attack and now she's in a wheelchair and you've lost your job, which is just one case that I know of. So I don't know how we bright line that, but yet that's, you know, a 30 plus year resident in Malibu that lived in an older home. So, yeah. Yeah. Just extend it six months. Yeah, I, I like the idea of extending it six months, and then let's take a look at it. And I get the financial end. I don't have an answer for. I know no other city's done this, but now we're you know the the, the unforeseen part is we're heading into the 
needy of the needy yeah. at a time we didn't anticipate it. Yeah, but this is the you know this if we're ever going to spend money, this is this is the big three. You know? Yeah. yeah. Skyler. Is there a consensus? Do you, do you guys only want to extend it for six months, or are you open to extending it for a year? Uh, I I would like to hear uh, from Reva. I'll I think if you're going to extend it another year, I will have to come back with some financial uh, impacts on that because um, our current budget only in uh, took into account that this would. Um, what the current deadlines are, which you had to have your application in by June 30th and start construction by December 30th, I believe was the deadline. And so we didn't anticipate another 12 months on top of that. So there will be a budget implication on that. Well, I think what you do is remember it, part of it is to get people going, get the ball rolling, give them an incentive to get up the peg and get everything in motion. So I would, I would only want to do it six months. And I agree. Don't forget we have fire season coming up. Okay, so I have a question. Um, Reva, do you have suggestions or do council members, do you have suggestions of what we might cut in order to extend this? I don't, I think it's it's fine if at this point if everybody just, I'm hearing that people want to just do it for six months. So if they're willing to extend it for six months and that can go across the board, then I think that that's workable. But that still has a budget impact, does it not, Reva? Um, if we're extending it, so instead of the December 31st, it would now go until July 1 of the following year. Is that what you're asking for? Uh, it, would move, yeah. it would move the June 2020, the current deadline, to December, and it would move the December 2020 deadline. It would essentially push both of them six months. Um, so, so again, we'd have to, you know, off the top of my head, I don't have those numbers, um, but we could certainly, you know, if that's what the council would like to do. And then as part of our uh, August, September revisit of the budget, we'll have to look at that and the impact of that. Okay. I, I think as long as everybody's clear that. Um, this is, I think the direction is too, that this is going to be brought back. So if Reva could bring back, can you bring back the analysis when this comes back for the resolution extending the deadline? Certainly. Okay. This is, this is just to put a, to agendize an item to extend it and to give direction about what that. Um, so we would be bringing back a resolution that extends the deadlines by six months. Correct. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Skylar, you made a motion. Yes. I seconded it. And okay. Well, we, that we have a, a full motion. Is the motion for the Jefferson? I changed it. It's no longer a year. It's now six months. So just to be clear on that, and it's not for special circumstances, it's for anyone who is a primary resident, anyone where the existing waiver applied, it would still apply. It's just a six month additional. So the, Copy the, motion, that. the motion is to clarify, then would be to bring back an item that would extend the um, fee waiver provisions by six months for filing and the six months for, uh, I think it's pulling building permits, right? For the second deadline, is that correct? Uh, Councilmember Pete. Okay, that's affirmative. Nodding yes, sorry. Okay, so we've got the motion, the second, the clarification. Could we have a roll call, please, Heather? Councilmember Peek? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yep. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Yes. Mayor Fair? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. It is 1.17 a.m. on Tuesday, and we are adjourned. Thanks to everyone who stayed late. You're, you're yeah. crazy. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. you. Good night.